What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What If I Was Reborn as White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Bullets flew from my left and right, the close-ranged weapon-holding marines all charged at the pirates, who dashed similarly, the noises of metals clanging, the war cries, and the terrifying sounds of the weapons tearing through a human flesh dominated the beach, clang, and in the above at the sky, Rear Admiral Stainless clashed his katana sword against Bruiser, who held a much thicker-looking razor blade. At some distance away, Kuzan was facing Vane, generating various ice-made structures, only for Vane to break them over and over, with his brute strength alone. On the other hand, Joan, who was standing next to me until now, charged at the enemies with a sword in her hand. And upon her slashing it once, boom, a huge gale was formed, blasting a few pirates back. Unfortunately, her sword broke again with that single strike alone. And back to where I stood now, I took a deep breath out, causing the white smoke to be exhaled from my mouth. Simultaneously, with my hands in my pocket, my body slowly began to wither away into the wisp of white smoke. At the next moment, my body entirely disappeared in an instant. Wide out. Immediately after, the huge volume of smoke suddenly stormed into the middle of the battlefield, rendering multiple pirates confused. Cough, cough, what's with this sudden smoke? One pirate shouted in confusion, before he was struck down by a marine soldier's sword. And in this state, upon my will, numerous smoke hands suddenly emerged from the smoke that clouded the whole battlefields, which shot out at multiple pirates, all at once, before gripping onto their bodies. Don't panic, one marine soldier shouted, this is the ability of Ensign Smoker. Use this as an opportunity to strike the enemies down. Raya the Marines, with their morale having gone up, roared as they launched their attacks at the immobile pirates. Now, quickly reforming my body next to a Marine who had a bullet traveling at his head, I casually stopped the flying bullet by pinching it, before flicking it back at the owner. Next, I vanished into another location with the use of Soru, before breaking a sword from decapitating another Marine with a kick, rendering the pirate with the now broken sword in his hands, dumbfounded. T thank you Ensign Smoker, I replied plainly while punching the face of the pirate, now's not the time to thank me, focus on the enemies. Turning my head around, I inspected Joan from some distance away, who was facing a man with a peculiar looking katana blade. He seemingly stood out from this bunch of pirates, with a red bandana on his head and sunglasses on his eyes. I am Rendell, the fourth strongest of the Goldtooth Pirates. Rendell's eyes gleamed lustfully, as he held his blade with two hands. Soon enough, you'll scream this name as I attack you with another sword of mine. That sword, Joan, who wasn't bothered by Rendell's words, pointed her finger at his sword, without a doubt. It has to be one of the 21 Great Great Blades Compira. How do you have that? Rendell seemed irked by her demeanor, but replied with a smirk, Oh, so that's this sword's name, eh? Didn't even know until now. You don't deserve that sword. Joan frowned in disdain. But her eyes gleamed in excitement, but I do. Boom. Then, Joan dashed and slashed one of her two blades at Rendell, who raised his sword Compira up to block Joan's attack. Naturally, Joan's sword broke, and she quickly threw it away. But to Rendell's shock, he found himself kneeling due to her sheer strength. Well, it seems that she should be fine I thought before an axe suddenly phased through me causing my chest to disperse into puffs of smoke before reforming quickly. Turning around, I was met with the sight of a terrified pirate, who stood with his hand outstretched. Tobu Shigen, upon a flick of my finger, said pirate was knocked back with his eyes whitened out from the impact on his chest. Just then boom, a huge explosion suddenly occurred some distance away. Following after was the grey, mushroom-shaped smoke that rose from the impact, and narrowing my eyes, I cleared up the smoke by snapping my fingers, only to see the blue head teen staring at me, with many marine soldiers fallen around him. And I instinctively knew, that he was strong. Heya, I'm a very, a 14 year old guy. You seem to be around the same age as me, and I can tell that you are pretty strong. The boy, whose name was now revealed to me as a very, smiled jovially. So you wanna play with me? Immediately after, his form vanished before appearing right in front of me. Ha! Huh. Lash Kami, bending my torso sideways. I dodged a straight from Avery. Then, boom. Another explosion suddenly occurred. From Avery's very own arm that was outstretched right next to me. I see from within the smoke, I thought calmly, with my body being reformed from the dispersed smoke, it wasn't any sort of weapon. This self-proclaimed Avery. 
is the user of Bonbon Fruit, one that belonged to MR.5 of Baroque works in the canon. Coupled with the physical prowess that he performed just now, he is quite a force to be reckoned with. But thankfully, there is good news that the ability to detonate any part of his body is mainly oriented toward the physical force rather than the secondary characteristics such as heat. Although the high enough pressure can damage me as well, as long as I don't allow him to contact me directly, the advantage should be on my side. Oh, well, a very who watched me being reformed from smoke with wide eyes, exclaimed excitedly, so you two have a superpower just like me. Lahaha, this is going to be even better, without bothering to respond to him. I acted, sorry. Swoosh. Dashing at a rapid speed just when Avery vanished from his spot, we reappeared in front of one another at the same time. I smashed my fist on his chest, just as he landed a kick on my side. I glared at him, who stared back at me with craziness in his eyes. I knew it. You can keep up with my speed, white blow. Go on. Then, before Avery could detonate his body, I sent him blasting back with the sudden explosion of the huge volume of smoke from my fist which completely differed from the cannon smoker's version of white blow, that consisted of elongating his arm. But something fell off. Instead of a usual human flesh, I felt as of punching against an iron wall swoosh. A very then reappeared in my sight with his face expressing joy. His top was ripped from my attack, however, there was no wound at all. Lifting my right arm up, I let a very's punch slip by. Then, using Kami E, I bent down to dodge his overhead kick, before standing back up and sidestepping to evade his other hand, which tried to grab onto me. And there, my eyes widened a very's hands they were black in color. Armament Haki. Let's have some more fun. La ha 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 very love crazily. Just as the back of his elbow suddenly made a miniature explosion, propelling his fist toward me from a strange angle, tap. And his fist directly touched my abdomen. Tekai, hectopiscal punch boom. My vision blurred, with me being flown all the way to the metal wall of the G2, away from where the battle was ongoing. Before the collision, I regained my bearing and dispersed myself into the smoke to stop the propulsion and reform my body, such that my feet were on the vertical plane of the metal wall. Sorrow. Immediately after, Avery appeared right at the metal wall where I was standing until a millisecond ago, and punched his fist forth boom. That exploded and landed a huge dent in the metal wall. Lahahaha <laughs> turning around, Avery launched at me like a mad bull while laughing like a madman. I can't believe it, you're still alive Buom. Sidestepping to let Avery's fist collide the ground this time around. I thought, thankfully, he doesn't seem to have observation haki. If he did, I would have gotten hit a couple of times already. Also, his armament haki is amateurish at best. I've been hit by the ones much stronger before. Buom. Getting used to Avery's simplistic attack patterns now. I believe that I've now found a way. Armament Haki, along with his inherently tough skin. Simple attacks won't work, but the hard blows will do. Boom. Now, landing at some distance away from Avery as he punched an empty terrain yet again. I raised my right hand up such that its palm was facing up. Swoo then, the wisps of smoke around my body swirled onto my palm, forming a swirling ball that had the size of a watermelon. Oh very. Citing my technique momentarily seized his attack and looked at it with an interest. So you're finally going attack. The mechanical swell allows me to condense a huge volume of smoke into this ball. High density, and most importantly, high pressure such that upon my release, it will explode. Cratching his legs down, Avery then blasted himself at me. Lahahaha, white blast. Boom. Upon my call, the dense ball of white smoke exploded toward the approaching Avery at high pressure, and pushed the latter back all the way to the metal wall. But that wasn't the end. Transmutation. Black. The trail of white smoke that lied all the way from my hand to Avery who was stuck in the wall suddenly shifted into pitch black color in an abrupt manner. And this black smoke consists of inflammable colloids, such that its exposure to oxygen is suitable enough for the spontaneous combustion reaction. Whoosh. Fire. It was the blazing red fire that now surrounded Avery, daring to consume him ruthlessly. La. Aha. However, my opponent seemed to be far from over, grinning before he was completely engulfed by the fire, disappearing from my sight. Then, boom. Another explosion detonated from his body, dispersing the fire away in an instant. You're really, really strong. And now, you really got me fired up. Avery stood up from within the smoke with burns all over his body and a bruise on his abdomen, before wiping the trail of blood on his mouth. Then, his fists colored black indicating the use of armament haki yet again. Lahaha. I feel calmer now, for some reason. Was smoke therapy for your liking? Then I'm sorry to disappoint you, for the next one's going to hurt. I grinned, just as the two of us began to walk toward each other. I am a human, but at the same time, smoke. I can manage outward appearance but at the same time, adapt the characteristics of smoke, including lightweight. As I breathed out, the white smoke was exhaled rather than the usual air. My body felt notably lighter than before, and I was confident now, that based on what Avery showed me so far, he will no longer be able to match my speed. Swoosh. Then, the both of us vanished into the thin air, before reappearing in the middle, with my fist slammed onto Avery's cheek. White blow. Boom. Avery was knocked high up in the air from my punch. And before he could react, swoosh. 
I appeared right above him, before slamming my foot onto his chest, white stomp. A gigantic foot, made out of smoke, suddenly burst out from my foot that was in contact with Avery's chest, pushing him all the way down to the ground. Boom. Not giving him any time to think, transmutation. Black. The white smoke instantly flickered into pitch black, before combusting into a huge fit of fire. Ictopiscal, surrounded by the blazing fire all around, Avery detonated his entire body at a much wider scale than before, ultimate discharge groom. And I, having predicted such a reaction out of him, was now standing right above him with my fist stretched out at his chest and my foot pinpointing him down on the ground. Eh? A very seemed dazed by such a fast turn of event, just as Rakuigan. Boom. H H H H H. The dense wave of pressurized air slammed onto his chest, causing him to cough blood with his eyes bloodshot expressing pain for the first time. Then, I immediately jumped away from Avery expectantly. Just as boom. Avery created yet another explosion with an even larger magnitude than the previous one. Boom. Avery stood back up, and instead of the usual crazed grin, there now lied a furious expression on his face, with blood dripping down from his lips. Boom. Then his entire body detonated once more. Boom. 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 Covered by the consecutive explosions all around, non-stop, the only thing I could see now was his silhouette, what the hell? And I admit, I was quite shocked that Avery was capable of such a feat, with there being such a short gap of time between each successive explosion. What stood in front of me at the current moment was the embodiment of destruction. Boom. It hurts. 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 Hurts it seriously seriously hurts I never was this hurt before. From the noises created by the consecutive explosions, Avery's muffled tone, full of fury, was heard, forget playing I was being nice. And you betray my trust. You sick psycho boom. He was one crazy teen. With his head standing up due to the winds generated by his explosions, he glared at me with his bloodshot blue colored eyes. And if he were to reach back to the battlefield, especially at this state I thought with narrowed eyes while exhaling smoke, heh, no point in thinking about something that won't be happening. Swoosh. I disappeared from my sight, just as Avery appeared at that exact sight, with his haki coated fist outstretched. Boom. His entire body detonated again, as he turned around, looking for me. Are you looking for me? I asked while floating up in the air, with my legs having morphed into smoke. Avery frowned deeply as he gritted his teeth, before detonating his feet to gain propulsion. As he created the series of feet involved detonations to reach high up where I was floating by. I quickly looked around and found a forest that lied behind this marine base G2, on the opposite side from the beach where the battle was ongoing. Over there, swoosh, using Geppo together with Saru, as my body was still lightweighted, thanks to morphing my inner body into smoke, I quickly distanced myself from Avery. Stop, right, there who screamed in uncontrolled rage, before brashly detonating his entire body. Boom, ignoring his scream. I dashed into the forest full of vegetation. Yahoo, boom. How pitiful I thought, at least he was human like before. But now, what is he? A savage. Avery was now right above the forest where I stood within, furiously blasting himself down with consecutive detonations of his feet. Looking up, I raised my left hand up, white ball. The swirling mass of dense smoke immediately came into the existence, on top of my palm. It continued to swell as its size grew more and more, and eventually, its size became about five times larger than a basketball-sized one that I previously showcased. But this was just the beginning. Transmutation. Like the white, soft-looking smoke instantly whooshed into the pitch black, letting out the dangerous vibe. Without further ado, I tossed it in front of me and flickered away from the area, just as Avery came in flying. Black bang. Boom. The black sphere of mine then exploded in synchronous to Avery's whole body detonation, letting out a thunderous noise that shook all the way to me, who now stood some distance away. Tap. Within the smoke that arose due to the forest catching onto a huge fire that quickly spread out, Avery walked out with no sign of having been hurt. In case I didn't tell you, Avery growled with the veins popping out on his forehead. I am immune to explosions, and that's not what I was aiming for. I placed my hand out at the front, which emitted a grey smoke. That joined the huge volume of naturally produced grey smoke, which was rising up due to the burning forest. Then, upon my will, entrap him, grey room. Swaru W what is this? The huge smoke, so huge in volume that it managed to shadow a very from the sun completely, suddenly engulfed him completely. Boom. From within, a muffled explosion was heard. The huge grey smoke sphere slightly expanded, but immediately closed back before Avery could escape. Boom. Another attempt was heard. Let me go Gar. Along with a desperate scream. However, the thick, dense layer of grey smoke withstood the stress, not willing to let the teen go, until he lost all strength to resist. Boom. 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 Then everything fell silent. The forest continued to burn, and unfortunately, it will eventually be reduced into a horrific sight full of ashes. However, what mattered to me the most wasn't the forest. But the fact that this incredibly dangerous fellow named Avery was now subdued. And this is why. I mused while landing back on the ground and releasing my control over the grey smoke causing them to disperse and let the unconscious Avery fall down. Coking my fist back, boom. I hook my fist on the already unconscious Avery. Slamming him down on the ground, the kids shouldn't eat a devil fruit. I dusted my hands off with a satisfied smile on my face. Filthy pirate, Joan. 
who stood in the middle of the battlefield with Compira the sword that belonged to the man named Rendell now and her right hand bickered at the fallen Rendell. Is that all you got? ECH Rendell gritted his teeth in helplessness, finding no strength to stand back up. Marine Protocol Number 3 Joan stated with a stoic expression, while swinging her sword once, horizontally, to slash at the numerous pirates who were running at her, boom. A sharp wave of wind slashed through them, leaving deep wounds that immediately ended their lives. Those whose ranks are below that of Ensign shall not fire or attack under normal circumstances, unless it's done for the purpose of retaliation or their superiors give them permission. However, those who are allowed to bear the word justice on their backs, are granted the rights to immediately execute a wanted criminal if they see fit. Shio swung compare a few times leisurely, before pointing its tip at Rendell, and I believe that there is no reason to keep a disgusting filth like you alive. Impelled down, Shion snorted, swoosh, before decapitating Rendell in an instant, forget that jail. I'm not a woman of such a lax justice, the wrongs are better off dead than alive. Tap. Then, next to her, Smoker landed in a relaxed manner, having returned from the forest, and handed a very to Captain Happy who stood at the back. Nice sword you got there, Smoker commented with his serious eyes headed up ahead. Well, it's my lifetime sword now, Joan said with her mouth twitching, trying to keep her facial expression neutral. It didn't break even after a couple of swings. A great great sword indeed. Smoker chuckled before raising his hand up to where the clash was still ongoing. White snake. Swoo one by one, the pirates began to notice the sudden appearance of multiple smoke-formed snakes that swam around the battlefield. The snake's eyes gleamed in a predatory manner, hunting after their prey known as pirates. But we wait, this smoke. It's that marine officer from just before one cried in realization, with his face pale. And I saw that he was fighting that monster boy, which means before he could finish his words. The snakes instantly coiled around the pirates tightly, all at the same time, causing the marines, who were fighting them to finally relax. Then, all pirates were pulled to a particular direction, where those white snakes came from toward, where Smoker stood with his left arm morphed into smoke. Now, entangled with one another, they were completely immobilized. And in this state, Smoker raised his right arm as well, which emitted forth huge volume of white smoke, which shrouded the pirates from the above, before completely enclosing on them. White room. There now lied one huge dome of white smoke, where all pirates were suffering a terrible fate of suffocation. Mem FFFF although the screams were muffled, they were nonetheless heard. Those muffled screams were filled with despair, knowing that once they regained their consciousness, they will be behind the bars, forever trapped in the hell known as the Impel Down. And finally, when Smoker released his hold, those pirates were completely knocked out, allowing the still standing marine soldiers to arrest them with ease. And with that, the only remaining threats are boom. Right then, Bruiser, who had a sword embedded in his stomach, crashed onto the beach. The sands wildly flew all around, causing the nearby few to quickly take few steps back. Stainless, who held onto the razor blade that previously belonged to Bruiser, landed in front of him. He was seen with many severe wounds, especially his left arm, which seemed nearly detached from his body. Then, being unable to maintain his consciousness, Stainless fell with a thud. Rear Admiral Stainless Marine Captain Happy cried with a cold sweat. At the next moment to everyone's shock, Bruiser Wobbly stood back up with a stoic expression and pulled the sword out of his stomach. The blood initially gushed out from his wound, but upon him tightening his muscles around the wound, the bleeding miraculously stopped. I admit, Bruiser said darkly, today is a loss. We surely haven't expected the near wipeout in paradise of all possibilities. He then turned to look at the unconscious Avery, who was tied with a sea stone cuff. However, the only importance in Goldtooth Pirates is Captain Vane, me, and a very over there. The rest? I don't care. Bruiser's whole body then began to turn black, indicating the use of armament haki. Hardening, on his entire body, as long as we are alive boom. Then, a figure came in flying, before colliding with Bruiser. Said figure was Sea Captain. None other than Goldtooth himself, as Bruiser said in disbelief. Half Half Vane, whose legs were missing and bleeding heavily, huffed in exhaustion, before desperately gripping Bruiser's ankle. Gee, get us Huff out of here. You aren't going anywhere, Goldtooth. Then, Kuzan came in, walking with his hands in his pockets. Although his attire was ripped and few bruises could be seen on his exposed body, in comparison to Vane, there was no indication of severe wounds or exhaustion. Then, Kuzan vanished from everyone's sight, before appearing next to Bruiser, with his arm draped around the latter's neck, ice time. Bruiser, who was in direct contact with Kuzan, and Vane, who was holding onto Bruiser's ankle, both froze into the statues of ice. And thus, the battle at G2 came to a conclusion. In the ocean nearby the marine base G2, there lied one marine ship floating by. Within such ship, one marine officer, characterized by the orange-colored hair and slit eyes, sat next to a wooden table that had a den den mushy on top of it. Contrary to our expectations, Goldtooth pirates lost even after giving them one of our valuable resources. The deep voice spoke through the den den mushy. Do not fret. There is no point in lamenting over something that has already happened. The orange-haired marine officer, who formed a gentle smile on his face, said softly, as long as we manage to keep ourselves hidden, there will always be the next time, big brother. Or should I say, Admiral Cedar Heavy. The voice replied with a snort, before stating, of course, I will. You know me. 
The Marine officer, now known as Bayard, said pleasantly, all for the glory of the sky. The remaining soldiers treat the wounded. Captain Happy, move Rear Admiral Stainless to safety and prioritize his recuperation. Standing in front of the frozen vein and bruiser, Kuzan immediately ordered, Signalman, call the headquarter and report this situation. Additionally, ask when the backup will arrive. Yes, sir. Turning to Joan, Kuzan commanded, Joan, check the ins and outs of the Goldtooth Pirate's ship which is docked on the other side of this island. Bring back any useful medical equipment. Yes, sir. Chion immediately dashed after a strict salute away from where I currently stood. Vice Admiral Kuzan, one Marine soldier, who was looking at the sea ahead through the binoculars in his hands, suddenly spoke up. I sight one Marine ship approaching us. It seems to be the division under the command of Vice Admiral Bayard. Perking up to the Marine soldier's words, I looked at the sea. Indeed, one Marine ship which seemed to be the same model as Kuzan's, was rapidly sailing at this island. The backup was finally here. Keep your eyes on them. Kuzan stated seriously, before, without hesitation, shattering the frozen figures of Vane, and Bruiser killing them off in a single go. My eyes narrowed. This wasn't like Kuzan to give up the chance to interrogate the captured criminals. However, I understood that his sudden decision lied on the approaching marine ship, and that there must have been a reason why. Therefore, following his suit, White Snake, my hand immediately morphing into a rapidly traveling White Snake of smoke, shot out at the cuffed and unconscious Averi, before coiling around Averi tightly. Subsequently, its color suddenly subverted into pitch black setting Averi's entire body on a potent fire, and reducing the teen into ashes in an instant. It's a good thing that you are a fast learner, smoker. Kuzan commented as he gazed at the burnt corpse of Averi emotionlessly. The current development of events won't allow us to interrogate them, and I fear for the worst. Pointing at the Marine Base G2 behind us, Kuzan then ordered me. Now, inspect the base and check if there is any survivor left, and... Kuzan's expression darkened as he spoke, look for the base commander, Vice Admiral Victorious. Make sure to bring me the full report of his state. My eyes narrowed. Kuzan seemed to be concerned about the approaching backup, as far as I could deduce. Leave it to me. Morphing my body into smoke, I quickly flew into the opened entrance of G2. Swoo rooms, rooms, and more rooms. Corpses that used to be the marine soldiers, all scattered with burnt marks on them. Explosions I noted of Ares works. Traveling further, I only sighted empty and damaged facilities. Plundered or destroyed, there was nothing of use in this hollow and horrifying base. Dead. Dead also dead. Turn right. Spread smoke all around for a thorough inspection. See if anyone is alive, especially Vice Admiral Victorious. Vice Admiral Victorious. Ha, I thought as my half-smoked body rushed through the quiet hallway that was painted with blood, I did hear about him before. A relatively young Vice Admiral like Kuzan San, who was well known to be a faithful believer of moral justice I stopped, with my body slowly returning back to its human form. In front of me, there was one corpse lying in a pool of blood. Unlike the other corpses, this one, in particular, was violated to a horrifying degree eyeballs plucked out, nose cut, limbs disfigured, and torso full of baseball-sized holes. Judging by the corpse's attire, his rank was Vice Admiral. Finally, within proximity, there was a badge, one which symbolized one's status as the base commander. I was currently looking into the mutilated corpse whose name was Vice Admiral Victorious. Ha! Huh, I massaged my temples and closed my eyes, away from the gory side ahead of me, trying to ease myself. One thing I can say for sure, is that these wounds aren't Avery's work. That explosive lad is incapable of controlling his strength, and uses his fruit ability at every single chance possible. Based on this, and based on the fact that Bruiser had trouble facing Rear Admiral Stainless, it has to be Goldtooth himself who was responsible for doing this. Repeating my eyes with a deep frown, I speculated, the best answer I can come up on this incident, is that Goldtooth harbored hatred for Vice Admiral Victorious. Upon finding out the information, he immediately sailed out. However, this brings yet another inquiry. Just how did he acquire such information, that Vice Admiral Victorious led the Marine Base G2? With newspaper being the sole source of information available to everyone, and with this world being filled with vast oceans, receiving the whereabouts of Vice Admiral Victorious, in the lawless new world, doesn't seem easy. Then there was only one answer left, wasn't it? There's a spy, or spies, in the Marine. There are those who join their hands with the pirates, for whatever motive that they may have hold on. My eyes widened, finally understanding why Kuzan killed Vane and Bruiser just before. Quickly morphing my body into smoke, I began to fly out of the base as quickly as possible. It was clearly stated by the headquarter beforehand, that the backups will swiftly be provided, yet we were left by ourselves to deal with the Goldtooth Pirates. Those so-called backups they are likely to be the traitors themselves. I apologize for the delay, Vice Admiral Kuzan, Bayard, the orange-haired and slit-eyed Vice Admiral, bowed politely with a sincere expression. It seems that Goldtooth planted many of his subordinate pirate crews all around the base, and they tenaciously blocked away. Then, making a smile on his face, Bayard said to Kuzan whose expression was cold, 
and considering how I struggled against those pirates alone, imagine my surprise when I found that you managed to neutralize them all by yourselves. I currently am filled with nothing but respect for you, Vice Admiral Kuzan. It has only been a year. Sorry. I cannot follow what you are trying to speak of. Kuzan spoke up with his eyes shadowed. A year ago, Victoria San dismantled the Goldtooth, and while Goldtooth was being transported to the Impel Down, he miraculously escaped somehow. A year, that's the amount of time he spent in the New World rebuilding his crew from the scratch. Kuzan said coldly, in the New World, most of the pirates end up joining one of the big three even the hundreds that were situated on this beach was a stretch for Goldtooth. And here, you say subordinate pirate crews. Do you truly think that highly of Goldtooth? Ha ha. I do not understand the sudden hostility aimed at me, Vice Admiral Kuzan, Bayard smiled gently. Though your reasoning is logical to some extent, it is a speculation in the end. The truth is that my division faced many pirates, and nothing more. Kuzan was about to speak once again. However, Bayard then placed his arm around Kuzan's shoulder in a friendly manner, and whispered into the former's ear. And you know, don't try to dig in too deep, my comrade in justice they are watching over you. Bayard's eyes swept over the injured marines at the back, who were being lifted up by the others capable of moving. Kuzan frowned upon noticing this, for he knew that Bayard was indirectly threatening him of the consequences that will follow. If he were to act rashly, a person is meant to live by the fate he or she is destined with. Vice Admiral Kuzan, the targets of your hostility should be the pirates, not your fellow Vice Admiral. Backing off from Kuzan, Bayard chuckled jokingly. Then, he turned around and ordered his division, all men, help out a fellow comrades. It just had a rough battle. Yes, sir. With his back still facing Kuzan, Baird stated, we will take over the authority over the remaining Goldtooth pirates from here on. I suggest that you return to Marineford and get a nice rest, Vice Admiral Kuzan. Kuzan stood still, with his face headed down. When Smoker rushed out of the base, such was the scene that was laid out in front of him. It was a cloudy night in the middle of the sea. The waves were gentle and the dim light of the moon was blocked by the thick layer of clouds, such that the entire sea fell into the darkness. Our ship sailed by alone peacefully. Bayard's division remained at G2 to clean up the base, with the remnants of Goldtooth pirates under their care. Tonight, all marines were given temporarily relieved of their night duties, and were allowed deep sleep for the sake of the rest. Instead of them, it was Kuzan himself who was sitting outside, ensuring that there was no threat around. I bet that Joan probably is hugging her sword like a doll as she slept. But Kuzan wasn't alone at the current moment. I, finding myself unable to sleep, sat next to him, staring at the mild waves that softly crashed over the ship. Vice Admiral Victorious's corpse was... Given a cruel treatment Kuzan San, I said in a disheartened tone, though I came to view many dead ones by now, none of them would be able to compare to what I saw today. Closing my eyes, I felt the cold wind breezing through. Kuzan, without responding, popped open a bottle of liquor in his hands. There are spies in our ranks, Kuzan San, speaking up once more. I muttered solemnly. Someone told Goldtooth, one full of hatred, the whereabouts of Vice Admiral Victorious. Spice Kuzan sighed, won't be the right way to describe them. He then sighed once more, being unable to conceal his downhearted state. There are those who identify themselves as being affiliated with the world government rather than the Marine. Getting enlisted and entering the ranks of Marine is an easy process. And in order to keep the Marine under their control, the world government planted their eyes here and there. It is a custom that's been continuing since the past, and I was simply reminded of it today. World government I clenched my fists clenched unconsciously. The words spoken out of Kuzan meant Victoria Sen wasn't attacked by the pirates, but rather eliminated by the world government. I was at loss for words. He was someone who followed his heart, refusing to heed the orders from the world government. Hell look where his rebellious tendency got him. Kuzan raised up his other hand, which was holding onto a bottle of liquor, and gazed into the bottle. Jera's, Zephyr Sensei's favorite perfect on days like this. I watched as Kuzan chugged down the alcohol with a painful expression on his face. The ocean sees the beginning of the world, and the ocean knows the end of the world, he seemed hollow and lost, not knowing where to go. Within this dark sea, he seemed more stranded than he ever has been. Thus it calls us towards the way we must take thus it leads us towards a proper world lowering the bottle. Kuzan poured the remaining liquor into the sea, enveloping pain and suffering greatly and kindly wrapping them up. The ocean sees the beginning of the world, and the ocean knows. The end of the world, we continued to sit by as the ship sailed through the night completely worn out both physically and mentally. One week after, Marineford in the Marineford, under the bright sunlight two boys were sitting atop one plain looking building, with their eyes having dark bags underneath locked onto the vast sky. Ha! Huh. One boy, Akahand, sighed deeply. I feel like dying the other boy. Shoo. Held his head in misery, it's it's just too much. I've been training under Zephyr Sensei for almost two years by now, and I still am baffled by the sheer amount of physical exercises we were tasked with every single day. I mean, he really is a great teacher. We improved a lot in comparison to who we were in the past, but Akahan shook his head, we aren't monsters like the others. Hell, I don't know how they managed to improve so much within years. I don't know either, man, she slumped in the end, not even having any more strength to continue staring at the sky, 
Weren't they on the same level as us when we first came here? Just how the hell? Hey, you two, what are you doing here again? Then, a feminine voice interrupted their whines. Turning around, Shu and Akahan were met with the sight of Dol, who had hands on her waist although it's a day off for us. That doesn't mean you should be slacking off like this. Learn from Bastille and Dalmatian, you lazy asses Shu bickered TCH, what are you, my mom? Akahan frowned while picking his ear with his pinky, before plucking said finger out and blowing the earwax at Dol. Fuck off, Dol. What the fuck, Akahan? It's just a matter of talent, and nothing more. Ignoring Dol's exasperation, Shu shrugged powerlessly. I mean, look at Cancer. You know that he's even lazier than the two of us, but he still manages to ace every single task given, as if it's nothing she turned back and muttered, the only salvation for me is to eat a devil fruit. Agreed, Akahan nodded. I would like a real strong one, like Vice Admiral Gup's fruit. Shu whined in frustration, Marine hero he's one lucky bastard. For sure. You. Idiots, Dol seemed astonished by the antics of two boys, Marine hero didn't eat a devil fruit. Yeah, keep lying and see if I'll fall for it. He definitely ate something like strong strong fruit. Just then, Hey all of you, from some buildings away, Bastille was seen to be jumping and running across the roofs to the three at rapid speed, while waving his arms excitedly. Dol, Shu, and Akahan turned their heads at the masked teen with long orange colored hair. Calm yourself down, Bastille. You might end up breaking those roofs, you know. Dol shouted with a concern, but Bastille didn't seem to have heard. Instead, he shouted jovially, Smoker is back Dara. Upon hearing Bastille's excited cry, Shu and Akahan looked at each other with blank expressions. Bastille, noticing their demeanors, looked at Dol with confusion, to which she responded with a shrug. In the Marineford Tower, at topmost floor, there lies the Fleet Admiral Sengoku's office. Within this room, the four of us. Kuzan, Happy, Joan, and me, were standing upon receiving the call from Sengoku himself. In contrast to the three of us, Kuzan seemed to be relaxed, however. Welcome back, all of you, Sengoku said sternly as I stood strictly while gazing forward. He, with his hands on his back, walked across each and every one of us. I've heard of your outstanding feats for the past few months. It is without a doubt that many's lives were saved under your hands, I am proud of you. And I believe that it is unfair to leave you unrewarded. Sengoku stopped in front of Jion. Ensign, Jion, I've been keeping my eyes on you since your time under Vice Admiral Tsuru's command. Exquisite swordsmanship combined with a strong sense of justice. I've got high expectations on you. Sengoku paused briefly, before stating, I hereby grant you the promotion to the rank of Lieutenant. May your sense of justice not waver. Jion, his hands were clenched in delight, said out loud, Thank you Fleet Admiral Sengoku. Sengoku then moved on to where I was standing, Ensign Smoker. I cannot help but be baffled to see that all these achievements are the works of a 13-year-old. Regardless, it is wrong to judge you by your age, and there is no one in the Marine who'd deny of your formidable belief in justice. Although you were given the promotion to Ensign just two months ago, it will be wrong for me to leave you out. After all the deeds you've done, I hereby grant you the promotion to the rank of Lieutenant. May you advance further. Thank you Fleet Admiral Sengoku. Sengoku continued forth. Captain Happy, the one whose role was to oversee the battle and manage the Marine soldiers, received a promotion to Commodore. Rear Admiral Stainless, although he wasn't able to come due to his injury, was promoted to Vice Admiral. That's how significant the victory over the Goldtooth Pirates was. And finally, Vice Admiral Kuzan. Sengoku's expression became sullen as he stopped in front of Kuzan, you have strength. You have leadership. Considering the sheer number of pirates you caught, and the fact that each one of them are dangerous on their own right, the rank of Vice Admiral is unfit to determine your capability. However, I, staring at the front with my body still. Listen to Sengoku's words carefully. The decision to grant you a code name is not something I am able to decide by myself. Sengoku then stated, Therefore, what I will be granting you this time around is an opportunity. Yesterday, Jaguar D. Sol reported that he captured Nyko Olvia, the one who broke the law, and went on her journey to decipher the Poneglyphs. And it was determined that she and her colleagues were from Ahara within the West Blue. By tomorrow, he will reach G1. I felt my heart dropping as Sengoku spoke. The attempt to unveil the Poneglyphs is one of the worst crimes possible, one that may erupt the whole world into chaos. Therefore, a top secret mission was issued from Gorosei. Five vice admirals will lead ten warships that have the recent Seastone technology planted to Ahara in the West Blue. Kuzan, whose eyes were covered behind his sunglasses, remarked in a low tone, Buster Call, I see. Sengoku said while placing his hand on Kuzan's shoulder, And you will be one of the five vice admiral Kuzan. Show your justice the willingness to erase all the dark of the world. Gorosei will be watching you. This this isn't a reward I couldn't help but think this is a test. The doomsday for Oferins has begun its countdown. Currently, I was in one room that consisted of bed, table, and some more utilities for living. This room was meant to be used all by myself being one of the perks of having the status of a marine officer. A horror incident. Huh? Saul will arrive at G1 tomorrow. Nyko Olvia will primarily be interrogated by the specialists, before being transferred to the Impel Down or perhaps Mary G.I.'s. 
where she will be interrogated again. Saul will eventually use his status to bring Olvia out and flee, using himself as a sacrifice to ensure that Olvia reaches the Ahara. Then, the five vice admirals will sail to the Ahara, directly across the calm belt, promising nothing but destruction. And one of them will be Sakazuki. Ha! Huh, I couldn't help but sigh. Lying down on the bed, I took out a gum dispenser from my pocket, which Joan threw at me, saying that it was my early birthday present. Joan said back then, how powerless Maureen really is. I chuckled with my eyes still on the gum dispenser as I recalled upon the case of Vice Admiral Victorious. The monstrosity known as the Absolute Justice is no different from admitting yourself as the world government's dog. Marine-centric justice, world government-centric justice those ideals speak of nothing but idiocy, blatantly claiming that they are always in the right. However, reject those views, and you shall be eliminated. In this Buster call, I knew for certain that Vice Admiral Bayard he surely will be one of the five. Buster Call isn't preventable. A horror incident is bound to happen. And I didn't plan to stop them from destroying the island whatsoever I simply couldn't. However, I had this indescribable feeling in me. Though my head gave up, my heart surely didn't. It was telling me that even if I was bound to fail, I had to try at the very least. It was telling me that there surely must be a way to tweak the future without risking anything. I stared at the gum dispenser in my hand once more, with my mind simulating through many different possibilities, looking for an answer in this situation. Then, the door was banged all of a sudden, waking me up from my thoughts. Hey smoker, I know that you are in there Dara. That familiar voice. The gloomy feeling in me vanished in an instant, and I found a grin on my face. How come you haven't come to see us after your arrival? Get out of there, right now Dara. Standing back up and placing the gum dispenser in my pocket, I put on a standard marine cap that lied on the table. Reaching for the door, I opened it, and was met with the sight of my friends. Hina's arms were crossed, with her face stoic as always. The steel, who grew even taller, grinned behind his usual mask. Doll, who seemed to have gotten tattoos on her arms, stood with her hands on her waist, more endowed than she was a year ago. And the first thing I said was, Hey, the steel, your left arm it has become notably thicker. The steel responded with his chin lifted up high. Proudly, of course, I trained a lot. But on the other hand, he looked at my left arm, which seemed to be of same thickness as my right. Someone's been neglecting his training, Dara. Ah, but you're wrong, my friend. I said with a smirk, you see, I am ambidextrous. The steel's jaw dropped. He then knelt in front of me and asked, he please teach me your ways, Smoker Sensei Dara. Hey, listen well. You see, you boys. Doll, who seemed to understand what we are speaking of, sweat dropped, neglecting his training. Hina heard otherwise, the steel. Hina then commented in a monotone. Hina heard once that Vice Admiral Gup made Smoker climb up the entire cliff with his fingers alone. Doll patted Hina on the head with a smile, causing the latter to frown in annoyance. Please stay the way you are, Hina. Don't touch Hina. I dazed off with nostalgia upon hearing Hina. Ah, uh, the cliff one. I remember having all my fingers swell and broke while doing 5,000 vertical push-ups, man. Those were good days. Hina, Bastille, and Dole all looked at me with widened eyes as if they heard something wrong. Dole then whispered at two of them, he's been completely brainwashed. Hina is afraid that Smoker already became our generation of Vice Admiral Gup. Hina shook her head with a faint sadness. There is no going back. The steel snorted, man it's been itching to fight you again, Smoker. And I can tell he's fucked. Come on, let's go elsewhere. I'm hungry. Yawning. I motioned forth while beginning to walk, let's just take a rest for now. I'll think after. I was standing within the calm before the storm situation. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Time fly faster than it ever has been. Tick, tock, tick, tock. To an extent where I could hearing the clock ticking from miles away. Tick, tock, tick, tock. For a day, I took a nice relief hanging out with my colleagues. However, in the end, they didn't manage to ease my mind, and I found my heart beating fast. Aha! Countless lives will be lost. My persuasion won't work, and my status is considered too low to have a voice in this matter. I lack strength, and I can't afford to make a blatant action either. Should I try to cause a problem here, such that the mission will be delayed? Or should I try to do something, such that Sakazuki ends up being unable to join this mission? But how? I wish I can inform this matter to Got Sensei as well, but he cut off all possible forms of communication. If he knew about this, what would his action be? How about what's with you today? You seem so depressed. Currently, I was standing on the deck of Kuzan's ship, which was carrying our division to the New World. Traveling against gravity, and surrounded by the Red Walls, this ship of ours, along with one more warship at our back, was currently crossing the Red Line. The other Vice Admirals were all found at the New World currently, and due to the harsh weather there, it was said by Sengoku that their arrival to G1 will be later than ours. And my gaze was headed above, at the top of the red line, where the Mary G. Ice lies. Joan, I spoke up sternly, 
What do you think about the Buster Call? Buster Call? Joan, coming to a stop next to me, shrugged to a normal human's perspective, it may seem terrifying. After all, it is the merciless bombardment with a terrifying purpose, to erase the existence of an island itself. However, I don't view it as a bad thing. I turn to Joan, whose eyes held conviction of her own, if there are criminals who are so corrupted, that their ideals and deeds may infect the others, and if their existence alone challenges the justice, then they deserve the buster call. A little twisted I'd say, however, the scholars may seem innocent at the first glance, but know this, smoker. They knew the full consequence of their actions, yet still took upon the risk. Now, they simply are paying the price. An evacuation ship will be sent to let the innocents get out of the crossfire, there is nothing wrong about this. Then let me ask, upon hearing Joan's firm words, I asked, do you believe that the Marine is an absolute justice, under all circumstances? Joan, in response, raised her eyebrow. Do I need to answer such an obvious question for you? Joan then stated, of course. Pink Rabbit, Momasagi, that will be her future code name. And Pinkit is a mix of red and white. It seemed that Joan was yet another individual who placed her ideal in the doctrine of absolute justice. Taking my eyes off of Joan, I looked at my back, where Kuzan was seen to be sleeping with the sleeping band on top of his eyes, by lying on the comfortable looking chair. Before I knew, he was already becoming more and more like the lazy person whom I've seen in the Anime. Is this why you quit the Marine, Sol? I couldn't help but be repulsed by this organization, the more I came to learn of its true face. Currently, with two warships, under Kuzan's command, docked at this Marine base G1, we were greeted by the female Marine officer of old age. The calm tone of her voice, the tall height that amounted to two meters without a doubt, the person standing in front of us was none other than big sister Tsuru. Joan, unable to suppress her joy, ran out to Tsuru. Oh, good to see you again, Joan. Tsuru, making a gentle smile, embraced Joan as the latter jumped on her. While doing so, she shifted her eyes at Kuzan. Good to see you again as well, Kuzan, you are the second one to arrive. I'm sorry, Tsuru-san, but I'm not in the mood to talk. If you wish to converse about that so-called secret mission, consult Saul instead. On the other hand, Kuzan, whose eyes were half-lidded from him just having woken up, yawned before placing his sunglasses on his face, I'm going out for a while. Don't look for me until I return. Why? I suppose I'll do that. Suru, knowing that her persuasion won't work on the Iceman, simply stated, the date of operation is within a week, Kuzan. Be sure to return until then. Kuzan didn't reply, but walked away while pulling on a bicycle next to him. Now then, Suru turning back to us as Joan seemed to have calmed down, spoke up in a reserved manner. I am Vice Admiral Tsuru, the base commander of G1. Since Kuzan is out, and newly promoted Vice Admiral Stainless is still bedridden, your division will temporarily fall under my command. She looked around each one of us with a calm expression before continuing, and although I have no plan of making you suffer whatsoever, my children be sure to keep yourself self-contained. Is that clear? Yes ma'am. Then, Tsuru walked and stopped in front of me, before exclaiming knowingly, and you must be Smoker whom Gup's been boasting about. Vice Admiral Tsuru, I immediately saluted upon her approach, it is an honor to meet the great advisor of the Marine. Tsuru smiled in response, call me Tsuru-san, my child. There is no need to be so strict in front of me. Lowering my arm instantly, I smiled back, got it, Tsuru-san. I see that you are the shy one. Chuckling at my demeanor, Tsuru then asked, then let me ask you a quick question, child. What is your then? She froze for a second, before placing her hand on her chin in a thoughtful manner. Now, where was I again? Then, she abruptly turned her head at the trail of ice that Kuzan left on the sea, before exclaiming, Oh my, he's already gone so far away. I asked out of confusion, Uh, Tsuru-san, since when did I give my permission for you to call me Tsuru-san? Tsuru narrowed her eyes at me, before humming, No, before that, who are you? Ah, uh, then, Joan suddenly stepped up, snap out of it, Sister, Tsuru turned at Joan, and raised her eyebrow, And who are you? Jeez, it's gotten much worse since I last saw you. Tsuru then looked down at her body, before raising her face back up with a dumbfounded expression, And who am I? Joan grabbed Tsuru by shoulders and wildly shook her, Wacky up, Sister Tsuru remained in her dumbfounded expression for a while, before finally regaining the light in her eyes, Oh oh my, I sweat dropped, Four vice admirals out, barely any capable individuals in G1 currently, and Sura being forgetful. I could see why Saul managed to break out with Olvia beep, 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 beep. Then, the alert suddenly went off, filling the entire base with loud noises. My eyes widened while turning at the sea out of instinct, and I saw one marine ship sailing out of the base smoothly toward the southward direction. Sura, gaining a serious expression, muttered, he must be taking that archaeologist to Ahara to warn them. Saul arrived before us the marine soldiers were seen running out of the base and boarding two different marine ships. Sail out we can't lose them from a sight. One marine officer shouted in urgency, and immediately after he said so, two marine ships raised their anchors and began their sail at rapid speed. Saul is a veteran who's been serving the marine for quite some time, along with his giant heritage, our best option at hand is. Looking at Tsuru, who seemed to be thinking, 
I voiced up Tsuru san. I will go. Both Tsuru and Joan turned at me. I am the user of Smoke Smoke Fruit. Flying up in the air is of no trouble to me, while Vice Admiral Saul's set of movements are limited on a ship. If there is anyone who stands the chance against Vice Admiral Saul in this situation, it's me. Smoker. Jion immediately retorted, don't forget, you're just a lieutenant in rank just like me. What do you mean stand a chance? Going after right now is akin to leading yourself to a sure death. Suru, who turned away from me, sighed knowingly, like teacher like disciple. You learned a bad habit from Garp, didn't you? I grinned in response while crouching my body down. Well you got that part about me right. Even if you were to reject my request, I still am going. I felt my heart beating fast. Of course this was dangerous, but nothing that I've gone through until today was without risk. The moment I saw the huge form of Saul, I knew that this was the only way. Just know this, my child, Suru said solemnly. I don't want to own Garp's remorse. So ensure that you return safe and sound. Do you hear? That's forgiven, Suru-san. Though, it may not be the way you think. Swoosh. Propelling myself at the distant three ships, I morphed my body into smoke and began the chase after a giant and an archaeologist. In the West Blue, there lies an island one that is composed of green all around. In its middle, there lies its most notable trait. The huge, incredibly huge tree that would render anyone shocked. And at its shore, where the waves gently crashed by, one man no, a giant, could be seen, lying face first. He was bruised and injured all around, and judging by his unmoving body, one could deduce that he was unconscious. And at this isolated beach where no one but that one giant seemed to exist, a young girl appeared. She had straight black hair and blue-colored eyes, she was none other than Nico Robin, the daughter of Nico Olvia, who just turned eight in terms of age today. Wah! Robin, upon coming to sight the giant, expressed her awe and nervousness. Yet, driven by the curiosity of a scholar, she carefully approached the huge man. Before, Huff Huff saw over here, Beach, Huff, and a muffled voice was heard from underneath the giant's body. Then, much to Robin's interest, the wisp of smoke began to flow out, before reforming into a teenage boy wearing the tattered and wet marine attire. Smoker. His state didn't look good either. His originally white-colored hair was drenched with blood, and there lied gashes and bruises all over his body similar to the still unconscious giant. Then, he turned his eyes to Robin, who stared at him with a blank expression and said awkwardly, Hi. Robin simply tilted her head, unfazed. Then, she murmured, a ghost. Smoker sweat dropped before pointing at the unconscious giant. What about him then? Hum. Robin thought for a second before answering, Earthworm. Holding his nose and blowing, Smoker expelled the water out of his ears. He then remarked, Cheeky brat, says the kid. Well, I obviously look older than you. Age doesn't represent one's intellect. Are you a scholar like me? One's intelligence is unrelated to his or her wisdom. Wisdom has a closer relation to age, and therefore, I get to call your brat. Robin replied in a monotone, wisdom is figurative at most. Intelligence is an absolute value. Knowledge determines one's maturity. Based on this logic, I'm more of an adult than you are. And you shouldn't call me a brat. Cheeky brat. Robin turned her face away from Smoker in the end, whatever. I don't care anyway. Cough, cough. Then, the giant began to cough, signaling that his consciousness returned. And just like that the Ahara incident has come to a start. Nico Robin I thought as I locked my eyes on the young girl. So I arrived at the right place, it seems. It was a gamble at best. Back then, after I left G1, tailing Jaguar D. Saul and Nico Olvia along with two marine ships. Saul, leaving the ship that was carrying Olvia and him, abruptly jumped onto our ships, preventing any further advancement. And what a fierce battle it was, with Saul enduring all the attacks on him, and solely focusing on breaking the ships. If not for the storm that suddenly struck down us, blowing all of us away, he probably would have accomplished his objective, although the whereabouts of the other marine soldiers are unknown now. Back then, during the storm, I continued to chase after Saul, whose enormous body was battered and bruised by the storm. Risking my life, I entered the wild storm and hid myself in Saul's clothes, before we plummeted into the sea. Cough, 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 cough and now, Saul, coughing out gallons of water over and over, seemed to be returning back to life, slowly gua, before suddenly screaming with his eyes popped out upon sighting Robin and me, for no reason in particular. Robin and me, not expressing any surprise whatsoever, simply looked back at the giant impassively. I then turned my head back at Robin and asked, are you hungry? Judging by the nuance of your speaking, Robin replied while holding her hands together from her back, you are the one who's hungry, aren't you? You aren't wrong there. I'm going to get some food, scratching the back of my head and turning back to see Saul, who was breathing heavily. I then pointed at my back, after we move him to a better location, that is, after moving Saul away from the shore and deep into the forest, and quickly building a campfire to let him warm his body. I returned back to the shore, along with one long stick in my hands. Robin, who seemed to be curious about what I was going to do, 
Follow me. You used smoke to move that giant. Robin noted as I began to stab the stick in the sea at a rapid speed, stabbing through one fish that was swimming in the water. Yeah, that's my ability. I replied with a grin, before stabbing the stick again, catching another fist with ease. Why, are you amazed? Robin pursed her lips in thought, before raising her hand up. Immediately after her motion, a hand of a similar size as Robin's suddenly grew from the nearby sand and waved at me. Because of this, the kids in town say I'm creepy, so I don't play with them. I thought that maybe you are the same as me. There's nothing wrong about this. You simply ate a devil fruit, right? I said casually, stabbing through the third fish that swam by. Powers like this are very common in the Grand Line. Growing arms is scary. EFF, I've seen a guy who was a literal walking explosion. He laughed like a crazy retard as well. If anything, he's Basley and times creepier than you ever will be. Then, our conversation fell silent. The only sounds around us were the waves crashing over the shore, and the small plops that I generated while jabbing the stick into the water. Yet, Robin stood next to me, refusing to leave. So, I reopened my mouth, while placing the stick full of fish on my shoulder. My name is Smoker. What's yours? Robin, who looked up at me upon my question, muttered Robin. Crouching down to take the fish off the stick, I then began to dismantle them skillfully. Gart Sensei made me grow strong, after all. Robin? Huh, sounds like a boy's name to me. I said with a smirk. Says Smoker, Robin immediately made a comeback, before giggling as if she found her own joke funny. Oh, I can't think of a comeback. Making meaningless conversations back and forth, I eventually got all fish dismantled, ready to cook. Returning back to the forest where Saul was taking a rest, I placed in more woods to reignite the dying fire and began to roast the fish. Saul, who seemed to be in a much better state than before, was sleeping soundly. While the fish meat, stabbed by multiple sticks that had their other ends embedded in the ground, were being roasted, I cut down a moderately sized wood with Rankyaku, and placed its trunk on the ground to provide a place for Robin and me to sit down on top of. You know, sitting next to Robin, who was swinging her legs in front of the fire, I asked, you've been with me for quite some time by now. The sun has begun to set as well. Won't your parents get suspicious? I don't have any parents. Robin, who seemed downcast by my question, answered, I have a mom, but her job keeps her away on the ocean, and I don't even remember her face. Yes of course, Nico Olvia I thought with distaste, the one who left her one and only child for the sake of mere knowledge. A fool who's responsible for placing her daughter in 20 years of misery. You know, we're kind of similar. I said while lifting up one stick, where the fish it stabbed through was now ready to eat, before handing it to Robin. Robin, who received the stick with fish from me, looked at me questioningly. Since birth, I only had grandfather as my family, and he too passed away quite a long time ago. Raising my head up to see that the night was descending, I said with sincerity, my hometown, the place in which I buried my grandfather, was destroyed by the pirates. Wandering alone, by yourself, sailing in the cold and harsh sea, on top of a small boat turning at Robin, who looked at me with widened eyes. I smiled. I think I can somewhat understand your loneliness. Robin's hold over the stick trembled. After all, it probably was the first time she's met someone who's so similar to her in many ways someone whom she can bond with unlike the people on this island can i robin whispered with her hair covering her eyes stay here for the night ah well i was caught off guard by her sudden question but eventually grinned feel free to stay as long as you like flexing my biceps i said confidently it seems that the time for me to show off the gut survival technique no point one house building has arrived hey hey what even is that Robin, who laughed at my antics, commented before taking the bite off of the fish. Deep into the night, where the fire was off, there now stood a small wooden house that I quickly built. Within there, on top of the cushion of leaves that I frantically gathered from all around, Robin was sleeping. I couldn't help but wonder if she really trusted me, a stranger whom she just met this much. She's still an innocent eight-year-old. Ha, I sighed while raising my head up at the sky, where the stars were shining brilliantly, but from this incident, she begins twenty years full of suffering, just because of her possession over the knowledge. My face darkened. Once again, I reminded myself of the reason why I came here, and steeled my resolve. You know, this is pretty good. Then, a voice was heard from my side. Saul, who was munching on the fish I previously roasted, gulping the food down and looking at me with confusion, Saul whispered in a low tone, afraid of waking Robin up. Why did you help me? With my gaze still headed up, I replied, Do I need a reason to save a righteous man like you? I betrayed Marine. Yeah, going to be in trouble if you help me. Saul stated with a sigh. Besides, we foe back then. I don't understand why you're doing this all of a sudden. If I had more strength, I wouldn't have put up such acts. If not for Marine being my home, if I didn't have any ties there whatsoever, I may have quit this organization already. I stated truthfully, which brought Saul to look at me with shock, I've only recently realized. More than half of the organization is composed of faithful dogs of the world government. The justice that they love to boast is nothing but a symbol which represents that they are the loyal slaves of the celestial dragons. Yeah different. Buster Call, 
which will soon happen, is nothing but cruelty. Trampling upon the home of the innocents, especially by a cause that didn't involve any killing, any plundering, or any evil act, but simply consisted of a wish to learn the past. I snarled as the anger began to build up in me, under no means can that be justified. This is nothing but a massacre, something that the marines shouldn't do under all circumstances. So, finishing up the remaining fish, placed the sticks down and looked up at the sky, following my suit. He then said, what's your plan now then? Plan? Huh, I thought to myself, I do have one in mind. Question is, will it work? Find where we are, reach Ahara. Then, what did you say? Saul, looking at Robin in panic, shouted at her, Oh Ahara, you say? Robin nodded slowly while taking a step back, intimidated by Saul's shout. We're already at Ahara. I, feigning my shock, muttered with my hand on my chin. Robin looked at me questioningly. What's wrong? Taking in a deep breath, I made a smile and patted her head. Don't worry. This island is going to be blown up soon but I will try my best to minimize the stake. Robin's jaw dropped in disbelief, F for real. Saul looked at me, while still shaken from the news. His lips quivered filled with nothing but fright. Placing my hands on my face, I slicked back my white hair. Then, looking at the two of them, I stated to them, I have a plan. The bombardment is inevitable, but more lives can be saved. But for this to work, I need help. Though I have no idea how much time I got, I have to try all that I can do. I asked, filled with nothing but determination, will you two help me? Robin seemed to be sweating from nervousness. Yet, she nodded, why yes. You are my friend now, after all. Saul, who took in a deep breath to calm himself down, asked me with a stern expression, what's your plan? Smiling in gratitude, I leaned down and began my explanation. This is how it's going to happen. First my heart was thumping fast. Will I be able to protect all that I wish for? The answer to this question depended on how I will spend the time given to me. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The clock it was rapidly ticking by. Saul, after arriving at Ahara in the cannon, stayed hidden for some days though. I can't remember the exact number. I thought to myself from what Suru said to Kuzan-san. The operation will begin within a week, as in they will leave the base G1 within a week if Saul and Olvia were not to have broke out. From my speculation, I believe that we have around three to four days before the buster call begins. With such thoughts in my mind, I spoke up to Robin and Saul in front of me. Let's talk about the civilians. There indeed is an evacuation ship provided in the cannon, which the civilians are bored to get away from the buster call. However, Sakazuki then blasts down the entire ship to thoroughly ensure that no knowledge gets leaked out. I was thinking if Kuzan was present during then, would he have prevented it? Probably I thought, but I can't say for sure. And I'd rather not weigh human lives over probability, meaning I have to choose among the two following options. 1. Prevent the civilians from boarding the evacuation ship while somehow having them survive the buster call. 2. Prove and appeal their innocence, such that Sakazuki finds no need to kill them. The answer was pretty obvious, for the second option of proving was practically impossible, knowledge wasn't a visible concept. You don't know if a particular individual has it or not, and he or she can simply fabricate a lie. Lie detector, you say. A convenient tool like that doesn't exist. The first option is the only possibility. Then, what must be done in order to prevent the civilians from boarding the evacuation ship? There was no need to overthink. In terms of civilians, the world government can't discern them. What they are interested in isn't the identities of those civilians but the potential of them having the knowledge regarding the Void Sentry and Poneglyphs. This means that if they manage to reach the other islands prior to the Buster Call, in this world where billions of people live, there is no way for the world government to discern the Overruns from the others. Thankfully, this wasn't the Grand Line, but West Blue. The average compass and average navigating methodology work here. I believe that making them get out to the sea will be enough to achieve my goal. However, I doubt that the people will believe words as abrupt as Marine, suddenly arriving to bombard the entire island into ruination. They will think that I'm a fraud, I said thoughtfully. The whole idea of warning them won't work. I can't use the method of knocking them out with my smoke either. My use of smoke will immediately give away my identity. Wadden. Saul scratched the back of his head, finding the situation bleak. I believe that in order to achieve this motive of driving them out of here, I need to play a pirate. Ones without strength are bound to feel fear upon encountering a potent hostile. Driven by instinct, they will leave this island using everything that they got. But in order for this to work, I must ask one thing, turning to Robin. I asked, are there ships that the people can use to sail out? Ships big enough for all civilians to board. Robin nodded immediately. Ahara is the hub of scholars. Although there is Den Den Mushi. The information that can be relayed from a far distance away is limited. Therefore, for the sake of exchanging knowledge, and for the sake of going on an expedition for research, it is necessary to have many ships ready at all times. The issue, however, Robin then pointed out acutely, lies on the fact that with so many people boarding the ship, its speed will be notably slow. It will take days for them to reach the neighboring islands. I nodded, having thought about such an idea already even better. If we were to assume that the other islands contain the marine bases, then these civilians, after reaching those islands, will report the piracy that affected the entire Ahara. 
If this happens prior to the start of the Buster Call, then the chance is, the world government will come to realize that the information of Buster Call was leaked out, and may change their strategy to something even worse. Ah, Saul, who didn't seem to understand my words, simply scratched the back of his head. On the other hand, Robin's mouth formed an O shape, finding my logic plausible. If the ship is slower, then the villagers will only get to tell those marines after the Buster Call happens, she muttered, before questioning again. But for this whole plan to work, the threat that you pose must be just as big. You at least have to be someone who is capable of destroying an entire town by yourself. In response, I pointed at myself with my thumb. And you got just the one over here. Saul supported my words, he can do it. Okay? Then, while holding her left arm and turning her head sideways, Robin asked gravely, You aren't going to make me board that ship of villagers, are you? You really dislike them. Huh? I remarked, sighing as I looked up. I said, the second half of the plan, involving the lives of the scholars, is going to be dangerous. However, I, at the same time, am afraid that something may happen to you while you sail with those villagers. Remaining here poses more risk. But at least you'll be in our sight. Nico, Olvia, and Robin. Their meat causes Robin to sprout out all details of how she's a full-fledged archaeologist. But save their interaction, if I can have Saul and Robin hide from the start to the end. Such that the world government and Marine don't even get a glimpse of them. I think I can make this work. I value your opinion, Robin. If you wish to stay, then stay. However, I, with seriousness, affirmed. I need you to promise me that you will act with maturity. Lives are at stake here. You already know me. Robin clenched her fists. I'm not going to whine like a baby. I want to help. All right? With that having been dealt with, I'll now explain the second phase of the plan. One mistake and all is over. I'm trying to balance things out on a sharp needle. I can only hope that the events will flow as I intend to. The only way for the scholars to live is to fool the world government that they died similar to how Saul's case went in the canon. Taking in a deep breath, I eased my mind, ordering my thoughts. I finally opened my mouth back up after a poor Saul. Your rank in the Marine was Vice Admiral. And if I believe one of the requirements to attain the rank of Vice Admiral is to be capable of using Haki, isn't it? Saul's eyes widened. Oh, so you knew, I see. The giant, whose inherent strength alone far surpasses that of an average human and also possesses the ability to utilize the armament Haki. I exclaimed before asking, tell me Saul, how deep can you dig in two days? Dig. Robin's eyes widened in realization as she looked at me. Don't tell me that you plan to create some sort of bunk. The Marine will bring 10 warships. They will fire all they got, but the supply is limited. It is impossible for them to completely erase this island. I claim with certitude. Since Vegapunk and Dragon visited the destroyed Ahara a few months after the incident, it is only the surface of the island that will be wrecked from the Buster Call. By digging deeply enough, escaping the impact of the Buster Call shouldn't be impossible. Dig, you say? Saul said while raising his huge right hand up. Then, the tip of his index finger was coated in pitch black, indicating the use of armament Haki. Hardening. Before he pressed that finger down on the ground, said finger effortlessly pushed into the ground as if poking through the water. I can probably dig real deep, Saul replied with a confident grin. Robin, who didn't seem satisfied with my plan, was about to retort. However, I spoke up without giving her the chance to speak. I know, the impact from the buster call will collapse the hole, crushing whoever's in there. I then searched my pocket before taking out the gun dispenser that I previously received from Gion, and therefore, we'll use this to stick the wood trunks and stones within the holes for the purpose of reinforcement. Do you believe that it's an impossible task? I don't, I looked at Saul, who looked back at me with determination in his eyes, for it definitely is possible. Still, Robin asked with sharp eyes, if your plan is to put all scholars in the hole and have them survive from the buster call, we might as well just send them away like how we'll do with the civilians. I shook my head, no, that won't do. The purpose of the Buster Call is to make an example out of these scholars, of what would happen if people were to disobey the laws set by the world government. They are specifically targeting scholars, and unless they come to believe that their targets died, they won't stop. The hole will be hidden. By the time the Buster Call starts, you two will be hiding in there. The scholars will remain up, receiving the full brunt of the Buster Call. I believe what Saul and Robin shouted at the same time, but I nonetheless continued, the cannons, fires, blasts they will produce one thing. Smoke. Smoke will arise, preventing the marine and world government from viewing what exactly is going on. During then, by using my ability, I said while morphing my right arm into grey smoke, I will pull those scholars into the hole. But Robin said warily, some will die, and it's impossible to save all of them. I answered coldly, although the buster call is an immoral violence. The scholars knew of the risks, yet still proceeded with their research of void century imponoglyphs. I commend their resolve, but whether they live or die ultimately depends on luck. And this was the full gist of my plan. Are they fine? Robin, who was standing in front of me right now, asked. After some time passed since our discussion, I was now out of my marine attire, and instead was putting on the clothes that Robin stole from her uncle's closet. The most important aspect to consider was the black cloth that covered the entirety of my head and face, except for my eyes, which Robin made by ripping the clothes of her aunt. As long as I'm not recognizable by anyone, it will suffice, I replied while stretching my body. Although an outward appearance can contribute to inflicting fear, we don't have time to care about that. 
We were currently standing in the forest before the town. Go back to Saul, Robin. You probably won't like what I'm about to do now. Robin, who reluctantly stood by after my words, eventually nodded, don't kill anyone, okay? I chuckled at that. Hey, I'm a marine, not a pirate. Don't forget that. Hopping down, I stared at the town's entrance. So here it is, the fruit to my long-lasted sleepless nights. I closed my eyes momentarily and thought, but don't forget myself. Back then, I promised myself that if I were given the second chance in life, I would live one that is worthy that I won't repeat the life of a scum. Feeling my heart beating rapidly, I opened my eyes back up in resolution, before raising my leg up, Rankyaku. Three days later silent and still, the large island of Ahara, which was filled with liveliness just three days ago, had none of such quality remaining. The buildings diced and destroyed, not even a single one was spared, and this signaled the ruination of the so-called daily lives of the Oharans. However, Naiko Olvia, who just arrived at this island, noted as she continued her run toward the huge tree of knowledge. And yet, I don't see any blood or corpse soul. Did you reach here before I did? Boom. Kicking the door that lied at the base of the Tree of Knowledge, Olvia momentarily disregarding the wreckage entered the place. And she has come to see the scholars who were injured and wrapped around the bandages. I thought one of them, whose eyes widened upon coming to sight Olvia, exclaimed, you were caught by the Marines, Olvia Olvia San. So that Marine ship we previously sighted, were you the one on it? Not paying attention to their words, Olvia asked with a mix of confusion and shock, what happened here? Then, Dr. Clover, the man whose beard and hair altogether resembled a clover, and had bandages wrapped around his entire body, answered gravely, a pirate raid. What? Everything that you've seen on the outside was the work of one enigmatic and bizarre pirate. He made a deal with us, that in exchange for the lives of the civilians, we are to hand over this island. The wreckage of the island is just the warning sign. Clover, closing his eyes, replied solemnly, within a week, he will be back with his crew. A pirate now, of all times. Clover, opening his eyes back, then asked Olvia, why are you here? Olvia, upon hearing Clover's question, calmed herself down. Deciding to temporarily forget the event that happened while she was away, she said sternly, did you read the newspaper? The team searching for the Pomoglyphs, which left this island six years ago. She bit on her lips, expressing frustration. Her fists tightened and shook, expressing anguish. As if trying to tone down the pain in her soul, she let out a breath before continuing. Has been obliterated all but myself. All 33 of them. I was captured too. Clover's eyes narrowed. Then, and after carefully examining a slaughtered comrade's belongings, the government managed to figure out that we are from Ahara. As the scholars listened silently, Olvia, unable to contain her emotion, let out tears. Covering up her face, she bawled. I don't even know how I can make any excuses anymore. This land is now in danger because of us. Stop that Clover yelled firmly, looking straight at Olvia. It's nobody's fault. Those who left for the sea and those who stayed here are all on the same team. You're the one who's had a hard time. Olvia raised her head up with sorrow. Doctor, from the beginning, the government has labeled this island, Ahara, as a threat. An island where scholars from all over the world have gathered and continued to study about the history. Clover then smiled gently, perhaps, this was bound to happen. One scholar noted, I bet that they think they've got us now. They won't miss this chance, yes. But we've got the info before it's too late. They'll eventually wipe out everyone who claims to be a scholar in Ahara Olvia, ridding herself of the negative emotion, shouted in restored urgency, so everyone hurry up and leave this land. However, even after her statement, the scholars didn't move. Instead, Clover stated, you're right. This time, it seems, we can no longer elude the eyes of our investigators, if the government is already planning to kill us. Olvia shouted, then hurry. But Olvia, I... Clover turned his back, staring at the massive reservoir of books. I cannot run away, abandoning all these treasures of mankind. You should have known that. The scholars all grinned, and one said firmly, same for us, Olvia. I've no idea what the government has in mind, but if we run away, we can't protect the precious history stored here. We'll just do our best this time, too. Olvia looked at them with sadness, everyone Clover, then let out a chuckle, and how ironic, for that pirate's attack to lead to the escape of the civilians lowering his head, he said firmly, no one died three days ago. Robin too evacuated along with others, placing his hand on his chin, Clover reminisced with a smile, and speaking of that incomparable genius, she is a lot like you when you were a child, no need to speak of her. As long as she's safe, Olvia said softly, then that's enough for me. Once I've stepped onto this path, I am a stranger to her, I cannot make her the daughter of a criminal. Boom. Then, the door broke open again, by another scholar who entered the room with a panicked expression. As everyone turned at the man, he shouted, Dr. Clover, there's a ship with the world government flag on at this time. Clover answered calmly, for the government's ship to come all the way to West Blue indeed. This is a very serious situation, Olvia, who immediately took out the rifle from her back, shouted grimly, everyone, listen, you're neither my friends nor my acquaintances. 
Please remember that without hesitation, she began to run outside. Olvia, wait, what are you doing? Clover shouted, but Olvia ignored his shout and continued her charge. At the shore of Ahara, one huge ship arrived. On its body, the word world government was engraved. From within, many men wearing black suits stormed out, fully armed. In the middle, three men, who seemed to be the executives of this operation, casually walked out of the ship. Hey, notify headquarters, we're here. One in the middle, the man who went by the name Spandine, bickered, ha so troublesome. I wonder if this'll get me promoted or something. They were the Cifopoles, the secret agents who work for the interests of the world government. The official units are divided into ranks all the way from CP1 to CP8, with a higher number granting higher authority. Then there were two unofficial units, CP9 and CP0. Spandine was a member of CP9, and the one in charge of the current investigation at Ahara. One on Spandine's right commanded take anybody referred to as a scholar into custody before stopping in midst of his order, as, W what is this? They came to sight the devastating ruination in front of them. The trees covered the view when we were on the sea. It seems the one on Spandine's left said while adjusting his glasses. Spandine, who had a cold sweat running down his side, exclaimed with astonishment, Oi, oi, you're kidding me right? In front of him lied a pirate flag that was embedded. The black flag had a Jolly Roger skull that was grinning at him. Sir, one agent then stopped in front of him and reported strictly, there is no sign of life in this town. It seems that a pirate invasion recently occurred. But we are unable to confirm if the casualty arose. ECH Spandine, snatching the pirate flag by its wooden pole and slamming it on the ground, growled. Damn it, don't tell me that even the scholars got away. How can this so? Spandine then raised an eyebrow as he sighted many scholars tied by a rope being dragged out from the tree of knowledge. Gone was the anger, and now, with his face slowly forming a grin, Spandine walked toward the tied up scholars, never mind, I suppose dash. Somewhere in West Blue, nearby Ahara Vice Admiral Kuzan, Captain Happy who was seen to be standing atop the deck of the warship under Kuzan's command, saluted at Kuzan, who was found lying on his lounge chair. Kuzan groaned in annoyance, what is it? Chief Spandine of CP9 has arrived at Ahara. Who's that? Kuzan's face wrinkled up in a frown. Did you have to wake me up just to tell me that, asshole? Happy immediately took a step back in nervousness while sweating profusely. I, I'm terribly sorry, sir. Joan, who was leaning by the rail, was looking down at the water with a darkened expression. Smoker, where have you gone to? You aren't dead, are you? However, their ship wasn't alone. With them were nine other warships where four more vice admirals and the divisions under their command were situated. Looking at Kuzan's antics with amusement, Bayard, one of the five vice admirals, commented, Why, you seem to have changed vice admiral Kuzan. Kuzan didn't even bother to respond, but continued his slumber. Don't bother. As long as he fulfills his duty, what's there to complain of? On another ship, the other one, who was seen with slick back light hair, sunglasses on his eyes, and a black suit underneath his justice coat Vice Admiral Tensei, said stoically, let him be. Haha, I suppose Bayard laughed before turning his head to his right, and I believe that it's been a long time since I've seen you. Said man was wearing a dark colored fedora hat similar to the one that Bogard wears, coupled with blue shirt and brown pants underneath his justice coat. He went by the name Tokakik, and has only recently been promoted to the rank of Vice Admiral. Uerp Hang, on, Bayard San. I, I ate too much, Tokakik said with a pale face, with his body hanging by the rail. I think I'm up gonna throw up. You surely haven't changed since the last time I saw you. And on one warship that lied at the right end of ten warships that lined up, there stood one silent man. His appearance was covered by a white cloak he wore underneath the justice coat, but it wasn't enough to cover his chiseled body. With his arms crossed, he firmly stood without engaging himself in a conversation. His eyes were focused on the horizon in front of them the direction in which Ahara lied. Vice Admiral Sakazuki, who also went by the codename Akainu. No one in here would doubt that he was the strongest among them. And Kuzan, who opened his eyes behind his sunglasses, looked warily at Sakazuki. Then, moving his gaze at the horizon which Sakazuki was glaring at, Kuzan couldn't help but think, where have you gone off to? Smoker, Jaya Spandine, who fell on his back, screamed in terror. You shot me on through. It's all over for me, damn it. Please tell the higher-ups to give my son my seat as chief. At some distance away from Spandine, there stood Nico Olvia who was holding onto the rifle with its smoking barrel pointed at the fallen Spandine. The one on his right facipum chief. Please look carefully. It merely pierced your coat sleeve. Oh. Spandine sat up with his eyes on the hole in his coat. You're right. Olvia muttered, my next shot won't miss click. Olvia then realized that she was surrounded by many Cifopole agents who were pointing their firearms at her. Since when? Laughing in mockery, Spandine stated, Muhahaha. The one who compounded her crimes by breaking out of the marine prison, just so happened to come to this island Nyko Olvia. The woman who continued to deny any relation to the scholars of Ahara. And yet she came here of all places, almost as if she were asserting that it was her hometown. Additionally, our investigation on your team has confirmed that you too, committed the same crime as this place as scholars Spandine stroke his beard in an exaggerated manner. And what a striking similarity Olvia glared at Spandine, 
Just because I'm here doesn't mean you'll be able to prove something. And it doesn't matter just when Spendine stated impassively, a Den Den Mushi that the man with glasses on his left was holding, rang. Oh. Spandine turned to the Den Den Mushi with a grin, and here's the call. Behind Spandine and his two executive members, there were archaeologists all tied up and bound. They were sitting on the ground, gazing with still faces as Olvia was being apprehended by the Cipherpol agents. As the man with glasses lifted up the dial and accepted the call, a voice spoke out. Yep, yeah, speak, the man with glasses stated. Olvia's eyes widened. She thrashed, but to no avail. The scholar's head simply lowered, accepting their fate. As the call was cut, Muhahaha. Spandine laughed while standing back up. Well now, Oran scholars, we have officially made the decision for your execution. Then, forcibly morphing his face to a feigned sadness, Spandine shook his head. Look, this is just my job. You conducted your research to awaken the powerful weapons. You wanted to kill many people. How sad it is to lose the greatest scholars of the world. Clover, who was sitting in silence, then spoke up. The government's afraid, but not of the weapons. Huh? Spandine raised his eyebrow as Clover continued. Before my death, let me speak with the heads of the world, the Gorosei. Clover looked at Spandine without an ounce of fear. For a long time now, Ahara, the holy land of archaeology, has continued its research. The dream is only halfway there, but I have created a hypothesis about the 100 years of blank pages which I wish to report. Deep down in the island of Ahara, there lied one moderate-sized hole. Due to the small size entry from the surface, and the fact that there lie the patches of grass right above it, the agents failed to notice it with the brief search of theirs. Reinforced with wooden stone, coupled with many clothes and blankets, Saul, Robin, and I the ones who were hiding in this dark place, managed ourselves warm without the help of fire. Here they are here. And Robin, whose arms were crossed to use her fruit ability, muttered with anxiety behind her tone. It's just as you said. I can't see what's exactly happening because of the plants, but... People wearing the black suits. They are here. Cipherpol agents I thought as I stood up from the wall that I was leaning on. It's the time. Turning at Robin and Saul. I stated firmly. Wait here and be ready to receive the ones I'll be dropping from the top. I'll use my fruit ability to move without getting noticed however. I was then forced to stop. By a huge hand. That blocked my way to the exit. Saul. My eyes narrowed. What are you doing? Saul, although I couldn't see his expression well in the darkness, shook his head negatively. Unwilling to remove his hand, he instead said. I can't let you go up there, smoker. Soul. Robin mumbled in confusion. I saw close his eyes tight and bit his lips. His body trembled as if making a hard decision. However, his hand relentlessly blocked my way. I made a promise. Clover, with his eyes closed, reflected upon the conversation that he secretly had with Saul two days ago. Clover knew that his time has arrived. Tied up and on his knees, bruised and injured from the hits by the Cipherpole agents. Olvia was struggling to her end, but him, along with the scholars by his side, remained silent. Clover smiled with his eyes shaded. Oh, how glad Clover was that although things turned out to be this way, he will be able to pass away without much guilt in his heart. Along with a pleasant feeling that a weight was lifted up on his back, Clover thought for the final time. Thank you for saving us, Smoker. And now, he could fully commit himself to the final battle in his life. Yeah, it's a crime punishable by death. We found enough evidence to support that. Give us your orders. Spandine, who was holding onto a dial connected to the Den Den Mushi, said seriously. Clover, raising his head up, stated without a hint of fear. I can see right through your pretentious speech, Gorosei. Spandine immediately barked at Clover. Bastard, you're talking to the leaders of the world here. Den Den Mushi which held a calm expression on its face, spoke, Clover refuted, everything I've done in the past has been for humanity. There is no one who has the right to stop me. If you read the Poneglyphs, the revival of ancient weapons will bring about a crisis for the world. Even if you bear no ill will, there may be others who intend to use them in such a fashion. No matter what lies in the past, humans create history, and thus they must accept everything. If we come to know things without feeling fear, we will be able to create some form of countermeasure. Clover spoke powerfully, the ancient weapons are carefully hidden, hidden in a way that a select few may already know where they lie and how to access them. If we remain blind, we are rendering ourselves susceptible to them, and the day on which they surface will be the day of calamity. We must be ready. But nowadays, Clover, narrowing his eyes at the Den Den Mushi, exclaimed, due to such behaviors of you, the world government, we've become more curious of the truth regarding the Poneglyph's reason for existence rather than their contents. In the past, why would people carve texts on mineral laws? Perhaps they wished to convey something to the future. They probably couldn't leave behind paper or books, because they may have thought that their message would get destroyed. Clover claimed with certainty, and not the words, there is clear evidence the people that left behind the stones had an enemy. The Den Den Mushi stared at Clover grimly. If we assume that these people were destroyed by their enemy, then their enemy would continue to live on. Coincidentally, 800 years ago, right after the Void Century, 
the world government was born, the Den Den Mushi's eyes slightly widened. It seemed that the recipient of the call in the Mary G eyes couldn't conceal his emotion to a complete degree, which told Clover that his theory was heading in the right direction. If the destroyed people's enemy had become the world government, then I believe that the void century was erased by the world government's hands as inconvenient history. The information on the Poneglyph revealed the existence of a single country. It was depicted as a great civilization as well as a kingdom of great power. However, any information about this country has been thoroughly erased, and having predicted this outcome, they entrusted the knowledge to the future by carving stones which we now call Poneglyphs. That's an audacious hypothesis, Clover. The ancient weapons truly are a threat to the world. However, the greater threat to the government would be revealing the history ideas, and even the existence of that country. And why would that be the case? Why would the information of the Long Lost Kingdom be more dangerous than the presence of the ancient weapons? Clover spoke with a genuine passion. He didn't look like a man facing death as his eyes gleamed with enthusiasm. With his fists clenched tight, he then spoke, I've been speculating that perhaps, the world government already is in possession of those ancient weapons. And although I'm unable to fully explain that threat, we've come to learn that the name of that country was here. I suppose that this is it. Bang. From the barrel of a pistol in Spandine's hold, a bullet was fired. It penetrated right through Clover's skull. And Clover, without finishing his statement, thud, fell, with his eyes hollowed out. He professor, the scholars screamed. Olvia, with widened eyes, gazed at the fallen Clover, whose blood was oozing out and smearing the nearby ground. Who is in the right, and who is in the wrong? The threats behind the ancient weapons, the existence of the great kingdom from the void century, and setting examples in order to prevent the further leakage of the past knows too much. Ash was at the scholar's fault for seeking to know the truth. Was it the world government's fault for restricting the knowledge? In the end, what exactly is justice? Oh, ah. Uh. Olvia finally slumped down, losing her will to fight back. She knew that after a year-long run, Hysh days as a prisoner and desperately reaching this island as the last resort everything was over. Robin Olvia, in the end, let out a hollow smile. I'm sorry for being such a horrible mother. I hope that you will lead a life filled with joy. Spandine grinned while taking out a smaller, golden-colored Den Den Mushy from his chest pocket, our ride IT's Buster Call time. Then, he pressed the button, a request for Buster Call. One Marine soldier exclaimed as the silver Den Den Mushy, the receiver for the signal sent by the golden Den Den Mushy, screeched loudly. All ships, Sakazuki's voice then boomed out all across the warships, arrange and prepare for bombardment, yes sir. The ten warships sailed to the front rapidly traveling to Ahara which was now visible to them. As the world government agents hurriedly returned back to their ships, boom. The warship which Sakazuki stood on top of, then shot forth a cannonball at the Tree of Knowledge, setting it on a fire. Boom. Then, another shot was blasted from the warship under the command of Bayard, who grinned with his eyes locked on the island. Boom. The cannonball from Tensei's warship hit the village that already was in ruination. Boom. Tokakik chuckled as he saw the sight in front of him. Now, the entire island was on fire. Kuzum watched, the island being reduced to ashes. The ruthless destruction he, silently watched the cleansing flame ahead of him. However, no one managed to see, that behind those sunglasses of his, there were eyes colder than any other losing the final hope he had for the world government. Absolute justice drives people insane. Boom. A cannonball was shot from the very warship that Kuzan was in charge of. Unable to bear the sight any longer, Kuzan changed his position, facing away from the scene. Boom. 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 The faint noises of explosions reached all the way down here. With Saul's hand blocking the path, and his level of strength far surpassing mine, I knew that I was unable to get through. Boom. Dr. Clover only Robin's weeping could be heard in the darkness, along with the explosion noises everyone observation harky huh i muttered while dazing off surrounded by the darkness i couldn't bother to think in the end i've done everything that i could have done and yet failed simply because i was weak boom this is what i said back then i was ready to disregard their lives if the situation seemed unfit however although it was such a short time I came to experience that they were nice people. Though they bear responsibility for researching the forbidden knowledge, I could tell that they were kind and genuine the likable bunch who love parties just as much as the others, the ones who possess no strength, but still stood up for their ideals. Boom. I lifted my hand up, though I couldn't really see properly due to the darkness. I nonetheless gazed at it. The justice, ideal, righteousness, goal, whatever they may be, they are only allowed to be spoken from the mouth of the strong. In the end, I was being foolish. Just as how I thought at the very beginning, my involvement in the end seemed to be nothing but a fly's pointless struggle. Boom. What a sight. I commented as I looked up at the sky, filled with dark smoke. What a devastating scene it was. The island, having been charred and destroyed to a great degree, was reduced to a useless pile of land. No trees, no plants, no vegetation whatsoever. However, I could see the burnt limbs and body parts of the dead, 
here and there. Careful, Saul, whose face held nothing but guilt, muttered, some area isn't safe to step on top of. The two of us looked ahead of us, where Robin was seen to be standing, with her back facing us. She didn't speak, but simply watched around her in silence, of what her home has become. What now? The pirate invasion that supposedly happened prior to the destined buster call. Soon, the Overins will notify the marine branch that they reach, and the higher-ups will come to realize that someone, perhaps a marine or world government-related individual, tried to prevent the buster call from happening. Additionally, since the civilians knew Robin's appearance, Appearance. Their accidental or non-accidental slip may lead to devastating consequences. Too many risks for such a low return. Feeling as if the depression was getting to me, I took a deep breath and cleared my mind. But wake up, smoker. I don't have the luxury to whine. The lesson that I've learned from this incident won't go to waste. Higher rank. Those who are willing to back me up. I don't necessarily wish to change the marine from inside out or whatsoever, but I should at least have the strength not to conform. What about becoming a pirate, you ask? If that were to happen, Gup Sensei will kill me himself. Then, Professor Clover, everyone is dead, right? Robin, who was standing in front of us, mumbled in a teary tone, My home Ahara is gone from the map. Her small body trembled. Saul on my right seemed restless, wishing to comfort the child, yet not knowing if he had the right to do so. And I know, before this buster call happened, you two you guys were enemies. Saul betrayed Marine and sailed all the way here, and you, Smoker, were chasing after him. My eyes widened as she stated, was she not asleep during that night when I spoke with Saul? Just tell me this, Smoker, Robin, turning around to face me, asked as the tears flowed out of her eyes, was my mom here? What a hard question it was to answer. This pang of guilt I wished I could simply turn around and evade the answer. However, she deserved the truth. No matter how she may think of me, or how powerless I may be portrayed as, I couldn't afford to lie. Therefore, as Saul turned his head around, I replied grimly, yes. Death, it isn't a simple thing. When people die, the blood splatters, bones break, muscle fibers tear apart, and intestines spill out and above all, that horrifying and disgusting stench that cannot be explained. When you imagine your loved one being in such a situation, will you be able to maintain your calm? Definitely not. I could understand what Robin must be going through. I understood her rage for this world. And as her head was lowered with her face invisible to me, and as the teardrops continued to drip down, I asked, do you hate me Robin? I initially said that I will reduce the casualty as much as possible. I explained my plan with baseless confidence, and though I managed to save those that she disliked, I let her loves ones die. Overall, I concluded that Robin, she hated me, my full name is Nyko Robin. I am an 8 year old girl, as well as a certified scholar who not only possesses profound knowledge in the field of archaeology, but also the ability to interpret poneglyphs. I believe what? Saul seemed terrified of what he just heard. His eyes widened, and his jaw gaped wide. He took a step back unconsciously, before falling on his butt. Robin, with her head lowered, continued, and I knew that this was forbidden. This is probably why my family was killed. By that logic, I should be dead as well. Raising her head up, Robin forced a smile as she stared at Saul and me. So I don't hate you. No, I am thankful. You knew that this was going to happen, and tried your best to prevent it from happening. You risked everything for our sake. Her words of thanks, for a reason unknown, brought pain to my heart. And I know that based on the fact that the civilians recognize me, I will have to disguise. My name will have to change. Unless I wish to be killed, my true identity will have to remain hidden forever. But still, then, something unexpected happened. Robin's eyes gained a fire within, her will was rising up within her. Instead of falling into despair, she stood back up, with a set goal in her mind. The world government. I want to destroy them. And from her mouth, a bold sentence was spoken. It was a goal that can't be treated lightly. And why, you got the same goal as me. It was a goal that I too set after witnessing this incident. And I will join the Marine to do that. Robin staring at me with a firm gaze, stated, So take me with you, Smoker. Saul looked at the two of us with his eyes shaking. Sweating profusely, he seemed to be contemplating if he should stop Robin or not. His right hand was being lifted up. However, he eventually lowered it back, still filled with guilt, and thinking that he has no right to stop her. Staring back at her, I said, you will be under high risk at all times. Fine by me. There is the better option of following Saul to Elbif. Not interested. Your mother would have wanted you to stay away from the harm. Robin momentarily stopped. Then, biting her lips and furiously wiping the tears off of her eyes, she growled, and she's dead. Now, standing in front of me, she grabbed me by the collar and brought me right in front of her face. So, am I in, Lieutenant Smoker? The change from the cannon I thought as I stared into her, instead of the life under the run, life as a marine. Huh? Everything was jumbled up, and I truthfully don't know if this was a good change. However, I nonetheless stated, you're in. On top of a deck of the marine warship, which was returning back to the marine base G1, June seemed worried, walking back and forth. He's still not found, and the other marines are found dead, scattered across a variety of islands. Jaguar, the soul isn't yet found either, turning to Kuzan, who was lying on a lounge chair with his back facing her. June spoke up sir. What Kuzan said with an underlying annoyance. Smoker he isn't dead, is he? From Kuzan's point of view, June was truly worried. And truthfully, it felt strange to him that someone like June, 
who harbors the ideal of absolute justice, simultaneously possesses the kind and caring side. She was taught in the way of the absolute justice from the very beginning. The absolute justice. It runs deep in the Marine. Marine, from the very start, was established to be the puppet for the world government Kuzan came to think. ECH Kuzan turned his head and frowned at Joan. Fucking interrupting my sleep for a stupid question like that? Do you think that lowly of smoker? In response to Kuzan's bicker, Joan made a smile of relief, so he's alive and well. Right. Turning his head back and laying it down, Kuzan yelled, Think whatever the hell you want, thank you sir. Jion saluted at Kuzan who didn't bother causing some other marine soldiers to sweat drop. And from the back, Captain Happy was seen to be standing with his hands on his back. He was smiling, with his eyes locked onto Kuzan. Eventually, he turned around, while whispering to himself, He's given up, it will be fine to give him the codename now. Say that again. In the Marineford Tower at the topmost floor, there lies Fleet Admiral Sengoku's office. Although his table was filled with headache-inducing papers from all around the world, he currently was occupied with the call. Sengoku, with his eyes narrowed in suspicion, asked the pirate invasion. From those who claim to have come from Ahara, you say, All right? Ending the call by placing the dial back to the Den Den Mushi. Sengoku placed his hand on his forehead. The leakage of the information without a doubt. However, no matter how I look at it, there is no way that the leakage could have been from our side. All five Vice Admirals were selected after a careful inspection. Vice Admiral Kuzan was the biggest issue. However, the report stated that he was on his ship, sleeping through the entire progress. The ones who previously chased after Saul. Evidence was found that the very ship that the Marines used to chase, sank within the storm. The only one who might have stayed alive is Lieutenant Smoker. But knowing that he was none other than Garp's lone and favored disciple, as well as the report stating that he's never visited the West Blue before, the chance of his involvement in this matter was practically non-existent. A reinforcement to the West Blue, to monitor those civilians from Ahara. However, muttering to himself, Sengoku flipped through a few papers, before stopping at one, this island will have to be an exception. On that paper was the report regarding one island. There was a picture that showed the devastating scene, where the dead corpses were walking around what seemed to be a hollow town. To think Gekko Moria survived after his loss against Kaidu. Sengoku clicked his tongue, how unfortunate scum like him is better dead than alive. Below the picture lied a bounty poster, where the wanted man had red hair and pale blue skin. It read, Nightmare Gekko Moria, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 320 million Beely. This is where we part, it seems. Saul, who looked at the two of us with worry-filled eyes, said, I suppose so. I nodded in a stern manner, before pointing my thumb to the back, and those books yeah, don't worry about those. Saul forced a grin, the Rashishishi. I'll return with Ma team to get those books, they are da last wish of Robin's family. Robin bowed her head at Saul. Thank you. Saul quickly shook his head with his hands up, no no, don't say that. I don't deserve yeah danks. I failed as a Marine, and this happened because of me. The fact that he was the one who caught Olvia and her colleagues, and acquired the information regarding the Ahara, was still haunting him to this day. Saul was too kind for his good, having revealed all this information to Robin. I Robin, raising her body back up, said stoically, it's fine. Things were out of control. It was yet another change from the canon Robin not thinking Saul as close as she did in the Anime. Saul, knowing that it was the time to go, slowly turned his body around. While doing so, he looked at me for the final time. Smoker? I looked at him upon his call, and Saul then smiled. When you're half time in dar future, pay a visit to Elbeth with Robin. I will be waiting dear for you too. And with that, the incident at Ahara has come to an end. Judging by the estimated location of the ocean where the ship that I was on top of during my pursuit after Saul sank, me ending up stranded on the island of Vito, would make sense. Around 30 minutes have passed since Saul's departure by swimming. Now left among ourselves, Robin and I stood at the burnt shore of what used to be Ahara, looking into the map of West Blue. And since this island is far away from here, Ahara, I think I can fabricate a believable alibi. Due to the storm, I was sent flying in a random direction, miraculously survived, and landed in Vito. I was hurt and unconscious, and a girl named a Roby, an orphan who wishes to become a Marine, healed me. Upon regaining consciousness, I immediately looked for a way to communicate, and eventually managed to report my survival. How does that sound? Robin, who listened to my suggestion, replied in a monotone, It's rough at best, and there are many variables that you overlooked. But in this situation, a plan can come later. We have to get out as soon as possible, in order to avoid any risk of being sighted. Then, Robin placed a compass on top of the map, and rotated the map, and the rough direction to veto, based on this map, should be that way. Question is, through what method will we travel? Through smoke, of course. In response to Robin's inquiry, I opened my hand such that my palm was facing up, and generated a swirling mini tornado of white smoke on top of it. As the swirl progressively became more dense and intense, and enlarged at every second, I then threw it right in front of the two of us. Said mini tornado of smoke upon leaving my palm, suddenly morphed into a cloud-like shape, before sitting on top of the burnt shore. We'll travel above the clouds using this. That way, we would be able to evade being sighted by anyone throughout the entire travel. Robin asked with weariness written on her face. 
but for how long can you maintain this flying nimbus? I shrugged, days. Robin looked at me in disbelief, days. Immediately after, she crossed her arms at the next moment and bloomed several hands around her. I don't believe you. And she only lasted for a minute or so, not being able to maintain her ability intact for a long span of time. I can't even keep my hands up for 10 minutes. And you say that you can last for days. The extent of one's fruit ability is proportional to one's physical prowess. It's natural that I, who's been undergoing a training routine for quite some time, am more proficient in this aspect than you, an eight-year-old. I explained while taking a seat on top of the prepared smoke made flying nimbus. Huh. That's new. Robin muttered in deep thought and eventually accepted my answer with a nod. And according to Kaidu in the canon, the fruit awakening occurs when one's body and mind fully catch up with his or her fruit. Robin, I looked at her expectedly. Just as you said, the sooner we leave this place, the better. Yes, indeed. Nodding once more, Robin took a step forward. However, she then stopped as if feeling attachment to this ruination. Without any word, Robin turned around and gave a final look at the ruined island, which used to be her home for her entire life up until now. She, being a child who hasn't left the island even once, was now about to begin another chapter of her life. I couldn't see what expression she held as she watched the devastating scenery. But there was no need for me to do so to know that she was currently enraged. The devil of Ahara, huh? I found this situation ironic. In canon, she was branded as the devil child, and lived the life of the prey. However, here, she strives to become the devil of her enemies, the predator who mercilessly slays her targets. Just like me, who has determined to differ from the original smoker. Though the man's sense of kindness is praiseworthy, such as a useless quality without strength. This incident will forever be engraved in my memory. However, I will use this experience as the soil for my growth, and I promise I will become the strongest strong enough to break free from these chains around me. And now, Robin turned back, looking calmer than ever. Walking over, she casually sat right in front of me and tapped my leg, I'm ready. Add sir at the end, chore boy Arobi. However, Robin sat still without any further words. Eventually, I sighed, how rebellious, before we've begun a flight. February 17th, 1502, Caribberry, New world within the island of Caribberry, filled with numerous palm trees and mountains, hundreds of pirates were found. None of them seemed to be well, with them having sustained heavy injuries to the extent that they were no longer able to fight. And in the middle of the group, there sat one man wearing a captain's hat. He, while out of breath, turned his hazy eyes at his front where the marines were swarming their way in. Tap. And in front of them all, one seemingly old-aged female marine officer was found walking in an elegant manner. The usually warm and gentle environment of Caribberry, at this moment, was filled with nothing but sharp coldness. Her presence alone was enough to drive the pirates into fear. Strange, the pirate captain, who wiped the blood off of his mouth, muttered, I thought you've gone elsewhere, Admiral Ginkiji. The gray-haired woman narrowed her eyes. As the marines now completely surrounded the fallen horde of pirates, she stated coldly, You underestimated me, Martini Hook. Leaning closer to the fallen pirate captain, who goes by the name Hook Admiral Ginkiji, or Anastasia, placed her right hand right in front of the man's exposed neck. Subsequently, said hand morphed into terrifying blades of iron, ready to sever the flesh and bones at any moment. Strange, isn't it? For the higher-ups to order an admiral to capture the pirate whose bounty amounts to a mere 439 million BLE, and for such pirate to escape my pursuit for an entire month it's as if he knew where I would be heading every single damn time. Hook gulped as he felt the cold sensation of iron against his neck. Disregarding the nervous man, the admiral continued, I came to determine that you aren't a mere pirate. There is a certain connection either someone within the ranks of marine betrayed, or you successfully implemented a spy. Therefore, by speaking the false information regarding my destination to the headquarter, here I am, finally seeing you face to face. Anastasia then leaned in further, such that her lips was now right next to Hook's left ear. So you will tell me who's the one. Fuck. Hook, whose breath quickened and the sweats poured out of his trembling body, cursed. The nervousness overwhelmed him, and as the iron blades on his neck began to pave their way in, drawing blood from Hook's neck, he finally lost himself. Ha 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 Spike, you ask her, as if I am capable of doing that. Anastasia, confused by the man's words, said stoically, then elaborado, please, that information is off limit for you, Admiral Anastasia. Then, a new voice suddenly entered. Anastasia swiftly turned her head to the direction in which the voice was coming from, and found the orange-haired man, casually walking with his hands in his pockets and just his coat around his shoulder all alone. Ha! Huh. One marine soldier, who was tying a pirate with a rope in his hands, froze upon sighting the man, a Admiral Cedar Heavy. The others too looked at the orange-haired Admiral in shock. At this moment, they couldn't afford to process any thought but simply wonder of what such man was doing here, at this time. Anastasia, turning her head back at Hook, whose gaze was headed at Blaze with a sense of familiarity, remarked in a low tone, of all possibilities, to think that the Admiral himself is involved in a lowly matter like this. Since when did you betray the Marine? Ah, uh, you're thinking it wrong here. Blaze, smiling casually, said as he continued his steps toward Anastasia and Hook, I didn't betray anyone, and I still am a Marine. If I were to comment, it is you, Admiral Anastasia, who betrayed us, by distrusting your colleagues and speaking false information. Anastasia, without any hesitation, clenched her hand with the intention to sever Hook's neck. However, before she could do so, 
Hook suddenly sank into the ground, causing her grip to miss. Looking down, she saw a huge zipper that was gaping open on the ground, with there lying nothing but darkness beyond. Who are you? Glaring at the orange head admiral, Anastasia growled. Reflecting her attentiveness, her skin began to turn metallic gray. In response, Blaze reached his hand into the inner pocket of the justice coat and took out a mask that depicted a smiling clown. Then, placing it over his face, he said as he now stood right in front of Anastasia. Why? That's a nice question to ask. The marines, who were feeling the sudden rise in the intensity of the atmosphere, watched with a mix of confusion and horror as Blaze bowed in a gentleman-like manner. As you know, I am Admiral Blaze of the Marine, who goes by the codename of Cedar Heavy. However, at the same time I am also known as the Rib Tickling Clown Piero the chief of the Cipherpole Ages Zero. Then, fixating his posture straight back up in an exaggerated manner, he clapped his hands twice. Zip. The zipper on the ground then expelled Hook out such that he was sent flying in high up, before spontaneously closing and disappearing from existence. Then, with a thud, Hook fell right on Blaze's left. Hook, surprised that he was still alive, huffed and puffed his breaths out as he hollowly gazed at Anastasia ahead of them. And unfortunately, I cannot afford to have you kill my fellow Martini. After all, he will be required for the upcoming plan by the world government. Without replying to Blaze, Anastasia raised her right hand up, which began to morph into a gigantic yet sharp blade. While doing so, she commanded firmly, All Marines, leave the pirates and retreat immediately. The man in front of us is not an ally but an enemy. A clash will be inevitable. Nope, and that can't happen either. Blaze pointed his right index in a particular direction covered by trees. I apologize for resorting to this, but your underlings know too much. Today, within the island of Caribbean, all of you will be facing death by the Martini Pirates, so, what a sad news to hear then, Toby Shigen, Ryotachi. An incredible wave of energy was blasted off of Blaze's finger, which flew into the dark forest ahead of the Marines, before boom. A distant noise of the explosion was heard in everyone's ears. Our ship s shit and the Marines immediately realized that the noise was the indication that their ship was destroyed by a single technique of Blaze. Simultaneously, clang. Blaze was seen to be blocking a huge blade of the gray-haired Admiral with his armament harky coated left arm. EP0 or not, laying a hand on my soldiers or my ship is unacceptable. Then, as Anastasia's iron blade suddenly morphed in a bizarre manner, attempting to encase Blaze's arm that was in contact with, she declared, furthermore, by no means is allying with criminals acceptable to Marine. The one who will be facing death today is you, traitor. However, before the iron could crush the man's arm, the arm itself suddenly became flat and easily slivered its way out of the iron mass. Truthfully speaking, I doubt it. With his facial appearance hidden by the mask of a smiling clown, Blaze said impassively, boom. Before his fist met Anastasia's iron mass, thus marking the start of the battle between two powerhouses. Three days later, February 14th, 1502 at every hour during our travel above the clouds, we ensured to check that we were going in the right direction through the use of compass and map in our possession. Though Robin seemed nervous of the fact that we didn't have a plan B to prepare for what ifs thankfully, we managed to sight the distant island that seemed to harbor a huge city. Phew. At least the first step hasn't gone wrong. Robin, who seemed notably relieved by the sight of the land, let out a relaxed sigh. Then, she turned her head back to face me and inquired, and now, how should we sneak into the island? such that no one notices our entry. After all, we have to fool everyone that I've been living in that island for the entirety of my life. I place my hand underneath my chin in a thoughtful manner, start off by observing the island as a whole, and look for an ideal spot where no one is present. Especially since this is a very large island, there should be few spots like this. Robin, in response, pointed her finger at the seemingly remote forest, which covered the western side of the island, done. Gazing at the forest that Robin pointed out, I roughly estimated the distance from our current location up high in the sky. I think it's manageable. Robin tilted her head, what do you mean manageable? Without giving her a proper explanation, I grabbed her tightly by the waist as the nimbus under the two of us dissipated upon my will. Huh. As Robin let out a confused remark, I said, don't scream. Just when I said so, Robin seemed to have realized what I was about to do. Strangely, in contrast to how a child would usually react, she seemed elated for some reason. Nonetheless, ignoring her bizarre demeanor, swoosh. I kicked my feet against the air multiple times, by combining Geppo with Soru. Coupled with the huge surge of smoke that I generated at the soles of my feet to produce even more boost in speed, the two of us traveled in a blur, to a speed that most won't be able to sight. And right before we hit the ground path, I immediately generated a dense layer of smoke right underneath the two of us, cushioning the impact of the fall. How thrilling. It's the first time that I experienced a fall like this. And as Robin placed her hands onto her cheeks and shook her head with a blush, now setting her feet on solid ground for once in three days, I quickly inspected our surroundings. Trees, trees, and more trees. No presence of another human being in here, did we successfully enter unnoticed. And just when I made such a thought, over there, I think I saw something I heard the shout from afar, causing me to sweat drop. I jinxed us, didn't I? Holding Robin by the waist and quickly blowing dense smoke to clear the footprints. 
I nimbly jumped onto a tall tree nearby, and hid ourselves from the eyes of the islanders. Now, with Robin and me crouching on top of one tree branch side to side, 12 people made their entrance. All of them shared one common characteristic, wearing a black suit as an attire. Based on this, I couldn't help but think with caution, Sifapol. I wonder what would have happened if you made a miss just before would we have been squashed into the ground like an ant when it stepped on. In contrast to my growing nervousness, Robin seemed oddly happy, whispering weird stuff into my ear. Ignoring her, I set my focus below us. The mysterious group of men lazily looked around the forest with rifles in their hands. Their faces held nothing but a frown as they did so, as if having expected to sight no one from the start. Freaking Antonello I told you. He never speaks the truth in the end, one shouted angrily while slamming his weapon down. Calm down, Luca. It may be different this time around. Another man, who carefully looked around, stated as calmly as possible though his demeanor told me that he too was currently furious. Hey, Sergio, look. Then, another man called, earning the attention of the other eleven. He was seen to be aiming his gun at random tree bark, and as the other's eyes fell on him, he crazily shot down the bark all of a sudden. Then, he yelled, this is Antonello, yet another one side, come on, man, just because that wimpy guy is the nephew of the boss, we have to endure all this. We aren't lapdogs, I didn't come here to become a lapdog, I came here to be an actual mafioso. Listening to their conversations from the above, I felt relieved. They were mafia, and not Sifapol's how thankful. The twelve mafias stayed within the area for some time, lazily observing the details around them. Eventually, they left with the ex expectation that nothing will be found blinding their eyes. They are gone. Robin whispered at me, to which I snickered. Just because you said that, they're going to come back. Robin raised her eyebrow at me. I shrugged in response. Do you wish to bet? Robin looked at me strangely, seemingly reluctant by my confidence. Eventually, she opened her mouth to answer. But right when she was about to do so, useless fuck as she flinched from a sudden shriek that boomed forth. From the direction in which the twelve mafias left, one thin-looking guy furiously walked into the scene, with the previous twelve following him from the back. Fuming in anger, the wimpy man aimlessly pointed all around the forest. I told you. Something fell down from the sky. Are all of you blind search thoroughly? Again repeat move, idiots. The calm looking mafia stepped up and looked into the eyes of the wimpy man. Your eyes are unfocused, Antonello. Did you take the anger plant? Don't pry into my private matter. Did you not hear what I just said? Said Antonello clenched his fist hard, before slapping the cheek of the mafia. Funnily enough, it was his hand that became swollen from the strike instead of the man's cheek. Quickly hiding that hand behind him, Antonello started. Why you just do as I say however, none of them moved according to his order. Instead, the slap man walked up and grabbed Antonello by the wrist. I apologize for the harsh treatment. I will face the punishment when we return. However, I believe that right now, there is a bigger concern than looking for an unknown that abruptly fell from the sky. Let me go I'll let me go. Why you fucker with Antonello screaming? The 13 of them finally exited the forest, leaving the two of us still hidden by ourselves. I Robin was about to speak, but I placed my finger on top of her lips, silencing her. I whispered to her, don't jinx us again. Walking in a direction different from the way that the mafias took, Robin frequently grew her ears as far away from our current standing as possible, gaining the slips of information from the civilians who live beyond this large forest. By this inefficient method of gathering information, we only managed to figure out a couple of things. 1. This island is Vito indeed, the one we've been aiming for. 2. The civilians are to pay some sort of tax to Jinkana family, the mafias who protect them from outside harm in return. They seem to be complaining however, that the mafias have recently been taking food as the tax, instead of money that's been piling up. 3. Those without the ability to pay taxes are expelled to the outskirt of the city, and are termed as druggies for all of them tend to be addicted to an abusive drug called anger plant. That reduces them into animals incapable of thinking. Smoker. And now, standing still in the forest, Robin mumbled in exhaustion. So what plans in your mind? I replied in a thoughtful manner. I think you should act as one of those so-called druggies. Robin turned and looked at me with evident exhaustion. I don't like the sound of that idea. All that we need is an alibi. An orphan girl, who harbors the will to stay sane among the crazed druggies. Saved me and healed me back to health. Finding potential in her, and in order to bring her out of that hell, I officially recruited her on the spot. There, the story is complete. And how will you relay that story to the Marine? This island is under the supposed protection of Mafia, meaning that making an in-person contact with a fellow Marine is practically impossible. Crossing her arms with a huff, Robin stated astutely, furthermore, Den Den Mushi 2 is a live being. It requires food to survive, which is of high value here. It is unlikely for the commoners to have such a fancy tool for communication, and if you are looking for one, you will have to get involved with Mafias without a doubt. I hum thoughtfully. Then what do you suggest? We leave. The arrival here itself is enough of an alibi. You can say that you took me and escaped from this island. I doubt that my superiors will believe in that. I shook my head negatively, before suggesting, 
How about I just subdue the entire organization instead? That way, by making myself in the news, my absence during the Ahara incident will easily be understood. Robin gazed at me in exasperation. Are you telling me that you are able to defeat all of them by yourself? I'll need the information first. But, I recall that in the canon, one of the worst generation, named Captain Beach, was the boss of the Mafia family in West Blue. I believe that my current estimate of strength was greater than Beach prior to the time skip in the Anime, and based on this logic, me against the entire Mafia family in one of the four blues should be manageable. Robin, who seemed to have grown curious to my full capability, was about to ask a question. However, at the next moment, her stomachs growled synchronously, causing her to close her mouth. Reaching into my pocket, I took out a dried kelp and held it up toward Robin. Want one? Robin's face immediately turned green. Turning away from the seaweed in my hands, she responded, No. Shrugging, I took a bite out of it. Your loss. I suppose that the prolonged stay under Garp's command ended up dulling my sense of taste. I believe that it was a good thing though. One day after in the filthy looking area of the island upon the sun rising, the crazed roars of the druggies were heard. Disturbed by the sluggish words and movements of these savages, Robin, who was sleeping soundly within a roughly built wooden hut, jolted up awake. Morning, Irobi, and Smoker, the white-haired fellow who was still wearing his worn-down marine attire, greeted Robin, whose hair was notably shorter than before, now only reaching up to her shoulder. However, Robin was occupied with something else on Smoker's left a huge pile of fresh fish on top of a handmade wooden plate. Smoker, noticing Robin's eyes on the fish, said casually, that's some money there. Yesterday, they successfully located this slum. Upon conducting few tests, the two of them came to conclude that all these people, having been damaged in the brain due to the chronic consumption of the plants all around here, lost all five senses of human. Hence, here they are now, having integrated themselves with ease. Back to the present, Robin was found looking at Smoker. She then muttered in monotone, fish. Ha! Huh. Smoker, I am eight. I need to grow. Ah, of course. You haven't eaten anything for quite some time. Smoker, chuckling as he realized Robin's hunger, then spoke mischievously, say pretty please, Lieutenant Smoker Dash. Pedo, what did you say? I didn't hear. Robin, lowering her head momentarily, then started with embarrassment, P pretty please, Lieutenant Smoker. The current situation was quite interesting, Smoker thought. He wondered if the cause was the sheer impact that Ahara incident had on him, causing him to shrug off the presence of the mere Mafias. Well, erasing such thoughts out of his head, Smoker straightened his hand up. Who am I to ignore the plea of my subordinate? I shall now make you the world's best sashimi. And here started yet another day for the 13-year-old and 8-year-old though they weren't aware yet of what was about to come. Early in the morning, the sunlight shone through the window and illuminated one room, which was situated in the huge mansion of Vito. The room was exquisitely designed with the floor covered by the red carpet, the bookshelves lying on the sides, and one luxurious looking table at the back. Near the table, one old aged man was seen smoking comfortably in his seat as he casually gazed at his subordinate, who was found genuflecting. Hugh old boy and a girl, you say? Breathing out the smoke, said old aged man muttered in a deep voice from the slum of Nameless. There are ones who managed to evade the effects of anger plant. Yes, boss. We thoroughly checked and found no error on our side prior to their exile from the city. All exiles, without a doubt, were exposed to the effects of the drug that we implemented prior to their expulsion. Although the boy seems to be an outsider who somehow arrived here undetected, the girl belongs in the slum for sure. Hum, interesting. Taking another puff out of his cigar, the supposed boss exclaimed as he gazed at the window. That may explain the case of my nephew then. Anger plant. This plant is a special type of plant that only grows on the island of Vito. And years ago, he, Gincana Angelo, settled on this island after realizing its potential for monetization. Although the raw effect of the drug was too strong, if the blood collected from those druggies were to be transfused to a patient with the matching blood type, said patient temporarily gains an amazing healing factor. Anger plant as the process drug his nephew, Gincana Antonello, was one of those along with the special guest of his, who were given the privilege to be treated by the blood of druggies. The issues with a lingering side effect of addiction and the buildup of tolerance against the treatment, Antonello, suffering from a chronic illness that is incurable by any means has not only become an addict to the drug, but had to receive an increased amount of dose upon each succeeding treatment, just to reproduce the same magnitude of effect. The tolerance against the therapeutic effect of anger plant, what did Dr. Roman say? The lackey kneeling in front of Angelo answered immediately, Dr. Roman suspects that age is the key. The younger you are when exposed to the drug, the more tolerant you become. However, it's a speculation at best, and he alternatively proposed that the boy from the outside may have something to do about it. He requests that we bring those two children to him. Hugh placing the cigar down on the ashtray, Angelo's demeanor suddenly shifted, revealing a malevolent gleam. And where are they at the current moment? After filling our stomachs with fish, Robin and I attained our permit into the city. There was no one to stop us from doing so, especially since showcasing the cognitive ability to walk toward the set destination proves that we are capable of working, and thus, are of use to this small society. Therefore, entering the lively city of Vito early in the morning, here we sat on a patio that lies outside of one cafe, with cups of water to quench our thirst, and Robin and I were currently enjoying a moment of peace. Here, Robin, who attained a milk moustache, handed me the rolled-up newspaper, 
I saw it as we passed by a newspaper stand. How much was it? I asked lazily while taking the hold of the newspaper. Zero. I stole it. After all, I see. Picking my ear, I said casually, place this back after we are done reading then. Robin, with her elbow on the table, leaned her face on her palm as she gazed at me blankly. You are fine with me stealing. What stealing are you talking of? Not bothering with her stare, I shifted my eyes onto the newspaper. But I knew that on my collarbone which was currently covered from the view by the newspaper, Robin grew an eye to read along with me. And right away, I see the big news indeed. Right away from the title page. There was one huge picture of a mushroom-shaped explosion cloud covering an entire island. It read, Shocking. The world's infamous scholars as the evil masterminds Ahara incident scholars, including the infamous Dr. Clover, were executed for the unacceptable crime of deciphering the Poneglyphs for the purpose of awakening the dangerous weapons of the past blah blah. Five vice admirals valiantly condemned the criminals. What does it say? I lived on the outskirts for most of the time, so I can't read. Robin, who suppressed her trembling tone as much as possible, asked while acting the slum girl Arobi. This information is off limits for a kid like you. Why? Is it something lewd? Keep imagining flipping a page. I then narrowed my eyes at the sudden piece of information that I came across. Vice Admiral Kuzan bestowed with the codename of Akiji. Blue Pheasant hold on. Pheasant was already in use by Admiral Anastasia. For the sake of symbolizing the strength of the Marine, no codename is allowed to overlap, and this meant that Admiral Anastasia is she dead. Upon flipping to another page, my inquiry was resolved. The war at Karai Berry, and the winner. Martini Hook, the super rookie his bounty was recently renewed to a sheer 1,600,000,000 billy. And while I was occupied at Ahara, many things seemed to have happened all around the world. The fall of the fading star, and the rise of the burning justice Admiral Akana and his glorious feats. With this, the current three admirals are the following. Sidahebi, Hironazumi, and Akainu. If the events are to flow the same as the canon, the former two will eventually step down from the seats within the next 20 years. Grimacing. I flipped to the next page, Rise of the Undead Gecko Moria's Resurrection Hum. And there, I found yet another piece of knowledge that piqued my interest. On the island of Suspiria within the West Blue, the countless undead were abruptly sighted rendering the island unlivable. Marine officially stated that based on the investigation, such as likely to be the work of Gecko Moria, the nightmare who lost his war against Kaido of the Beast a year ago. It was originally speculated that he faced his death in that war, but now, the phenomenon proved otherwise well. Seems like the Marine is busy as always amazed. By what I managed to learn from this piece of newspaper, I finally reached the end. But knowing Sengoku's character, it is unlikely that he will sit still. Similar to the case of a Hara incident, it is likely that he assembles a secret team to end Moria once and for all. Then, the question was, how did Moria survive during his time of adversity? Without the Seven Warlord system, there is nothing that is protecting him from the Marine, and judging by how he's likely to be severely weakened, the world government won't offer current Moria one of the seven seats. The year 1502 there surely were a lot of things happening. Closing it and raising my head up, I found Robin, whose eyes were now closed and forearms were crossed signaling the use of her fruit ability. Meditating, huh? Remarking impassively, I finished the remaining milk in my cup and awaited for Robin to finish her eavesdropping. The people passed by, busy with their daily lives. Though the two of us were far from normal to them, we appeared as nothing but a teenage boy and a young girl. I couldn't help but chuckle as I thought about it. Thanks for waiting. I periodically need to meditate to keep myself in control. If I don't do so, I find myself getting angry for no reason in particular. And after some time passed, Robin finally opened her eyes. Relaxing her arms, she asked knowingly, Since I made you wait, why don't I tell you a funny thing I've heard as we previously walked by? I shrugged, sure. It's only been spread very recently. Robin the pointed at the huge mansion that could be seen all the way from here. Since you are an outsider, you must not know, that mansion over there is the base of the Ginkana family. And apparently, the boss of the organization Ginkana Angelo, discovered that overconsumption of food is the cure to the effect of the anger plant. He and his entire family have been eating so vigorously that they decided to take away the food from the entire population of this island, except for the bare minimum required for the civilians to survive click. Robin stopped her words in the middle, as the sound of a gun being triggered entered our ears. Three only. I couldn't help but chuckle inwardly, as the two of us saw three suit-wearing mafias approaching us. Well, I guess that in normal cases, that's more than enough to fetch two kids. However, there was one thing that they didn't know. Robin spoke the name of the Mafia boss in a casual manner. And in a broad daylight this meant that based on the information that she collected, I, the one who single-handedly caused all the civilians of Ahara to evacuate, is capable of wiping them out. Kids. One among the three spoke threateningly. Unauthorized druggies are not granted the rights to defile the city. Walking closer to us. The man placed his gun right next to my head as I sat still without care. You two are coming with us, unless death is what you wish for. E please, Robin, who feigned fear out of her, whimpered, I'll go. So please, don't hurt me. 
Witnessing this sudden commotion, the civilians who were initially looking at us out of curiosity, quickly scuttled away out of fear. From the back, I heard the sound of the store entrance being locked. It seemed that the control of mafias over this island was absolute. However, instead of expressing the expected fear, I instead turned my head, such that the gun's barrel was now directly pointing at my forehead to where. Two then, before he could reply, the mafia suddenly collapsed to the floor, while losing his grip over his pistol. Two mafias at the back, having noticed this, quickly took out their own pistols. However, before they could do anything, their eyes similarly hollowed out, and they fell onto the floor. Ugly what's going on? From the above, someone a random civilian whispered in a mix of nervousness and confusion, they fainted. Robin, whose head was lowered and body was trembling forcibly, raised her back in surprise. Then, looking at me, she asked warily, Who are you? Grinning in response. I took off the rug of a shirt that I was wearing, and revealed my tattered marine attire. A fucking marine, that's who I am. And it was the time to act. White Snake, within the city of Vito, the huge load of white smoke suddenly erupted out, engulfing down the whole ground in an instant. Swoo. As the civilians kept themselves silent in stupefaction from this sudden development, the smoke that harmlessly swarmed across the city began to condense and morph into multitudes of giant snakes, which frighteningly swam through the streets, looking for their prey. Bang. And in this calamity, the noises of guns being fired were heard from all around. Ugly what the hell? Someone tell me what is going on gar bang. Bang. The mafias who were spread out throughout the town all attempted to retaliate by using their weapons. However, the bullets simply flew through the entities of smoke without any effect. Subsequently, those snakes caught around them, rendering them immobilized. And a smoker, the teenage marine who hasn't moved a step yet, clenched his hand return. At a rapid pace, the previously spread out snakes of smoke whooshed back at their master, along with the tied up mafias from all around the city. Ruthless and uncaring of the muffled cries of horror from the mafias, smoker now watched as hundreds of them were now laid out in front of him, still immobilized and held up in the air, by the huge volume of dense smoke. Che in one building where a group of civilians were hiding. One old man whispered in a realization, don't tell me. As the other civilians' eyes turned to him, the old man, whose gaze was still fixated at the scene outside, gulped, the recently risen dark horse of the marine, one who chased down the countless criminals in the dangerous sea of the Grand Line all within a year. This old man he was someone who ensured not to miss out on the news, finding those papers the greatest joy in his miserable life as the Mafia's slave. After the Pirate King's execution, the pirates have begun to thrive greater than they ever did. Within this era, termed the Great Age of Piratus by Morgans. Sir Crocodile, Nightmare Gecko Moria, Heavenly Demon Don Quixote Do Flamengo, Martini Hook, Hellblaze Diego, Red Hair Shanks, and Marine Hunter Dracol Mihek numerous super rookies made their name spread wide, swarming through the sea fearlessly. His voice trembled. His heart started beating fast. His instinct was telling him that the opportunity for change has arrived on this island. With the name Marines being occupied with the three catastrophes of the New World, the new generation of the Marine was speculated to fall short in comparison to the pirates. All except for one mere teenager who appeared out of nowhere. One whom the pirates began to call White Menace, for not having failed once to catch his target without a doubt. The one in front of us right now, is none other than, the old man's eyes gleamed in delight, Smoker. W who are you? One Mafia, still caught up by the smoke, asked fearfully. The dominating Mafia who oppressed the civilians and tortured them under the excuse of protecting, has now become the prey all the civilians, after hearing the old man's remark, spectated the scene with anticipation. Why? Smoker raised his hand up, with his index finger outstretched toward the man. I am not but a soon turning 14 teenage boy, who was miraculously saved by a strong-willed girl. Then, he flicked the extended finger, Puck, and the mafia who had just spoken was now found dead, with the blood gushing out of his pissed skull. Hey! Another mafia then cried out of desperation, W what is a marine like you doing here? Our boss made a deal with you guys, didn't he Puck? You call assholes like those marines. The smoke immobilizing the mafias morphed once more, swirling around the clump of people. It rushed to form a dense, white-colored sphere that completely encased all the mafias, before, black room. It suddenly turned pitch black in color. The witnesses then saw, boom, the enormous explosion in the sky, ending the lives of hundreds of mafias in a single go. Thud, thud. The corpses, one by one, fell back to the street like rain. Burnt to crisp and emitting smoke from their bodies, Robin, who stood at the back with amazement in her eyes, unconsciously tightened her fists, incredible. That was the only remark she could think of. Smoker, who stood impassively as the corpses continued to fall all around, was now holding a den den mushy in his right hand. It seemed that he retrieved it from one of the mafias during the short span of time that he had. Without any wait, he initiated the call. Jack, Elizabeth, Jimmy, name and status. Smoker, the lieutenant assigned under Vice Admiral Cousin's command. I am here to report my survival on the island of Vito, within the West Blue. The codes that you've spoken are outdated. If we were to consider the time that you've gone missing, it is plausible to believe in your words. However, Hart, Lieutenant Joan, 
The voice in the den den mushy changed to a feminine one, bringing Smoker to a smile. Shion. I was freaking unconscious for a week or so, after getting a nice beat down by Jaguar D. Saul and almost drowning. And, ignoring Joan's words, Smoker continued, I'm currently in the process of destroying one mafia organization that's been overruling the island. The den den mushy, growing a tick mark, sighed Joan. I stated firmly, you know me. ECH, stay safe, idiot. With that, the call ended, and Robin, who was gazing Smoker with curiosity regarding the call he just made, realized that they were now surrounded by the previously cowering civilians, who revealed themselves from all around. A successful showmanship Robin noted keenly. The people around them, from her perspective, stared at Smoker with hope in their eyes. Hey, are you truly a Marine? One man, the scrawny one who seemed to be nearing death by starvation, timidly mumbled. So why you, you haven't abandoned us after all? Under no circumstance does Marine overlook the tyranny by criminals. Smoker, standing confidently, spoke in a calm tone. The fact that this horrific state of the city wasn't known to the headquarter means one thing. Jinkana family made a deal with the corrupted Marines to tolerate their control over this island. Bowing strictly, Smoker then said, I apologize for making late. However, I promise you the sufferings that tortured you for years, all of them will come to an end today. The civilians whispered and murmured among themselves. Then, the old-aged man asked warily, So will we be able to give a proper funeral to our dead family members? A young-aged boy held his hands together, W will I be able to eat as much as I want? Smoker, in response, gave them a confident smile, without a doubt. Food in a huge mansion of Jinkana family, an individual with a hoarse voice screeched, Bring me more food this isn't enough, for how long Jinkana Angelo? The boss of the family who stayed in his office room, pinched the bridge of his nose with a grimace, must. We tolerate this demeanor of our esteemed guest raising his head up and looking at one old aged man in front of him, who wore the white doctor's attire, Angelo growled, Dr. Roman. Food ignoring the pompous cry that resounded all the way, Roman replied stoically, his survival itself was a miracle. His entire chin was ripped apart from his body, and coupled with the malnutrition and miraculous escape from the calm belt even, though he is the devil fruit chooser the fact that he managed to rejuvenate up to this extent, with the anger plant blood and food alone, is an unbelievable slam. Slamming his fist on the table, Angelo interrupted Roman with a deep frown, get to the point already. Roman, letting out a small sigh, informed, at least a month is needed still. A month. Angelo, upon receiving Roman's words, leaned back on his chair, seeming depleted. Looking up at the ceiling, he then muttered, is this investment truly worth it? I initially viewed this as an opportunity to attract a powerful individual into my force and conquer this sea of West Blue. If that guest of mine were to support me, I will, without a doubt, be able to defeat all those despicable bastards. Sighing once more, Angelo shook his head, but the demand of this man is getting more and more ridiculous. At this rate, before the man fully heals, this island will first run out of its inhabitants. Then, as the room fell into silence with Roman standing still, a knock on the door was heard. What is it, Angelo, lighting up a cigar, said with a restored calmness. May I clean the room now, boss? In response, a young voice of a man was heard from the outside. Enter. Just as Angelo stated, the door creaked open, and one obese-looking man of short height entered the room. I don't recognize you. Roman, raising his eyebrow at the appearance of this young aged man, asked, Who may you be? Immediately lowering his head as a sign of respect, the man said, I'm the Nubia family, having joined just a week ago. I go by the name Captain Beach, and it is my honor to be of use to our great boss and head doctor. Who? Letting out a puff of smoke, Angelo stood up from his seat and began to walk out of the room, make sure that everything is clean thoroughly. Yes, boss. With Beach's firm reply, Angelo exited the room along with Roman on his back. Walking out of the room, they were immediately met with the sight of a huge man whose height reached nearly 7 meters in height, with his chin having been patched up, vigorously eating away the mountain of food in front of him. Nightmare Gecko Moria Angelo, leaning on the rail, muttered to himself, you better be worth the investment. Thud. Spectating yet another knockout of a mafia goon, the citizens of Vito found themselves in disbelief. In front of them, that one marine named Smoker was walking across the straight street, triumphantly advancing to the huge mansion that lied just ahead. Bang. The confronting mafias, filled with horror, relentlessly shot bullets at Smoker. However, the clanging noises were heard, ones that can only be heard during the collision between two metals. Such bullets had no effect on this marine, and there was nothing that the criminals could do to prevent the retribution upon them. Thud. The street, now entering the starry night, was filled with blood. The civilians, stepping and drenching their footwears in said blood, expressed nothing but exhilaration. Violence was justified, and blood has become their symbol of liberation. The mass massacre of criminals perhaps some marines would have frowned upon if they were to be here. Smoker thought as he now stood in front of the gate of the mansion, believers of moral justice. Those whose ideals stood on the opposite end of absolute justice. Smoker had a firm belief that such ones are those who harbor the right mentality as marines. But still, justice itself is flawed or so Smoker believed. Must I stop my inhumane murders and let innocent ones suffer more? Must I care about the rights of the criminals, those who have inflicted harm upon others? 
the potential of rehabilitation, you say. Screw that. Since the Ahara incident, Smoker began to remember the details of his past life that he previously wasn't able to think of. It was a challenge that he set for himself. In order to act according to his ideals, he must become strong. In order to become strong, he must not back down in difficult situations that he encounters. Now, there he stood in front of the huge entrance of the mansion, and there was no hesitation. Raising his left leg up, Smoker performed a clean kick, Rankyaku. Swoosh! In front of the civilian's eyes, the previously intact gate was now spliced into four clean pieces. Boom! Soundproofing. Ha! As those pieces fell on the ground, Smoker noted, soft surface, dense and thick layer. No wonder the mansion was quiet. Gazing at the front, Smoker was met with tens of remaining mafias, with one old aged man standing in the middle. Said mafias were pointing their firearms at him, though their arms trembled in fear and disbelief. You just who the fuck are you? The old aged man, Jinkana Angelo the boss of the family, growled unlike his usual calm self, in just one day only, everything that I built gone. You pesky marine, have I not made a deal with your folks? The grip on his cane trembled. His face turned red from fury. Angelo, he was the scheming person who took over the entire island, as well as the ambitious fellow who desired to conquer the entire West Blue. Yet, right now, he was nothing but a senile old man unable to conceal his emotion. After all, said pesky marine standing in front of him, Smoker was someone who wiped out Angelo's entire family by himself within a day. Are you the boss of the gang? Under the eyes of civilians, those who remained outside, Smoker began his walk. Uncaring of the guns aimed at his head, he approached Angelo with casual steps. I was informed that he goes by the name Giancana Angelo. If I'm not wrong, I hope he wasn't cowardly enough to run away. Answer me, Maureen. Angelo exploded in a loud scream. I promised your folks 25% of the profit, if you were to let me, your folks you say. Smoker, now standing right in front of Angelo, stated coldly, you're probably wrong about that part. Then, just as Smoker's right hand twitched bang bang bang, the mafia surrounding him shot at once, immediately responding to the slightest movement of their enemy. However, there was one thing that they failed to see. Up until now, Smoker hasn't displayed his ability to morph his body itself into smoke and simply block the bullets with Tekai only. This meant swoosh. The bullets would bypass the Marine harmlessly and puck puck puck, inflict damages on fellow Mafias essentially ending their lives by their own hands. Thud. And not having perceived what happened in a split second, Angelo stood still, frozen. A human being that can't be killed by bullets is he a human even? Angelo felt himself being filled with horror to the brim. Rationality was long gone, and his instinct overwhelmed him. Says stop without any trace of dignity, Angelo shrieked in a terrified tone, D don't you dare and move. Or I'll T take them with me having taken out the luxurious looking pistol while sweating profusely, Angelo pointed its barrel at the civilian mess standing at some distance away from Smoker. You're welcome to try. However, Smoker, at the next moment, placed his hand on top of the barrel of Angelo's pistol, and crunch. His grip instantly ruined the gun, rendering it useless. If you are able to. And without the pistol, Angelo, standing dumbfounded, ran out of options. Losing strength in his legs, he fell to the ground. His shaking eyes became fixated on the ground, and his trembling right hand instinctively moved to his lips as if smoking an invisible cigar for relief. Then, in realization of something, Angelo suddenly perked up and shouted, T, that's right. I still have Shigen, Puck. But his words never met their completion, having swiftly been executed by Marine Lieutenant Smoker. Thud. As Angelo's corpse fell, I raised my head up to a door that stood in front of me. The people behind me cheered wildly, crying in joy and enjoying this bask of freedom. They chanted the name Smoker the hero who appeared out of nowhere one day. This. Should be enough for an alibi I thought as I grasped the doorknob, with Jinkana Angelo dealt with. The only remaining tasks are to thoroughly search this mansion, and find if there are any remaining mafias under the hide food at the next moment, a terrifying roar suddenly boomed forth causing everyone here to freeze. I'm hungry bring food. It was such a monstrous scream. The noise that human beings shouldn't be capable of producing. All of you, narrowing his eyes at the door in front of him, I stated calmly, get out of here. It said food, Robin whispered with suspicion, don't tell me that the food that mafias collected are Ford turning around in urgent. Agency. I said once more, hurry boom. The wall in front of me collapsed, before a huge figure revealed itself all of a sudden with one man under its grip. What just doubly what is that thing? One civilian woman, hugging her body with a pale expression, whimpered. The old aged civilian immediately noted as he unconsciously took a step back, T that's, without a doubt, Nightmare Gecko Moria. Why is he here? The huge shadow loomed over us, and said shadow belonged to the pale skinned man Gecko Moria whose attention was focused on the bleeding man in his grip. Dr. Roman where is my food? Moria growled murderously. I've been holding in for six hours, for how long must I tolerate? A Kurg esteemed guest of ours, please have mercy I I beg you. It's on the way, I it really is. Moria didn't seem to have noticed the presence of others being tunnel visioned. Roman, on the other hand, seemed to be in too much agony to pay attention to his surrounding. Gecko Moria, suppressing the growing dread in my heart. I quickly dispersed smoke and latched them onto the civilians and Robin at the back. The news suggested his stay on the island of Suspiria. 
But judging by how he's been hiding in this mansion, he initially used his ability to mass produce the undead, and used them as decoys. Gecko Moria. Not only did he possess a dangerous devil fruit that can be used in various means, but being a pirate from the new world he likely possesses Haki. Even with the consideration that Moria has been weakened to a severe degree, my chance of victory was extremely slim. Coupled with loads of civilians who were helpless in front of the notorious pirate, the burden on my back was heavy. ECH. As expected, alive are imperfect unlike the dead. Whispering to himself, Moria revealed a huge scissor that he held with his left hand. Your skills as a doctor are quite remarkable, but not even you are able to surpass my power to bring the dead back in its perfect form. Kishishishi for how many times must I scream food for you to understand? Subsequently, forming a wicked grin on his face, Moria mercilessly cut the shadow off from Roman, causing the latter to slump into unconsciousness. A peculiar scene unfolded in front of me. Letting go of the unconscious doctor, Moria gripped onto Roman's shadow that thrashed under his grasp. Kishishishi Shishi, be grateful, Dr. Omond. Now, I shall make you perfect. Something that you won't be able to achieve during your entire lifetime. Moria's statement boomed across the hall. Overwhelmed by anxiety, one civilian screamed, Ah, and with such a cry, I'll run, Emmy first, me. All civilians simultaneously fell in panic, desperately running out of the mansion with hopes of survival. The whole island fell into chaos, and the entire city, within the night, was filled with animalistic screams. Ha, huh, letting out a sight to calm myself down. I eyed Robin who looked back at me. Go. Robin looked horrified. However, such feeling didn't stem from fear, but from guilt that she wasn't able to identify Moria's stay on this island. Moria's fruit ability is versatile. Running away with hundreds of those normal people it's virtually impossible. Gecko Moria, one who had the strength and capability to reach the new world and clash against Kaidu. Judging by various patchworks on his body, the notable obesity that contrasts with what he was a year ago, and his eyes that seemed hollow as if unfocused, he seemed to have severely weakened. However, Moria was Moria nonetheless the master of shadows. And I knew that the only option left for me was to defeat this monster in front of me. It wasn't the question of whether I can do it or not. I had to win, no matter what. Smoker Robin, not knowing what to do, seemed like an eight-year-old child for once. With her whole body trembling uncontrollably, she looked at me. Arobi, I know that life isn't meant to be easy. Not everything goes according to your way, and there is no such thing as a perfect plan. This is especially the case in this world, where laws don't protect you, where the sense of morality is thin. And I already promised myself, didn't I? I will become strong, strong enough to break free from the chains set by the world government. If I were to run away in every single adversity, how will I become strong? Therefore, I didn't take a step back, forming a smile on my face. I gaze at Robin confidently. Have some faith in me, will you? Robin seemed reluctant. However, knowing that her presence here would be nothing but a nuisance to me, she eventually turned and ran away as well. Now, there are only like two people in this mansion, Moria and me. Kishishishi, those screams fucking hurt my ears. And Moria, laying his murderous gaze in the direction where the civilians ran away too, growled with a grin, yet another useless bunch. As expected, people are better dead than alive. Shifting his bloodshot eyes on me, the only one who remained in front of him, Moria playfully repeated the act of throwing and catching the still struggling shadow of Roman. Then, crouching down, he asked me with a crazed expression and a marine. I see Kishishishi. Are you one of those fools screaming justice every second? Those hypocrites who commit the same wrongs as pirates? Maybe. You aren't wrong about the second half? I remarked as my body began to emit wisps of smoke Gekka Moria. As Moria threw Roman's shadow into his mouth and engulfed it, I stated with a grin of my own, let's die together. Kishishishi, die together. Crackling in laughter, Moria, placing his hands in his pockets, stared at me in amusement. Then, as his eyes shifted to that of contempt, he snarled, Marine, don't you know who I am? Boom. At a rapid speed that I barely reacted to, Moria slammed his huge right fist on the ground I was standing just previously. I'm the notorious pirate with 320 million Beely on his head Nightmare Gecko Moria, the destined pirate king. Roaring in a crazed manner, he leaned down to glare at me with his bloodshot eyes. And you Kishishishi a worthless pile of trash whom I never heard of before, think you can fight me on equal ground. Swoosh. Immediately leaning back as quickly as possible. I dodged Moria's hand that swiped horizontally. Subsequently, I backflipped to evade Moria's stomp, which formed a spiderweb-like crack on the floor. Judging by raw strength alone, he isn't wrong? I thought while landing on a vertical plane of wall. Unlike him, I still am unable to utilize Haki. Against him who fought Kaidu, my physical prowess falls off as well boom. Leaping up from the wall, I dodged the giant scissor that slammed forth. Doppelman. Subsequently, I noticed that Moria, as he stood back up with a laid-back attitude, had his own shadow wiggling in a strange manner. Then, it physically manifested and arose sharply from the ground now gazing at me with its hollow eyes. Upon the shadow grinning similarly to Moria, I clenched my fists tight while airborne, 
bracing myself for the impact. Brick bat. Then, the huge shadow of Moria suddenly dispersed into numerous shadow-made bats. From all around me, they flooded in with malicious intent. My entire surrounding was colored black, and I sighted Moria looking down on the floor, at where my shadow was displayed by the ceiling light. Narrowing my eyes, before the bats could launch their attacks on me, wide out, I swarmed the entire hallway with dense white smoke. A cough devil fruit Moria cried in surprise, just as I quickly dispersed my body into smoke, and smashed all lights nearby. The shadow bats upon their arrival to where I previously stood, found themselves by against each other. Smoke, cough, I see so you're that, cough, white menace that's been making name recently, within the smoke which I could clearly see through, Moria's voice resounded, kisha shishi, but what difference can this useless smoke make? Swoosh. Immediately after Moria's words, I felt the sudden gush of wind, so strong that boom, the wall behind me broke from the impact, revealing the clear night sky where the bright moon illuminated the city. Simultaneously, I was sent flying back by the pressure out of the mansion. ECH. Landing on my feet, I grimaced while focusing my attention on Moria, who lazily walked out of the dark mansion, Doppelman. And before I realized his shadow it was towering over me from my back, gritting my teeth. I quickly flopped on the ground to dodge the shadow's kick as well as Moria's punch that was aiming for my head boom. I found my vision shaking and by the time I realized, I was flying up in the air with Moria, standing on the ground, having his foot outstretched. Kisha Shishi, it's futile Moria, while saying so, had his eyes gleam in red. Observation Haki, ha repositioning myself in the air, I pointed my index finger at Moria, white gun, bang, a small ball of white smoke rapidly traveled at Moria. But before it could land on him, Moria simply slapped the smoke bullet away with his right hand, Kishishishi. What was this supposed to do behind me? Who was rapidly falling to the ground, Moria's doppelman appeared with its hand ready to leash out on me. ESSSS. However, at the same time, the smoke bullet expanded into a huge volume of smoke upon Moria's hand slap. White Snake. With my eyes focused on Moria and not the doppelman behind me, I tweaked my hand and upon my will. The cloud of smoke morphed into a snake that coiled around Moria. Then, boom. Just as Moria's doppelman landed its punch on my back, causing me to plummet to the ground. Transmutation. Black. Boom. The snake suddenly turned black, before exploding into a huge burst of fire. Kishishishi and I heard while standing back up, the amused laughter from my back, Kajimusha, Shadow Warrior. Moria and his doppelman swapped places. The one who faced the full-blown effect of my smoke-induced explosion wasn't Moria, but his doppelman. And I was waiting for this moment the moment where Moria was in proximity to me, with his guard down. Tap. Eh? As Moria expressed surprise, I, having my fist in contact with the pirate's large stomach, unleashed my technique, white blow. Boom. A huge volume of white smoke blasted out of my fist in point-blank range. The incredible pressure generated by the smoke as well as the strength that I've been honing ever since my arrival to this world works synergistically to produce this outcome Kishishishi. Kishishishi, but what I heard wasn't a pain-filled groan, but yet another laughter. When the cloud of smoke cleared, I saw that through the ripped top, Moria's stomach in contact with my fist was coated in black, signaling the use of armament haki. Hardening. Shit, without any hesitation, I dashed backward to prevent myself from being gripped by Moria. However, boom. I was knocked down by Moria's doppelman, who stomped on my form. Kishishishi. Though it's entertaining to watch a prick like you make a fool out of yourself, I don't feel like fighting any longer. Moria, holding his giant scissor, was now pinning me down with his foot for he swapped places with Doppelman. I'm freaking hungry. So just lie here and wait until your death are. In front of Moria's face, my detached arm was floating in front of him with the white sphere of smoke on its palm. Though I instinctively groaned from the pain of having my body crushed by a strong force, I nonetheless attacked White Lance. Gah, boom. The dense sphere smoke shot out toward Moria at an imminent strength in a pointy form that looked like a spear. Though its end was blunt, Moria was struck down to the ground, uh, come on. Or not. In place of where Moria was supposed to be, his shadow was lying instead. Moria, on the other hand, was standing at some distance away from me, having swapped places with his manifested shadow. Why won't you just die already? Ha ha. Breathing heavily, I wiped the sweat off my body while standing back up, and having my um returned back to my body. Then, grinning with confidence, I stated, the answer is obvious, isn't it? I'm stronger than you. What? Moria, frowning while gritting his jagged teeth, growled, me, weaker than you. Are you out of your mind? Boom. Dashing at me at a rapid speed, Moria then instantly slammed his haki and case scissor down at where I stood, which I dodged by dispersing my body into smoke and floating upward. Swoosh. Taking out his stabbed scissor, Moria swung it upward vertically. His eyes gleamed red to signal its use of observation haki, and having predicted the movement of smoke, the vertical slash abruptly changed its direction, cutting through the dense smoke. I appearing behind Moria was about to land a punch on him, but the one I saw in front wasn't Moria, but his doppelman. Then, Moria's haki in case scissor effectively stabbed through my body. Moria, grinning evilly, 
laughed wildly in assumption of his victory. Kishishishi, here it is, yet another poof. Eh? Before I suddenly disappeared in a puff of smoke, Rakugan boom, and from the back, Moria was caught off guard by a sudden attack from his back. Though his body was too strong for Rakugan to inflict a substantial extent of damage, the patchworks on his body became undone, causing the blood to ooze out. Moria, having his currently weakened internal organs affected, coughed out blood. Yu quickly shifting his bloodshot eyes to his back, Moria swung his scissor rapidly, but it simply swiped through the empty air. Looking around at his surrounding, the street filled with dents here and there due to the battle, Moria still didn't manage to sight his enemy me. Rakugan boom. Placing my fists on top of Moria's gigantic head, I blasted another Rakugan downward. So that's where you are. However, Moria, coating his head with armament haki, effectively endured my attack. With his eyes gleaming red, he then swung his scissor upward. I retreated as quickly as possible. However, Kurg received a diagonal gash across my chest while doing so. Tap. Landing back on the ground, me, who was invisible until previously, became visible once again due to losing my control over the smoke. Holding my hand over the wound on my chest, Black Wisp. Yes, S S S S. I generated a black smoke that combusted into the red-hot fire, burning my own skin to prevent excessive bleeding. Though the scorching pain infiltrated my nerves, I endured it and kept my eyes focused on Moria. Wait and I found my eyes widened at the next moment, where is his doppelman? Horn Blade Shadow. Before a huge spark of shadow suddenly arose from my back and penetrated through my chest. Cough the blood flooded out of my mouth. One fatal attack from Moria was enough to render me unable to combat, and now, with my eyes headed up at the bright moon, clang, I heard the noise of Moria's scissor blades clanging against one another who now stood in front of me. Boy, say it again. Looking down at me with crazed eyes, Moria snarled, who's stronger again. Reaching his hand down, Moria grabbed my shadow. Then, he peeled it off of the ground and pulled by the connection with my shadow. I was now dangling upside down as I coughed blood once more. If not for me being in this state, you wouldn't even have managed to land a strike on me. You used everything that you had, but no matter how hard you try, defeating me will be impossible without a doubt leaning closer at me. Moria then laughed. Kishishishi, look how miserable you are currently. For what reason did you even fight me? Is it out of those boring reasons like protecting people? If so, did you succeed in doing so? My vision was hazy. I subconsciously knew that this battle was over. However, my will refused to yield. Grinning with my teeth stained by my own blood. I then said, at least I didn't hide like a certain coward in front of me. Did I snap? Then, Moria suddenly cut my shadow apart from me. Thud. As I fell to the ground, I fell into unconsciousness. Kishishishi. Though your shadow is quite tempting. Moria, looking at the strangling smoker's shadow in his grip, shifted his eyes on the unconscious smoker. You will be better off dead than alive. Moria raised his scissor up, planning to behead smoker in a single go. However, stop. He found himself interrupted by a young girl, Robin, who stood in front of the unconscious smoker. Though her body was trembling from fear, her eyes held bravery as she glared at Moria, with her hands raised sideways in a protective manner. Eh? Moria momentarily frowned in confusion, before bursting into laughter. Are you stupid girl? I mean, I was planning to kill everyone on this island. But still, who the hell would just ki if? Only I looked in deeper and found out Gecko Moria's presence beforehand. If only Robin believed that there was no future to her without Smoker. She was currently weak and incapable. Saul left for his home that light a far distance away. And if she were to be left alone in this state, she won't know what to do. Therefore, she chose death than to live in this hopeless world. Then you two die together, Kishishi. Moria then swung his scissor at Robin and Smoker, with his eyes expressing delight. Robin closed her eyes tight in fright, but maintained her position nonetheless. Buom, brother. I found myself sitting on a plain chair, dazing off. Upon a call, my consciousness returned, and I saw a young boy in a hospital gown, lying down on a white hospital bed. In his hands was One Piece manga, one of his hobbies, along with reading various fanfictions. He, without a doubt, was my younger brother, diagnosed with a chronic illness that has no known cure. But wasn't I looking down at my clenched hands, where the cold up bills sat by? I thought, was it all a dream? Brother, you are a good person, right? I froze upon hearing that statement. My face then unconsciously morphed into a forced grin, before I said, yes, of course. Standing up from my seat, I waved, I'll be back later, so stay safe and eat well, alright, okay? And make sure to bring me the newest volume of One Piece as well, gotcha. Pocketing money in my hands, I exited the room and took the elevator downstairs. Moving out of the hospital by its main entrance, I casually walked to one black sub that sat nearby. Opening the already unlocked door, I took a seat in the back seat. Had a nice time with your family. A middle-aged man who was dressed formally was found sitting in the driver's seat of the car, not even waiting for my response. He handed me a slip of paper. Well, whatever. Here's your next target. Cruz Whitlock, hold on. I looked up at the man with a frown. I'm not looking for a big game. And, the man chuckled in amusement. Do you even have enough to pay for your brother this month? Fucking, look. It's either that or nothing. If you decide to turn away here, or your Gugaga the brother will die. All because of just how bad of a brother you were. Leaning down in my hands, I took in a deep breath. Ah shit. Raising my head back up. I said with an evident dislike TCH. 
It's just the same as before, right? Plop in that weird pill thing that you give me. The man grinned, now we're talking. And believe it or not, the payment will be a little higher. Subsequently, he threw a neatly folded black suit at me, change into that thing. I'm going to slap you at a party he's attending today. You got two hours to do your job. Driving, moving, changing, and getting ready. In due time, I found myself at a luxurious party, trying not to frown at the sight of people smoking from all around. Why? You don't seem to be enjoying the party. Then, a voice was heard from my right. Turning my head, I saw a blonde man standing. He then reached his hand out at me, which I shook with my own, I'm Cruz Whitlock. A little unusual for me to be invited, but nonetheless, it's quite a refreshing experience, I'd say. Nice to meet you, replying dryly. I sighted a glass of wine in his right hand as I turned my eyes away from the man. Haha, <laughs> it seems that you aren't really a fan of communication. Laughing in an awkward manner, the man rubbed the back of his head. Then, before he could talk any further, ha 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 ha. The other's boisterous laughs echoed all around the room, causing the man to flinch while momentarily closing his eyes. Seizing that chance, I flicked a white pill, which I've been holding with my left hand into the glass. Wyatt, it seems that I'm not a good person after all. Chuckling hollowly at myself, I then nodded at the blonde man and exited the party, being unable to bear myself any longer. But there is no other way for me to make enough money to pay your fee. And honestly speaking, I'd rather kill others than let my only remaining family member die. Walking to the parking lot, I returned to the same car driven by the same middle-aged man, who drove me back to the hospital. Then, walking by the entrance taking the elevator back up, and walking to my little brother's room Ma Dan, I forgot the newest volume of One Piece. I groaned in realization, but nonetheless opened the door, whatever, I'll do so next time. Who are you? My brother sat still with a pale expression. On his side was a crazed man pointing his gun at my family. Ha 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 ha, I've been waiting for this moment. Been so freaking long, the man whispered in glee. At last you are here. Do you remember me? My breathing quickened. Raising my hands up, I said nervously, as yes, sir, please. Let's talk this through, please. Remove your gun from my brother. Don't you remember me? Ignoring my plea, the man growled. Don't you remember me who lost his father because of you? Two pairs of eyes fell on me. One was full of hatred and contempt, filled with nothing but murderous intent. However, the other pair of eyes, one full of disbelief and fear those eyes, made me feel dirty. I felt unclean, and having my brother find out the truth my worst nightmare has come true. Brother, bang. And the time seemed to have stopped as the horrific scene was unveiled in front of me. My young brother, whom I supported by committing bad deeds, was shot due to such deeds. The white hospital bed was stained with red blood. Feeling dizzy and nauseous from the scene, I hollowly walked step by step and looked into the hollowed eyes of my loved one. I'm sorry that I was your brother. Feeling the tears that flooded out of my eyes, I whispered as I closed my eyes. With the gun next to my head, ready to shoot at any time, I reminisced if only I was smoker instead my eyes opened wide. My young brother, who lied with his head still bleeding, was gazing at me all of a sudden. His mouth then opened, control your breath brother. Regain control over your body. Stop your bleeding. Close the wounds on your body. Temporarily shrink your body to accommodate for the loss of red blood cells. I, finding myself in a daze once again, stuttered, I, it's time for your life return, same Kaiken, my brother then made a bloodstained smile. And you can't afford to fail again, can you, brother? Or should I say smoker? Boom. Moria's scissors slammed onto the empty ground, missing their targets. Moria initially frowned in confusion, before widening his eyes as he turned back in realization. There stood Smoker who was on one knee, with Robin lifted up by his arms. Marine the veins popped out of Moria's forehead. How the hell did you wake up after getting your shadow cut, placing Robin back down? Smoker stood on two feet while breathing calmly, same icon, ghost body. Robin looked at Smoker with widened eyes, filled with nothing but all. She... She thought everything was over, that there was no way to overcome a situation like this. And yet, this man, Smoker, stood back up with severe injuries on his body, and saved me yet again. Robin thought as her heart beat fast from the sudden development. The reason I want to be good, the reason I want to be righteous, and the reason I seek for the virtues of the world. It's so that I will be able to stand proud in front of my family. Smoker, clenching his right fist hard, muttered at himself, and I'm not going to fail, never again. Making a grin full of confidence and determination as his body began to emit the wisp of white smoke sweet. Smoker then disappeared from Robin's sight. You're going down for sure this time around, Marine. Moria, seething from the rage that he, the one who's gone up against Kaido of the Beast, is now struggling against a mere teenage Marine, roared as his eyes gleamed in red boom. However, before Moria had time to react, he was knocked upward to the sky by Smoker's white blow. Perhaps this wouldn't have happened under normal circumstances. But Moria too was suffering from the injuries that's been accumulating for quite some time. Doppelman while airborne, Moria willed his shadow to arise just as previously before quickly swapping places with it to evade Smoker Poof. Ha! Huh. Moria found himself dumbfounded as Smoker who was floating at the back of his distant Doppelman, suddenly disappeared with a puff of smoke, and the real Smoker was currently in front of him, with his right hand holding a dense, swelling ball of white smoke, white ball said ball was smashed onto Moria's exposed face. 
Smoker, pushing through, slammed Moria down to the ground with the ball, boom, and simultaneously, said ball exploded into a huge volume of white smoke that engulfed Moria. The tea doesn't hurt at all, however, Moria's scream was heard from within. Smoker, being able to see through the smoke, noticed that Moria coated his face with armament haki to protect himself. Then, swapping his place with Doppelman to escape the tightening smoke around him, Moria stood at some distance away from Smoker, Kiyishishishi. Even without the use of my Doppelman, you still can't however, he then swayed. Moving his foot to prevent himself from falling, Moria noted in disbelief. What? Moria, standing still, looked at his trembling hands. I, the nightmare of a sea who's been winning and winning until Wayno Kishishishi suddenly exploding in crazed laughter, Moria screamed. Just how much have you fallen? Gecko Moria Moria's Doppelman suddenly dispersed into numerous bats, which began to swarm around Moria's body. Moria, detaching his scissors and holding two sharp blades now, daringly walked at Smoker with fury. Just you watch Kishishishi this is a new beginning for me. I will build an infinite army of the undead, and swarm the entire sea, and in my path the power, you are nothing but an annoying fly. Moria then dashed at Smoker, who had the dense smoke swirling around his body, white snake. The snakes shot out at Moria, one by one. Moria, using his haki-covered blades, cut through the snakes, However, they continued to reform over and over, relentlessly chasing after the huge pirate. Keying Moria, letting out a war cry, locked his eyes on Smoker who was yet to move. With the shadow bat swarming from his back, intercepting the white snakes, Moria advanced with the intention to cut through his target. Uncaring of the fact that all the patchworks on his body was undone, and he was bleeding severely, he continued to cut through the never-ending swarms of white snakes swoosh. Moria's blade stopped right in front of Smoker's forehead, with his entire body tightly bound by the tens of white snakes. The bats too were bound by the huge hand made out of smoke, unable to move. Smoker, with his bangs covering his eyes, then raised his hand up transmutation. Black, the coiling white snakes, then turned into dark terrifying looking black, Hydra. The snakes opened their fangs as if screeching. Then, boom. They exploded simultaneously, and from the explosion, Moria was blasted upward once again, with his whole body emitting smoke from the burns. It seemed that he was running low on Haki. However, Moria didn't give up. While airborne, Moria's blades began to enlarge with his shadows attaching themselves, and as he coated his last remaining Haki on them, two pitch black great swords were held by Moria. Shadow Doomsday Boom. Moria landed directly on where Smoker stood, slamming his blades down at his maximum strength. The cloud of dust arose, and the gigantic spiderweb like crack was generated by the pirate's attack. However, tap. Moria felt the pair of fists coming in contact with his chest. He saw through the dust. That smoker was still standing in between his blades, having managed to dodge his final attack. And no Moria subconsciously cried in his mind as he saw Smoker's fist gaining a faint black hue. I I White King Gun. Boom. An incredible surge of white smoke blasted forth, driving through Moria's exposed chest, bulldozing through the buildings houses, and whatever lied in its path, Moria was sent flying all the way to the edge of the island before, splash, helplessly falling into the water, with a huge, unrecoverable hole in his chest. Ha ha Smoker, breathing heavily as he stood in the sight of ruination, turned to Robin and grinned, alibi complete, before falling to the ground. One week later early in the morning, the warm sunlight enlightened the city of Vito, in contrast to what it used to be under the rule of Jinkana family. The people were filled with joy as they lively moved repairing the destroyed facilities and taking care of the injured ones. How are you feeling? And currently, I was bedridden with my entire body having been wrapped around by bandages. From my side, there sat Robin, the girl who's been staying by my side. Since the battle against Moria came to a resolution, I think I'm good to go. I replied to her while forming a grin on my face, so can I take these off now? I'm not a doctor, don't ask me. Robin, standing up from her seat and opening the curtains, let the sunlight enter the room from my perspective. It does seem that you're good to go, but it doesn't hurt to make sure. Right now, two changes could be seen in terms of Robin's appearance. First, shorter hair. Second, rectangular glasses without lenses for the sake of fashion. After all, with Stainless and Momonga's divisions having confirmed that by the time they arrived at Suspiria, the unmoving corpses were scattered all around, and that they are to come here to investigate the situation Robin had to prepare herself. But are you sure that glasses and shorter hair would be enough to keep my identity hidden? Robin, seeming reluctant, asked me with an underlying nervousness. Hung, staring up at the ceiling and chuckling over how Kuina and Toshigi from the cannon were the exact depelgingers of one another, I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. But if you aren't confident enough, there is one extra measure that you can take. Robin leaned in, expressing her interest, which is... Shave your head and embrace the bald. I shrugged casually. Robin stared at me blankly before shaking her head with a light sigh, knowing full well that I was simply joking around. Then, she asked, is there anything else that I should be aware of? I nodded firmly, losing my silliness. I stated as I thought over my experiences in Kuz and now Stainless's division, more than half the Marines are the world government's dogs. And the one whom you should be watching out for the most among the ones coming here right now is the dude named Happy. Happy. The name sounds awfully friendly, Robin Deadband. He thinks he's kept himself hidden well. Unfortunately, Kuzan the Vice Admiral whom you may get a chance to meet with and I, straight away, notice that he's an eye implemented by the world government. Lifting up my bandaged right arm and pushing the part of the bandage that kept sliding down on my eyes, 
I noted, and then there's Joan. She may offer you a place in Vice Admiral Tsuru's division which only women get to join, but decline it. Though the striking similarities in the appearances of Arobi and Robin may be negligible, having the same devil fruit ability won't seem coincidental. If you were to stay with others for a prolonged time, it will nearly be impossible to keep your fruit ability concealed. Robin, listening carefully in silence, then pointed out, but the question is, will I even be allowed to be placed in your command? Having expected this question, I answered confidently, oh yes, for sure. By what basis? Making a cocky smirk, I claimed. Do you know who I got on my back? Who? Marine the awesome hero, Monkey D. Garp. Garp, Monkey D. Garp. Robin placed her hand on her chin, before nodding to herself. Uh, I think I've seen that name in the historical record before. And keep that history thing of yours suppressed as well. I shook my head in a feigned disappointment. That, just now, was a blatant giveaway that you're a scholar. Robin, looking at me, formed an O shape with her mouth in realization. And with that, the conversation has come to an end. Afterward, I placed my gaze on the table that lied on my left. Shusui, one of the 21 great great swords just like Jones Kompira, as well as the black sword. In canon, Zoro acquired it after defeating Shimitsuki Ryoma revived by Brook's shadow before exchanging it for Emma during his stay in Wano. What will happen now? My actions up until now have begun to change the destined future. And whether they were for good or bad, I had no idea. However, so what? The rapid heartbeats in me, they weren't based on fear of the unknown. Rather, it was an excitement, I embraced this change with anticipation. Heh, it seemed that I managed to adapt to this world quite well. Heh heh. Robin, squinting her eyes at me, sweat dropped, why are you smoking all of a sudden? With my smoke still intact, I replied, I have a mandatory smile gauge that must be filled on a daily basis, and according to the research done by Dr. Spade, the well-known colleague of Dr. Clover, laughing makes you healthier. Why don't you repeat after me, Dr. Spade? I never heard of him, this world is large, and there are trillions of scholars you've never heard of before. Now, come on, follow my suit. Then, filling my lungs with air, I laughed in a boisterous manner, oh ha ha ha, oh ha 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 ha. How about no? Robin's words brought me to seize my forced laugh. Coughing in embarrassment. I thought, just how did Saul make this girl laugh again? Within the blink of an eye, another week has passed. Receiving many thanks from the civilians of Vito, the arrived divisions of Stainless and Momonga immediately investigating the scene, and arresting the corrupted marines who ignored the ongoing injustice nearby them, and uneventfully sailing back to the Marineford with the newly joined chore boy Arobi, who, here I was, taking in the fresh air of Marineford, Smoker Hina, the Steel, and all my other colleagues rushed at me with widened eyes, asking if the news about my victory over Moria was true. The superiors and seniors, who's noticed me as the rising prodigy among the new generation, patted my shoulders and signs of respect. Smoker, Maynard being the same as always, recklessly charged at me with his huge fist ready to pound me. Boom. Before losing his consciousness from one punch of mine, much to my confusion and others' disbelief. My superiors are Robin, watching all this from my side, commented in a monotone, quite unique. You're no different girl, to which I replied with an amused snort of my own. Time flew by quickly. Today, we are here to send away the bravest woman I have ever got to know Admiral Anastasia. One day, for the praiseworthy achievement of catching Nightmare Gecko Moria, the notorious pirate who has tormented thousands of lives, I, Fleet Admiral Sengoku, hereby grant Marine Smoker the promotion to the rank of captain. Two days. Smoker boy, I heard that you became a Marine captain. Congratulations on being the youngest known officer with the authority to lead his own division. Zephyr stood in front of me, chugging down a bottle of liquor. Now tell me. What kind of secret method did Gup use to improve you by this much? Smoker. Where did you get that sword from? Shion asked in excitement with her eyes on Shusui. Ah, three days. It all felt like a storm, being surrounded by people all around. But once again, it was days like these that made me feel alive, although deep in my mind. I wondered, in the future, will I come to fight with these fellow Marines? It was already the end of February, with Robin still adjusting to her life as a Marine, and my colleagues continuing yet another day of a training session under Zephyr today. I stood in front of a door and gently knocked it twice. From beyond the door, an annoyed groan was heard. Then, a lazy yet familiar voice was heard. Who is it? It's me, Smoker. I said casually, open the door Kuzan san Sheesh, go away. Let me sleep in peace, buddy. Rolling my eyes. I then remarked, you know, I met a sexy sister with a hot body recently. She seemed interested after I told her about you. So I wanted to introduce her to you. But eh, I guess not boom. The door then slammed open, and Kuzan, who was wearing a blue-colored pajama, spoke with seriousness. My my, who am I to keep a privileged guest of mine waiting outside? Come in, smoker. Closing the door behind me, I followed Kuzan, who yawned while guiding me to a table. As I sat by Kuzan, while bringing me a cup of cold water out of courtesy, asked, so... What's her name, you ask? What are her three sizes? Wow, I found myself amazed. You really are something. You know that. Taking out a picture from my pocket, I handed it to Kuzan. Kuzan took the picture from me and looked at it with anticipation, before throwing it away with evident disappointment. Why are you giving me the picture of Jern? What? 
I shrugged, she's hot, isn't she? Kuzan looked at me with a blank expression. Then, sighing, Smoker, why are you here? Kuzan asked sternly, you are no longer under my command. If you are here to boast of your promotion to captain, then great, congrats, buddy. If you don't have a sexy sister to introduce, then leave please. It isn't that. And it isn't about me congratulating your newly attained codename of Aokiji either. Kuzan, from my glance, no longer had the fire that I saw months ago. His burning justice diminished until nothing remained. And if I were to describe the current man sitting in front of me, I would choose the word lazy above all else. In canon, he would continue on this path, adapting to his newly developed ideal of lazy justice, ignoring the deeds of the world government until Gorosei promotes Sakazuki as the new fleet admiral to succeed Sengoku. But I didn't like the idea of it. Gulping down the cup of water, I said solemnly, when I heard that you left the division, I was shocked. The most hard-working superior I've ever come across, the one filled with the noble goal of making this world a better place to live what happened to the vice admiral Kuzan, that I knew of. Kuzan stayed silent for a moment. Then, he narrowed his eyes at me, are you here to lecture me? I simply wish to know what happened. Gazing at Kuzan's dull eyes with a firm expression, I spoke, I remember that the four other vice admirals sent were Sakazuki, Tensei, Tokakik, and Baird. And we were aware from the start that all of them are well-known believers of absolute justice. Tell me, what did you see in Ahara? Ahara? Kuzan, upon hearing my words, initially attempted to keep his lazy facade on. However, such an attempt was futile, and eventually, he revealed a frown filled with anguish and helplessness. Raising his head up and dazing off into the air, Kuzan finally opened his mouth, smiles. I saw the world government's lapdogs woofing, just as their owner ordered, blasting away the entire island based on the information relayed from the Civil Poles. Placing his hand on his forehead, Kuzan continued, and I asked myself, what would have happened if the civilians were present on the island? Would the world government have decided to leave them out? After all, knowledge is invisible, and the only way to ensure that knowledge remains secret is to wipe out all. He sighed. Seeming mentally strained, he shook his head. I was frightened that such a thought made its way into my mind. Marine's notion of justice is questionable, Smoker. It's corrosive, and I can't help but feel that there is something wrong about it. Yes, I knew that it was flawed from the start but not to this extent. Leaning back, I reminisced over the Ahara incident, the work that I put myself through to reduce the casualties as much as possible, the struggles that I made, and the subpar outcome that came at the end all of them came back to me. I think the same as well, agreeing with Kuzan's words. I stated, and that's why we can't afford ourselves to stay lazy, you know. Standing up from my seat, I walked over to where the curtains lied and opened them. The light shone through the window into this gloomy room. We are at the great age of pirates. Pirates have been thriving endlessly, and marines have been facing a shortage of forces every day. In addition, talk about the justice, where the celestial dragon's atrocious crimes are gone ignored while a helpless child of a pirate gets mercilessly slaughtered how ridiculous. Turning to Kuzan, I spoke softly, and that's why you must to get back to the sea. Kuzan didn't meet his eyes with me. I know that you tried your hardest. Sailing from an island to island, catching all the pirates whom we've come across I've been seeing your hard works by your side. Kuzan was amazing, freezing all his enemies in ice, and not letting a single one escape from his sight and harm the innocents. Though his fruit ability was cold, his possessed a heart warmer than anyone else. You may feel exhausted, you may have thought that your hard works are futile, and that as long as the world government's reign continues, nothing will change. But so what? Grinning at the man who stared at me in wonder, I said, have you forgotten those smiles that people made? Kuzan's eyes widened, raising his head up, he met his eyes with mine. Then, the corners of his lips unconsciously curled up, forming a smile of his own. Kuzan, surprised by his own reaction, touched his lips with his hand. Kuzan was not just a character from manga. Having worked under him for some time, he was my friend someone whom I knew I could entrust my back to. You must not run away, Kuzan-san. We saw the dark sides of the marine, of how inefficient our system currently is due to the world government's involvement. So I spoke with sincerity, hoping that this man may change for the better. At times like this, we must work harder. We must get stronger. If there is a purpose in one's life, it's to struggle until one's very end, and not to laze around in despair. Even if you may get killed like Victorious did, I'm not afraid of death. Clenching my right hand, I said with conviction, if there is one thing that I fear, it's to live a worthless life. I wonder if I was doing it right. But I think I saw the light in Kuzan's eyes. Mount Kalubo, East Blue it was early in the morning, where the wild animals were seen bustling through the lively forest. Wahaha well, ha ha loud laughter boomed forth as the brawny man with spiky black grey hair, Monkey D. Garp, read the newspaper in his hands. Ugh, please keep yourself quiet. Garp sang from the back, a tired looking woman with curly, orange colored hair and an obese body form, shouted in a plea, the baby think about the baby. We just managed to get him asleep five minutes ago. 
You know Garp, ignoring her words, brought the newspaper right under her nose. Oh haha look at this, Dayden. My pupil's on the cover page oh okay, I get it. So will you calm down now Dayden? I'm heading out now. Garp, grinning excitedly, placed the newspaper into his pocket while walking out, and as per our agreement, I'll be leaving Ace in your care. Make sure that by the time I return, Ace grows up as a child who dreams of becoming a marine, why yes, for sure. I climbed and climbed, though my hands were sprained and bloodied. The air was freezing cold, such that the blood frozen served as the clot. I wished to stop, but I couldn't for a huge creature that lives on that cliff was chasing after me. March 1st. The storm settled down, and the momentary peace arrived. As another day began, here I was, sitting next to Zephyr with a smirk as I spectated the training session of my fellow colleagues. Continue. Zephyr, who was wearing glasses, said seriously as he jotted down the notes. I could have used my fruit ability to escape of course. However, Gut Sensei was watching me from the sky, and if I were to use my power even once, there would have been a fist of love more terrifying than the assault by my pursuer. Fist of love noted, and most importantly, there wasn't a single word of encouragement. Back then, Gut Sensei laughed at my misery, something that fueled me to see the end of that hellish training. I chuckled while closing my eyes, reminiscing over my past, and when I finally reached the top, guess what happened? What? Guess, Zephyr-san. Zephyr, raising his head up to meet my eyes, said, just, say it, kiddo. Sighing, I stated cockily, Gut Sensei punched me back to the bottom, and I had to climb up again. How are you alive? Zephyr, gazing at me in disbelief, muttered. Looking back down at his note, he angrily ripped all pages apart. If I were to do that to my own disciples, they'd die. Opening my eyes back up, I then saw that my colleagues except for Dalmatian and Cancer, those who were supposed to be undergoing the training, were staring at the two of us. Two among them, Shu and Akahand, cowed out at Zephyr with tears of joy. Thank you for being a generous instructor, Zephyr Sensei. Climb up the cliff twice. Maynard, on the other hand, grinned with fiery eyes, I will do it thrice then. What a dramatic means of committing suicide. Hina Amaz, Bastille amazed Dara. Hina looked at Bastille, who was picking his nose under his metal mask with a blank expression. Zephyr Sensei Dash. Then, a voice was heard from the back. Turning around, I saw Dol, walking casually with three new faces behind her, new recruits have arrived. I found myself in amusement upon sighting those three. Of course, joining Zephyr's training program was a proof of one's exceptional status, but still, how is it possible that I recognize all of them? One was a young girl with dark blue hair and brown colored eyes, who immediately bowed in a strict manner. Pleased to meet all of you, Instructor Zephyr and Seniors. My name is Ain, and I hope not to disappoint. Another one was a very tall guy, even taller than Bastille, with a wild pink hair, slanted eyes, and very long arms. He then performed an odd dance along with a laugh-evoking facial expression all of a sudden, before stating seriously, My name is Bins. Pleased to meet you. His words and body gestures are so unmatching I thought with a sweat drop. And the final one with a thick mustache under his nose, said as stood in absolute seriousness, I'm Daddy Masterson. Dol, stopping next to me, looked at the three of them with a satisfied smile. This year's recruits don't seem as troubling as the last year's. Last year, I raised my eyebrow, before draping my arm around Dol's shoulder with a grin. Or, oh, come on Ensign Dol, you know that you love us. Dol simply huffed while crossing her arms and turning her head away, much to my amusement. Welcome to the training camp, the three of you. Zephyr, taking off his glasses and putting on the sunglasses instead, then asked, can any of you climb up a cliff barehanded? Sorry. As a marine captain, there are three options in which you can choose from. After the training session was over for my friends, I was walking down the street along with Hina. Hina explained to me knowingly, first option is to continue what you are doing which is to be under the command of a marine officer with a superior rank. This option is probably the easiest and safest option to choose from, for you are burdened with the least possible amount of responsibility. What else is there? Second option is to become the commander of a marine branch in one of the four blues, Hina said in a monotone. If you wish to fight with paper works more than you do with the actual criminals, then go ahead. I frowned in disgust, that surely does sound fun. And the third option, Captain Smoker, Hina then looked at me knowingly, is to lead your own division and sail around the area you are tasked with. Stopping my track, I turned to Hina with a smile. Well, there's my choice. Hina shook her head with a chuckle, just as Hina thought, you haven't changed at all. Is that meant to be a praise or an insult? Oh, so you are, to some extent, aware of how troubling you are. Hina shocked. I'll take that as a praise. Leading your own division, I see. Robin, placing her hand on her chin, mumbled thoughtfully and you get to choose who's going to be on your ship. Unless higher-ups get themselves involved, that seems to be the case. Tapping my fingers on the table, I hummed, but judging by how well government tends to implement eyes here and there, I have no doubt that they will do something with me as well, especially since I'm quite a well-known figure by now. Moving my eyes to meet hers, I then asked, how's your adjustment going? Not too bad, I suppose. Recently, Robin was placed within the huge training camp of average marine recruits. Having begun her own set of training routine, she was slowly gaining strength and confidence. However, especially since I heard the option of leading my own division smoker, my thought came to a halt as Robin spoke to me. 
I think it may be better if I were to remain here for now, and gain appropriate foundation. Adjusting her fashion glasses, she stated, there were no eyes of suspicion whatsoever. And after giving some thoughts, I disclosed my fruit ability to others, my eyes widened in surprise. However, knowing that Robin is a rational individual, I remained silent and continued listening, though not in a precise manner. I explained my devil fruit as arm arm fruit being able to grow arms on my own body. Though devil fruit encyclopedia exists, there still are many unidentified fruits in this world. No one was able to see through my lie. Hum. Perhaps I wasn't thinking thoroughly, but I found no glaring fault in her actions. Thanks to Robin showing her status as the devil fruit user, she will be excluded from the set of trainings that involve swimming. Furthermore, a mere trainee with a fruit that seems as weak as arm arm fruit, I doubted that any superior will even bother to pay in attention to her. All right? If you're confident in what you're doing then go ahead. It's your life and your freedom, after all. Smiling in approval, I then said, and if possible, make some friends too, okay? Robin squinted her eyes at me. What are you, my father? Oh yeah, I'm your sugar daddy. Robin, acting as if creeped out, jokingly stood up and moved away from me. Then, he <laughs> he, she laughed all of a sudden as if finding her own act funny. I was left dumbfounded, unable to comprehend this strange girl. What's with your humor code? I couldn't help but mutter, March 2nd. Feeling itchy, I ran around the entire Marineford for 12 hours straight. I don't know how many laps I completed, but I definitely felt refreshed after. March 3rd, out of curiosity, I touched a new batch of sea stones that were imported from who knows where. Flopped to the ground immediately, with no strength to do anything whatsoever. This is definitely something to watch out for. March 4th. Tried using Shusui. Tried slicing the wood trunk, but smashed it into pieces instead. Gion told me that I am hopeless in this department, and that the sword is crying. Not gonna lie, I had to suppress my urge to laugh after she said that. I mean, weapon's a weapon, and nothing more, right? March 5th. Had a spar with Gion using the wooden swords. She cut through mine upon the first clash but my broken sword then smashed hers into shreds. It's decided, I'm going to use Shusui like a baseball bat. 6th, 7th, 8th, it was quite a long rest in the Marineford. And today, the date was March 13th. Hold on. Sitting in my room, I realized as I looked at the calendar isn't tomorrow my birthday. Tomorrow, on March 14th, I will turn 14 in terms of age. It's already been quite a while since I arrived at this world. Huh. Initially, I was confused. Then, I was filled with fear of the unknown, not knowing what to do. Since the beginning, I surely have come a long way, and managed to reach the rank of Captain The rank, that the cannon smoker had at the year 1522, which is 20 years from now. There was still a long way to go, but still, I couldn't help but be filled with the sense of accomplishment boom. The door of my room broke open all of a sudden, waking me up from my thought. Then, a familiar man revealed himself with the wide grin that he always has. Egup Sensei I exclaimed in a pleasant surprise. Not having expected my teacher to return so soon. Didn't you say that you'll be away for two years, huh? Missed me, brat. Grabbing me by the back of my shirt, Gup placed me on his shoulder and opened the window, before jumping out of my room. Boom. He casually landed on the street causing the surprised people to take a step back. Vice Admiral Gup. He's finally back. Huh? Where have he gone off to anyway? Marine hero, at last. So many things happen to us in these few months, and with his presence everything will get better. Ignoring the people's comments, Gart then pushed his feet against the ground propelling the two of us to one small boat that lied on the dock. Wait. I looked at Gart in realization, are we leaving Marineford? Wahahaha what do you mean leave? I didn't even tell Sengoku that I'm coming. Gart laughed loudly. Everything was so sudden. This teacher of mine, coming here in an abrupt manner, was now abducting me exactly a day before my birthday. Wahahaha and I found myself laughing along with him, now that's my sensei bonk. Ah, what the hell, old man? Don't steal my unique laugh, you snotty brat from afar, a scream was heard. Garp, landing on the small boat, Garp quickly handed me the rose and said, now row, smoker, we gotta get out of here before Sengoku comes. Bolhaha rolling my shoulders, I asked to where. Garp stopped his laugh, then, picking his nose, he shrugged, I don't know, wanna go to the Fishman Island? Oh, I grinned, sounds like a good idea, and there began yet another round of training for me. Why did you die Roger? Within the deepest floor of Impel Down, the greatest prison to ever exist, there lied one man whose feet were shackled. Bloodied from continuous torments, his entire body was drenched in blood. Ridiculous all of you selfish idiots out there. Looking for treasure will only get in the way. It was a mere whisper. At first glance, it may seem like nothing but a man's way to escape from this hellish experience of being shackled. But once oneself looks for the second time, he or she would realize. This man, Golden Lion Shiki who spread his name wide as the rival of Gold D. Roger the Pirate King, and Edward Newgate the White Beard was speaking with a terrifying conviction. A new age. Shiki then roared, expressing his disgust at the idea, Pirates aren't the idiotic treasure seekers pirates we rule the seas. The way this man spoke seemed strange, for it lacked the despair that was engraved within each and every single prisoner. It was as if this man knew he'd escape someday. Just you wait. Someday I'll make all of you see that. A few months after, on August 1502, 
Golden Lion Shiki becomes known as the sole man who broke through the world's worst prison. However, at the same time, Vice Admiral Akiji chasing after Shiki relentlessly, locates and wipes out his entire crew on the island of Merview. Shiki runs away miserably with his sword legs, while holding his severed left arm. Two years later, October 10th, 1504 Marineford Silence. With all the present Marines standing strictly, they gazed up at the stand in front of them, where Fleet Admiral Sengoku stood with a solemn demeanor. Dol, Bastille, Dalmatian, Cancer, Maynard, and surprisingly, Masters and the six of them stood among the Marine officers, with the justice coats of their own draped around them. Among the three admirals, Sidahebi, Heronazumi, and Akena, only Sidahebi was present, standing with an impassive expression on his face. At a far distance away, the civilians too spectated the scene with nervousness, wondering just what is it that caused Marineford to fall into silence. Looking around those below, Sengoku finally opened his mouth with a solemn expression, this year may possibly be the worst year there ever was since the start of the scum's era. Few Marines' hands clenched helplessly. Big Mom and Kaidu's deeds have gotten out of control. Ignoring a presence, they plundered and killed every single person that they've come across, expanding their influence and asserting their dominance in the new world. And the ones who have been restricting their malicious acts weren't us but Whitebird Edward Newgate and his pirate crew. Sengoku gritted his teeth with evident rage, and that's not all. The so-called super rookies traveling from the reverse mountain no marine has managed to capture one. Not even one, what is the purpose of marine's existence? Then, his words were full of heat. The marines, getting angry from the speech, adapted to the same, rage-filled eyes that Sengoku currently had. Then, Sengoku, abruptly switching into nothing but a cold seriousness, declared, soon a disaster will arise. And the emanating heat within the atmosphere disappeared. The cloud, covering the entirety of Marineford plot, seemed a little heavy at the current moment. Sir Crocodile, Heavenly Demon Don Quixote Do Flamingo, Hellblaze Diego, Red Hair Shanks, and Marine Hunter Dracul Mihic. From what we can deduce, the five rookies will eventually meet at Sabaudi Archipelago, the world government's area of interest. Big Mom and Kaidu showed their interest in this topic as well, advancing to the Red Line in an attempt to stabilize their forces by recruitment. And finally, Sengoku paused. His face darkened, finding it hard to speak the next set of words. Nonetheless, he continued, the mass massacre at the island of Nextra, done by none other than Demon Air Douglas Bullet. Douglas Bullet. He was previously a member of Pirate King's crew. And recently, Marine received the information that based on his current feats, Bullet he awakened his devil fruit. But no more. Sengoku whispered, the finale of this year shall not go to the hands of the pirates. We shall show to the world of what it means to disrupt the justice governed by the marine. Sengoku raised his hand and spoke triumphantly. Henceforth, I, as the fleet admiral, declare a war against the pirates to all marines. Within the paradise, the first half of the Grand Line, there sat one summer island known to have a great view. Lying on top of a sun with sunglasses over his eyes, Garp, holding the dial of Den Den Mushi, spoke into it seriously. Things really are getting out of hand recently, eh, Sengoku? I know already. No need to speak around. Garp, standing up with seriousness, stated, I'll be there in two days. The call has come to an end, and Garp, placing the Den Den Mushi down, turned his eyes at the beach in front of him where one white-haired man was seen lifting up a gigantic boulder on his back. Smoker, Garp calling out to the man, Smoker, said while buttoning up his shirt, I'm going to be away for a while. Smoker, throwing the boulder on the side with one hand, asked casually, for what cause? Garp momentarily closed his eyes. Then, opening them back up, he replied grimly, Douglas Bullet. The demon air I see, Smoker narrowed his eyes, is he really such a big deal, for the two of you to head together? Hey, it's because we must succeed in this operation, that we are heading there ourselves. Garp tapped his forehead with a grin. Sengoku values reputation, which is the key aspect in achieving his reigning justice. This year around, Marine lost far too many. Without a single notable feat, this year's Marine will be remembered as the weak and incapable force, growing the doubt within people's hearts. Smoker frowned and discussed politics as always. I swear, the seat of Fleet Admiral is nothing but torture. Well ha ha, agreed. Garp then gazed at Smoker knowingly. But that's your future, Smoker. Please, old man. Smoker shook his head, don't jinx me like that. Garp stared at his sole disciple. For the past two years, Smoker has grown taller, now standing at a height of approximately 190 centimeters. His physique was more toned and refined, and having turned 16 in terms of age, the previously visible childish features were nowhere to be found. Welp, seems like a vacation has come to an end. Huh. Garp, grinning, draped the justice coat around him. Smoker looked up at the sky, wiping the sweat off of his face, while forming a subtle smile. Two years passed already. I thought as I watched the cloud above gently floating by, and many things happened. Garp Sensei and I, after our escape from Marine for two years ago, sailed aimlessly, for my teacher forgot to bring a pose for our navigation. At one point, that small boat sank, and we traveled by sky through the use of my fruit ability. And here we were, living two years on this uninhabited island. Though the issue lied in the fact that none of us signed up for the news coup delivery service, and remained oblivious to the outside situation, Gut Sensei recently discovered a Den Den Mushi in the wild, and finally contacted the headquarter. That was the first time I heard Sengoku swearing. But the question is, squinting my eyes at my teacher, 
I muttered, how are you going to reach Marineford without any navigation tool? We literally got ourselves lost two years ago. Well, Gut Sensei, hearing my words, was about to answer with a confident demeanor. But I quickly interrupted, oh, no need to answer. You'll probably travel aimlessly. Go to the first island you find, and ask them where the Marineford is, boom. Don't interrupt elders when they talk, brat. Where's your respect? Even after the training, Gut Sensei's fist still hurt, I thought with my head impaled in the sand. A day passed. Gut Sensei left, and I, still remaining on the island with Den Den Mushi as my sole companion, was currently receiving the call. Yes, I can. So tone down your voice, I replied casually. I couldn't conceal my smile upon hearing the familiar name. It seems that she, within the two years, managed to climb all the way up there as expected from the future admiral candidate. She own, Harvard, red hair pirates. I stopped. Shanks, of all possibilities, it wasn't that I was afraid. Rather, it was that I didn't view him as a threat in comparison to other notorious pirates, especially Crocodile and Doflamingo. However, at the same time, Joan against Shanks, there existed an uncertainty. Is this supposed to happen? If this event was a part of canon, then without a doubt, Joan would live. However, she was someone who's been with me for a long period of time. Someone who can be considered acting out of canon. If so, I cannot assure her safety, especially since I knew how capable Red Hair Shanks is. ECH, the situation has become annoying. In the end, I answered tell her to pick me up. October 17th, 1504 Commodore Joan. The island has come in sight. From aboard the marine ship that sailed across the sea that was far too calm. One marine stated strictly to a female marine officer with justice coat on her shoulders. She own. She, with her sword compira sheathed by her waist, stared at the front where the tiny figure of one island appeared in her sight. So that's where Smoke has been staying. Nearby, another female marine officer with short, dark colored hair. Dolt, muttered to herself while leaning on the rail, in a freaking calm belt of all possibilities. No wonder we couldn't find him until now. Smoker, a, the blonde marine officer crossing his arms with a cigarette in his mouth cancer, exclaimed, it's been a long time since I saw him. But one thing is for sure, grinning with a hand on his chin, cancer then said, I'm more handsome than him. And just as annoying, Dol said while rolling her eyes. Enough chit-chatting. Then, Joan spoke up as she turned her eyes to the marine soldier on her side, turned the wheel. We're heading to Koto. Marine soldier, confused by the sudden change, asked, what of Captain Smoker, Commodore Joan? Dol and Cancer 2 turned their eyes at Joan in confusion. Joan, without answering, simply turned her eyes above at the crow's nest. Following her gaze, the others two looked above, and, long time no see, all of you, found Smoker standing casually, with a cigarette in his hand. Ha! Huh. Cancer's eyes widened upon sighting the cigarette. His hand immediately reached his lips, and found that the cigarette that he's been biting onto was gone. Oi, Smoker, Joan, looking at grinning Smoker in annoyance, a marine cried from the crow's nest with the binocular in front of his eyes. Joan, who stood at the front of the ship with her arms crossed, sent out an order, all marines prepare to engage at any moment. Yes, ma'am. The marines busily moved back and forth, loading the cannons and taking out the firearms. Their eyes held sliver of nervousness, knowing that the recently rising red hair pirates, though are considered to be the weakest among the seven rookies, are not to be underestimated. Hey, be careful with that cannon. Are you trying to kill us all? Dol was found to be overseeing the preparation, supporting Joan by the side. Damn it. Cancer and I, on the other hand, sat at the back, lazying around. Cancer, cursing in boredom, took out a cigarette from his pocket. Then, as he placed its tip in his mouth, ever heard of secondhand smoke. I slapped his cheek, such that he spat out the cigarette with his eyes popped out in shock. E-G-A-H-H-H. -H -H. He, holding his swollen cheek, looked at me angrily. Let me smoke for once, fucking non-smoking smoker cancer, wishing to spread cancer to others. I frown back at him, try smoking again, and see what happens, blondie. Smoker and cancer. Though the names seemed to pair well together, cancer and I surely weren't. Or, are you picking a fight with me? Cancer, seething in anger, bumped his head against mine. If you think I'm the same as Maynard, then you're terribly mistaken, bam. At the next moment, Cancer was found to be kissing the deck with a huge lump on his head. Behind his fallen form stood Joan, whose right fist was outstretched. She then lowered her right arm and barked at the two of us. The ship already landed. What are you two doing here, lazying around when everyone else moved out already? Cancer, immediately standing up with the lump on his head still intact, flashed his teeth. I'm terribly sorry for my error, Mademoiselle Joan. It's Commodore Joan, Ensign Cancer. Why yes, Commodore Joan. Cancer's body straightened up, frightened by Joan's sense of seriousness. Spectating Cancer's antics, I sweat dropped. Hey Captain, do you remember that so-called red hair two days ago? In a bar where the bartender was sweating profusely from fear, numerous men were seen to have gathered around. Drinking and eating to their desire, they laughed boisterously and talked among themselves. At the front, one huge man sat with his legs crossed. While holding a beer mug, the man snorted upon hearing a question from one of his underlings. Don't even bring out the name of that worthless man. Gulping the entire glass down, the man slammed it on the table, red hair shanks, one of the seven rookies. 
holding the bounty of 200 million Beely on his head. I was exhilarated upon coming to sight such a pirate here. Grabbing an empty bottle nearby, the man swung it wildly. This is what I did to that man with a straw hat. I literally slammed the bottle down at his head and drenched him from the top to the bottom with the alcohol. And do you know what he did? One subordinate of the man cackled. You know that all of us were present during that day. Grinning in amusement, the man then laughed, ha 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 ha. He did absolutely nothing he sat still, not fighting back like a man with balls, and simply said, Oh, at least my hat didn't get wet. Ha 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 ha, to think I was excited to fight a coward like him. How ridiculous, ha 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 ha, everyone burst out in a laughter upon the man's statement. One among them then asked, Hey, Captain, does this mean that you are one of the seven rookies now? I mean, that technically counts as a win, right? The man raised his head up arrogantly. Hey, you're right indeed. I, Suka the 300 kilograms, am more than fit enough to compete with those world-class pirates. So Shanks left already, huh? Well, I'd do the same if a pig like this continuously oinks around. Then, a casual voice suddenly intruded. Huh? Who said that? Perking up with a frown on his face, Suka growled. Everyone looked around, afraid of becoming the victim of their captain's wrath, and eventually found M.M. Wow, this is pretty good. The white-haired man with a justice coat around his shoulders, Smoker, munching away the entire serving of food in the middle of the table. Then, turning around, Smoker said, Hey, can I order another serving of this? These guys are paying, of course. Of course, not all pirates barked at Smoker, to which he ignored. A marine. Suka, muttered, what the hell is a marine doing here? Finishing an entire dish, Smoker then grabbed a bottle of beer that hasn't been opened yet, before gulping down the entire thing in one go. Hey then, Smoker frowned, this tastes like water. You call this crap a beer? Rahahaha, agreed. From the other side of the bar, another masculine voice was heard, food is great, but drink is worse than my urine. In conclusion, this bar is ass. Smoker's eyes widened. Huh, you tasted your own urine before. Rahahaha, now that's funny, isn't it oi? Suka, angered by Smoker's complete negligence of his presence, snarled in a low tone. Who do you think you are? All pirates of Tsuka's crew stood up from their seats. Taking out their guns, they aimed them at Smoker's head, ready to shoot at any time. Huh, finally, a proper food. Smoker, sighing in content, then turned back. Is the food not ready yet? This bastard one of the pirates gritted his teeth. He's completely ignoring us. How foolish. Don't you know who I am? Suka, leaning down on the sitting Smoker, said, I'm Suka Thud. Suka stopped his words as one of his crew members fell to the ground all of a sudden, with his eyes whitened out. What? Thud thud thud. One by one, his crew members fell and in no time, the entirety of his crew was on the ground, blackened out. Do you know why Red Hair didn't fight you? Smoker, not even bothering to look at the huge man towering over him, remarked, it's because you're worthless. At that moment, Suka's eyes widened. For some reason, Kekki Kerg, he found himself unable to breathe. Holding his neck and choking, thud. The huge man passed out without a chance to resist. Either food is out. And at the same time, the bartender quickly placed down the freshly made meal on the table before quickly leaving. Oh, disregarding the fallen pirates around him, Smoker resumed eating. And as he did so, one man walked over from the other side of the room and sat in front of Smoker. Rahaha, that was a nice show there. And who may you be? Looking up at the grinning man, Smoker, with his mouth puffed up due to the food, asked. Said man, leaning his cheek on the hand supported by the elbow on the table, grinned. I go by the name Aramaki. I'm currently a botanist, musician, and bounty hunter. Aramaki. Chewing down the food, I gazed at the man carefully. Dark, messy hair with green hue. Thick lips, sharp nose, and a height taller than me. There was no doubt. So this is the future green bull, Raikuju. This surely was an unexpected encounter. I saw you folks running busy on the outside. Aramaki, pointing his thumb at the door, then said knowingly, You're looking for red hair, aren't you? I shrugged, and he isn't here. End of the story. Indeed, he isn't here. However, that doesn't mean the chance is gone for you. Aramaki, tapping his forehead, then stated, I know where the red hair pirates are heading to. As I focus on finishing up the last bit of food, Aramaki said, and I am willing to give you the information, if you are to accept this one request of mine. Which is, I asked out of curiosity. Aramaki, grinning in excitement, then bumped his fists together, defeat me, Rahaha. Simple, isn't it yawning? I stood up from the seat and looked at the bartender, who stood still without even making a breathing sound. Then, pointing down, I said, I'll pay with this guy's bounty. Soon, when the marines come in, tell them that you caught these pirates. Subsequently, I proceeded to head out while ignoring Aramaki. Hey, Aramaki looked at me in stupefaction and as I exited the bar, quickly followed out. Don't you want to fight as well? Don't you feel that burning desire to test your strength? Isn't that right, White Hunter stopping on my track? I turn around, White Hunter. Indeed, White Hunter smoker. Aramaki shouted excitedly, previously called White Menace among the pirates as a sign of mockery, due to targeting only the small fish. Then, one day, bam. You single-handedly defeated the infamous nightmare, Gecko Moria, much to their horror. Rahahaha. I'm your fan, you know. Ho! All of a sudden, Aramaki seemed likable. Smoker. Then, a feminine voice boomed out from the back. Without turning around, I immediately knew that the voice belonged to none other than Dole. 
Who's that guy with you? Turning around, I grinned at Doll. He's swoosh. I tilted my head to dodge a fist that suddenly came in punching. Fight me, Smoker Aramaki, my fan. What? Swoosh. Bending my torso sideway, I dodged another punch that came from the back. Doll, sweat dropping at the comedic scene that involved Aramaki and me, asked, Then why is he attacking you? He, swoosh. Smoker calmed down a little, buddy. Turning around, I slammed a punch of my own to the taller man's abdomen. Boom. Aramaki, choking from the impact, was sent flying all the way to the tree that lied at far distance away. What's going on? Hearing the commotion, all marines quickly gathered. Joan, stopping in front of me, asked in anticipation, Did you find red hair? Pointing at the bar, I replied with a chuckle, Nope. I did find 300 kilograms however. What's that even Joan dead? panned at me. At the same time, as the dust cleared, Ralahaha. You've exceeded my expectation, smoker. Lash get off of me, you stinky man. Aramaki was found sitting on top of Cancer, whose hand was desperately holding onto a cigarette. Standing back up, much to Cancer's relief, Aramaki then charged in at me once again. But I'm not done yet. Jion and Dol looked at me questioningly. Boom. Throwing my fist back, which smashed onto Aramaki's face at the perfect timing. I explained at the two with an underlying amusement, apparently, this man knows where Red Hair is heading to, and he wants me to fight him in return for giving that piece of info. Jion and Dol looked at each other for a moment, before turning their heads back at me and saying at the same time, do it. I replied with a chuckle, and I'm doing just that right now, and I, boom, dodging Aramaki's incoming kick. I then grabbed his outstretched leg and slammed his body down, creating spiderweb-like cracks on the ground. The marine soldiers, who were spectating at the back, had their jaws agape in shock. Boom. Jion couldn't believe her eyes. Mad Bull Aramaki. Though he has only started his career as a bounty hunter a year ago. His feet though she didn't admit she was aware of the bounty hunter's identity at first glance. The brash act of going to Jaya. The well-known hub of the pirates. And catching every criminal there single-handedly without a doubt. This man's strength isn't something that can be ignored. Aramaki wasn't someone whom the current Joan could assure a victory in an all-out duel. And yet, he in front of her eyes was being pummeled by Smoker without a single chance of retaliation. Just how far have you gone, Smoker? Joan found herself amazed two years ago. You advance all the way from chore boy to captain, shocking the entire organization. Within two years, I thought I caught up to you, working my hardest to earn this rank. But it turns out that a gap only became wider. And upon this thought, Joan, as a strong woman, found a smile on her face, TCH, enough of being amazed. Guess I'll have to train harder then. Boom. Just when Joan thought so, Aramaki was sent flying high up in the air, with Smoker's left fist outstretched upward. Rahahaha. So this is the White Hunter, I see. Aramaki, laughing as his body was covered with multiple bruises, didn't exhibit any sign of yielding. Then, he began to descend at Smoker, forget winning. All I want to do now, is to land a single blow to you. Aramaki opened his palm. As he was falling, he aimed his palm at Smoker, who stood without moving a single step. Still going? Huh? Smoker rolled his shoulder while grinning. Now that's the spirit. Then, Smoker leaped from his spot toward the falling Aramaki. At the same time, morning wood. A huge beam of wood suddenly shot out of Aramaki's palm toward the ascending Smoker. He already had forest forest fruit during this time around. Boom. However, from a single blow, the wooden beam shattered into pieces, and Aramaki found the same fist on his chest once again, before his vision abruptly shifted. In an instant, gone was the sky, and he was now impaled in the ground. Smoker, landing back on the ground, spoke with interest, so you two ate a devil fruit. Huh. Cough. I wanted to try my chance without using it. But hey, this Aramaki admits it's my complete loss. Within the huge hole that was created by Smoker's punch, Aramaki lied with his eyes half-lidded in exhaustion. His entire face was swollen, and through the ripped sections of his garments, the painful-looking bruises could be seen. Nonetheless, the man grinned, Rahahaha, it's the first time I've been beaten up like this, I don't even have enough strength left in me to move. Then Dol spoke up with expectation, speak the whereabouts of red hair, that was the deal. Aramaki, ignoring Dol's words, then sat up from his spot, as expected of the White Hunter. Hey, don't ignore me. I admire your strength, Captain Smoker. Hey, Rahahaha. Coming here really was a great decision. Fucking hell are you deaf doll. Seething in rage was currently being held by my arms. H-N-N-N-N-G-G-G let me go. Smoker, what's with this sudden anger, doll? Relax. I, on the other hand, watching as Aramaki's eyes sparkled like that of a child's, found myself smirking. Doll, seeing this, looked at me with a look that seemed to convey the following message, really. Meanwhile, Cancer inquired Aramaki with squinted eyes. By the way, didn't you say that you don't even have the strength to move? So how did you manage to sit up like that? Oh, oops. Aramaki, forming O shape with his mouth, lied back down, earning sweat drops from the marine soldiers all around. The reason I've come to this island in the first place was to catch that red hair shanks for my own. Of course, I lost Rahaha. But before red hair left, I managed to see Aramaki, now wearing the standard marine costume, and having been treated with the bandages underneath, explained with his arms crossed the eternal pose in his hands. And I tell you, 
I saw very clearly, that eternal pose was the one for the island of Banaro. Wait, wait, hold on. Cancer, holding his hands up, asked, why is this dude wearing marine attire? Cancer looked at Dole. Dole looked at me. I shrugged, he said he wants to become my underling, so I'll have it. What else can it be? Yes, yes, yes. If I want to become strong, I must learn from the best Rahaha. Dole then turned to Joan who stated stoically with her arms crossed, Mad Bull is a strong combatant, and his background has been cleared by the Marine Bureau of Investigation a year ago. If he wishes to join, there is no reason for us to reject. Cancer, groaned, great, another weirdo, says the weirdo, said Dolt, rendering Cancer heartbroken by the beauty's words. The blonde fell to the ground and sulked, Rahahaha, what's with this simp? To which Aramaki laughed in mockery. Cancer grew a tick mark on his forehead, you wanna have a go? Ha, huh, Aramaki snorted, bring it on, and thus began the childish fight between two grown-up men. Anyway, back to the topic. So Eternal Pose and Banaro, ignoring two men on the side, Joan hummed in a thoughtful manner before turning her eyes and asking me, what do you think? Pirates travel by the log pose. In the first half, their destination is set, and we, using that to our advantage, usually located our target pirates. Leaning my back against the rail of the ship, I deduced the purchase of Eternal Pose means one thing. The red hair pirates managed to foresee the huge scaled attack of the marine and change their route to evade it. Then Banner Doll exclaimed with certainty is where the red hair pirates currently are. We don't know that. I refuted Doll's claim in a composed manner. But that's the best guess that we currently have. Whether it's true or not, my body's feeling itchy. Cancer, now standing with a swollen cheek, said with yet another cigarette in his mouth, much to my bewilderment, let's go right away and beat up that red hair sanks or something. Rahaha. You, beat up red hair, Aramaki, whose nose was bleeding, laughed in response to Cancer's words, that's a nice joke there. I tell you, you're going to last only 10 seconds at max against that man. So you want to get beaten up again? Cancer growled before bumping his forehead against Aramaki who maintained his grin, fucking chore boy, let me show you a place. The second round began, causing the marine soldiers to quickly retreat from their side of the deck. A Joan, facepaming with visible fatigue, groaned, this is far too out of control for my liking. Watching the green man and yellow man having a comedic feud, I couldn't help but think, our greens and yellows, destined to fight each other. Unknown location bam, a hand slammed onto the wooden table. Such a hand belonged to a muscular man with long black hair tied into a ponytail. Ben Beckman, the vice captain of the red hair pirates. Basically, this is what's happening. Beckman, pausing to puff out smoke, continued with the other members of the red hair pirates listening to him. For around a month or so, the marine has been awfully quiet after consecutive failures for the whole year. This suggests that they are preparing for something something big enough to change the current view of the civilians MMHMM. Niam Niam, so good as always dash, Beckman deadpanned at one obese man standing nearby. Lucky Roo, Lucky Roo was busy munching on a big piece of cooked meat, but the noise he generated was disturbing enough for Beckman. Bam, oi, Roo, grow some sense, you fatso. Another member of Red Hair Pirates, slammed the back of Lucky Roo's head causing the obese man to kiss the deck as a result. Ha 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 ha, the rest of the pirates laughed at the state Lucky Roo's been reduced to, pff ha 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 my bad. Lucky Roo too laughed finding this situation funny. All of you, shut up and listen, Beckman barked at the crew, causing them to go silent. He then looked at the captain of the crew, who was busy wiping the tears off of his still smiling face, and you, Shanks, show some dignity as the captain to haha. -ha. Come on, Beckman. Shanks winked. You know that I'm not some overgrown ass like that. Ha 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 ha. Shut up. Beckman shouted while slamming his fist on the table, shutting everyone down. Taking in a deep breath to calm himself down. He then continued, ha. Huh. Anyway, based on this notion, I came to believe that a change from the normal course won't hurt. And agreeing to this idea, our goofy captain here decided that we head to China for the purpose of riding the knock-up stream to Sky Island. Beckman then lifted up the eternal pose that red banner row and shook it together everyone's eyes on it and this. We purposely exposed it to the bounty hunter we've come across, the Mad Bull. Though I can't be sure if he will spread this fake information with others, or be reckless enough to travel there himself, on the island of Banaro. There currently is, Beckman pointed at the wooden wall behind him, where a couple of bounty posters were attached. In the middle, there lied one bounty poster that read, Hellflame Diego. Wanted dead or alive? 448 million, Billy. The second highest bounty holder won among the seven rookies, after Martini Hook in the New World. In a large room that consisted of huge windows and checkered tiles on the floor, five elderly looking men made themselves comfortable. Going by the title of Five Elders or Gorosei, these five men were the leading figures of the world government. And this room they currently dwelled within was a part of Pangia Castle, the iconic building that stood in the middle of the Holy Land, Mary Geolice. In the center, there lied one round table with an exquisite design latched on it. Atop of it, there sat one Den Den Mushy which had its eyes open. Then, the Den Den Mushy spoke, one among the five elders asked after taking a sip of tea, how is the situation going? The voice from Den Den Mushy paused momentarily, before continuing, give us the specifics. Hum, 
An elder wearing white attire, which contrasts with the black suit that the rest of them were wearing, muttered, so Sengoku did expend most of the marine force this time around. It is only natural. Another elder stated, his ideal lies on the reigning justice. And us, as the ones who rule above all, are the absolute justice in the eyes of that man. The voice remarked with a chuckle, watch your mouth, agent. We ordered nothing, and everything was based on Sengoku's own decision. The world government, having been wary of marine's abrupt growth force within the last three years, discreetly interrupted their duties during this year around. The Sifa Poles, disguising as pirates, disposing of the marines with potential, and secretly helping the targeted pirates, lead to the marines' failures. Simply put, the world government worked to limit marines' control over the sea. And yet, marines' capability seemed too much for the elders' liking. This biased perspective of theirs wouldn't have developed in the canon. However, due to Smoker's influence on Kuzan two years ago, the Admiral Candidate has been sailing all around the sea, inspiring the other marines to live on to their justice. This sense of hope that lingered in the marine left a bad taste in the elders. Hence, the world government blackmailed some Goku that if the Marine fails to show a substantial result by the end of the year, the funding will be cut by a tremendous amount ultimately leading to the current situation. Paradise. The Elders all looked at the map that was posted on the nearby wall. Marine is perfect as it is right now, and change is unnecessary. After all, change. It tends to bring chaos. The Den Den Mushy grinned in return, roger that. The large town within an island, having been burned to the crisp from start to end, generated a mass volume of smoke that traveled upward. Within this apocalyptic scenery, mixed with the crazed laughs from pirates and horrified cries from civilians, there stood one man with blonde hair and red-colored eyes. This man, wearing a crimson red cloak, seemed to exhibit a sense of charisma that distinguished him from the others. That rock? The man, currently staring at the rocky mountain at the edge of the island, whispered in contempt, how dare it tower over me? There existed no hesitation in his movement. Taking his right hand out of his pocket, the man aimed his palm at the rock. Hell blaze. The gigantic beam of flame then followed, vigorously bursting out from the man's palm, pulverizing over the midsection of rock with ferocity. The previously gigantic rocky mountain was instantly separated into two. The man, now smiling in satisfaction, turned to one old aged woman of poor condition. Said old woman, injured and tied up by the rope, seemed to be nearing her death. However, she surprisingly exhibited nothing but calmness. The man locked his gaze on that old woman and said in glee, Look at that, will you? This is what I'm capable of for I am the fire itself. No one is able to oppose me, and not even once have I lost in this vast sea. The throne of the pirate king no one deserves it more than I do. So say that again. Crouching down and meeting his crimson eyes with the old woman's impassive eyes, the man growled. Do you truly believe that this island is where my journey ends? Do you truly believe that I will fall here, Oracle of Banaro? The old woman didn't speak. However, she didn't avert her eyes either, much to the man's dislike. The man, frowning in response, screamed at the old woman's face, Admit IT, admit that I will conquer this sea. That one piece is in my grasp, woman, speak the truth already. I already spoke what I saw. And an oracle never goes back on one's words. The old woman finally opening her mouth stated, Furthermore, in the eyes of this old woman, the seat of the pirate king doesn't seem fitting to a fool like you. The man impulsively latched his hand onto the old woman's neck, intending to strangle her. He, trembling in anger, reeked of murder from head to toe. Yet, the old woman choking from the lack of air, didn't avert her eyes even once. And then, before he could finish the deed, Captain, a voice entered his ears, bringing him back to reality. The man, widening his eyes, immediately let go of the old woman's neck. No, no, no. I can't let you die like this. No, your death is to come after I disprove your bullshit. Standing back up, the man found that among the group of his crew members, one has stepped up in a serious manner. Taking in a deep breath to calm himself down, the man stated, Speak. Watcher sighted a marine ship from afar, and it's heading our way. The man shifted his eyes back at the old woman and snorted, Is that the so-called doom for me? Without waiting for the response, he turned back and began to walk toward the shore triumphantly. His crimson cloak swayed as he walked, and behind him, his crew, amounting to hundreds in number, followed. Then stay there and watch. I'll show you. The man grinned maliciously, my true destiny. What a cloudy sky I thought with my eyes headed up at the sky. The thick layer of cloud, covering the entire area around the island of Banaro, darkened the entire surrounding around us. Simultaneously from the crow's nest, one marine soldier gulped with the binocular in front of his eyes to the island from below. Doll raised her eyebrow. What's wrong? A lieutenant doll, placing the binocular down. The marine stuttered. There is no sign of red hair pirates from what I can deduce. However, the ship was currently filled with a serious atmosphere. Even Aramaki, who was quite prone to laughing, seemed to have toned his grin down. After all, even without the help of binocular, everyone could see the huge volume of smoke from the distant island of Banaro. The seven ships in total are found to be docked on the island, and the Jolly Roger engraved on those sails. It's the one that belongs to the Blaze Pirates. We've been tricked by that red hair, didn't we? Joan, clicking her tongue in annoyance, gazed at the island that was now viewable by the naked eye. Does it matter, Commodore Joan? Dol, standing with an equally serious demeanor, exclaimed Hellblaze Diego. He's been well known to burn away every single island that he comes across, which earned him the sheer bounty of 448 million billy. 
In terms of maliciousness, red hair can't compare to this man, and since we've ultimately ended up here, there's no reason for us to give up this chance. A smart outplay, red hair pirates, I thought to myself, as I heard the ongoing conversations on the ship, you've successfully lost a chase, and presented us a bigger meat ultimately, making us give up on you. It must have been the idea of Ben Beckman, the vice captain of the red hair pirates. But something's strange. Cancer, who seemed to be in deep thought, voiced his opinion as far as I recall. The Blaze Pirates are currently the target of Vice Admiral Sideshar. In terms of route, he should have located them before our arrival here. It's too late to think about those details. Shion said solemnly, as the seven pirate ships at the shore of Banaro began to move toward us. Narrowing her eyes, she then stated, call the headquarter and notify them. She looked resolute. The other marines, having felt that a huge battle was about to begin, stood strictly awaiting Joan's order. I, knowing what was about to come, leaned back in my seat comfortably. Not affected by the heavy moods of the others, I casually grabbed a cup of coffee laid out in front of me and sipped on it. That 24th division will proceed to strike the Blaze Pirates. The sea was calm, generating minor waves that crashed upon the shore of Banaro. The sky, filled with dark clouds, rendered the entire island and its proximity gloomy. And corresponding to such weather, the atmosphere spoke nothing but intensity, with one marine ship currently floating in front of the approaching seven pirate ships. The seven pirate ships, circling around the marine ship, contained numerous pirates who seemed giddy to fight. Among the seven, one ship of notably bigger size sailed forth, slowly approaching the marine ship. On the deck of the said pirate ship, a tall man with blonde hair, red-colored eyes, and a red cloak around his body, was seen stepping one foot on top of the ship's devil-resembling figurehead. Wearing a grin full of confidence and maliciousness, that man locked his eyes on the marine commodore, who stood at the front of the marine ship with her arms crossed. Shion, smoker, silently gazing at the man from the seat at the back, touched the sheath hilt of the sword on his waist Shusui. Behind Joan stood Doll and Cancer. Doll was seen holding two pistols in her hands, while Cancer had an unsheathed sword leaning on top of his shoulder. Aramaki, cracking his knuckles, grinned ferociously. Then, upon the Blaze Pirate's flagship coming to a stop in front of the marine ship, PFF the blonde man suddenly burst into laughter, nigh ha 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 ha. And with that as a cue, all pirates surrounding the marine exploded in the laughter of their own. Ha 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 ha, many marine soldiers watched this scene with nervousness in their eyes. Though their guns were out aiming at the pirates around them, those pirates didn't seem afraid, not even by a little. One ship, one single ship, the blonde man then cried in amusement, is the marine stupid? Do marines truly think they can stop me? Hellblaze Diego, with a force as petty as this, criminal Hellblaze Diego, wanted for 448 million billy. Shion, speaking coldly, then unsheathed her sword, Compira, and pointed its blade at the blonde man, Diego, for the past four years. You've tormented countless individuals. For the sake of your pleasure, you committed many unspeakable deeds. But no more. Today her cold words, booming loudly in this sea, served as words of encouragement to the marine soldiers. Though they were nervous, her words reminded them that they are the justice that they are the protectors of the sea. She'll be the end of the Blaze Pirates. Smoker, still seated at the back, formed a smile upon hearing Joan's charismatic words. Naya ha ha ha, you aren't the first to say that to me. Diego then opened his right palm. On top of it, one ball of red hot flame burst into existence, immediately brightening up the area. And guess what happened to all the others who said that? But yes, I'm aware. Joan, then lowering her sword and chuckling to herself, said, I'm no different than those all the officers whom you experienced. Unlike certain knuckleheads I've come across, I'm not strong enough to charge into a dangerous scenario. Nah, ha, ha. What's with this sudden honesty? Are you begging for your life? Diego grinned in amusement. However then, without a care for Joan's statement, then launched his attack, Hellblaze. Guom. The huge, intense blast of flame gushed over to the marine ship in an instant. Engulfing it whole, the marine ship disappeared from the side of the pirates. And, Kikekiki isn't this too easy. Captain, you overdid it again. Ha 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 ha. The pirates, watching as the huge cloud of smoke burst out from the site impacted by Diego's flame, laughed victoriously. Diego himself wasn't an exception, laughing without control. Nai ha ha ha. My death. My loss. The end of my journey. You were wrong, Oracle, before stopping upon noticing the strange, wiggling movement of smoke. The pirates all stopped their laughs, for they too noticed this phenomenon. Swill it was ominous. Within the gloomy sea where barely any light got through, the huge volume of smoke swelled in a bizarre manner. Before, we have Smoker. The marine ship revealed itself once again from the smoke with no indication of burn at all. Smoker, now standing in front of the ship, grinned at the dumbfounded Diego. Smoker, Shion, who stood behind Smoker, said with trust, I'll leave Hellblaze to you. Smoker, locking his eyes on Diego, replied, consider him dead. Nai ha ha. I suppose that I've underestimated you just before. Diego, placing his hand over his eyes, then laughed once again. Then, moving his hand back down, Diego glared at Smoker coldly, 
But so what? Diego's hand blazed up once again, but to a greater intensity. With his arrogance still intact, Diego was about to blast another attack. Then, Smoker, suddenly appearing in front of Diego, smashed his fist into the blonde pirate's exposed chest, before the latter had the time to react. By the time Diego realized this, white blow, boom, he was blasted up high in the air by the heavy impact of Smoker's punch. All marines and simultaneously, Dolp pointing her guns at the enemy pirates, shouted firmly, fire. With her call, the Battle of Banaro has begun with the previous nervousness of the marine soldiers having disappeared. Bang bang bang. The bullets, cannons, and war cries. Within this chaos of a battlefield, filled with countless projectiles that went back and forth with the intention to kill their targets, Yahoo. The pirates holding melee weapons, grabbed the ropes on their ships, and fearlessly flew toward the marine ship. With them having the advantage in terms of number, and the marine soldiers being occupied with the pirates holding ranged weapons, in no time, the sky above the marine ship was filled with pirates who were falling toward it. Swoosh. However, However, not even a single pirate managed to land on the marine ship. Joan, slashing through her enemies elegantly, decapitated the heads of more than 40 pirates in an instant. As those heads rained down to the water around the marine ship, splash splash splash. The marines, thinking of the splashing noises as the music in their ears, felt their confidence rising. Simultaneously, rahaha. Aramaki, wildly jumping onto one of the seven pirate ships, began the series of wild punches and kicks that terrified the pirates. This battle maniac, having been engulfed by nothing but the excitement, shouted, I'm going to be complimented by Captain Smokerboom. Ha! Huh. Then, Aramaki's fist was blocked by one pirate with a bald head and muscular physique. That man, grinning with as much excitement as Aramaki, said, finally a worthy opponent. Boom. That man threw his other hand at Aramaki. However, Aramaki too blocked that man's fist rendering the two into a deadlock. Steel body Enrico what a nice prey for me to hunt. Then, the plants began to grow out of Aramaki's arms, and surround the bald man, Enrico, which caused the latter to use his incredible strength to throw Aramaki off of him. Aramaki, smashing into a couple of pirates who stood in his way, quickly regained his ground and looked at Enrico with a serious expression on his face. Come. On the other hand, Cancer was found on another pirate ship, and was currently slashing his sword through the pirates with terrifying accuracy. Clang. Then, the one-eyed pirate, suddenly rushing into Cancer's sight, clashed his sword against Cancer's own. Two. Think that you became the subordinate of Hellblaze? What a surprise, Cancer, whose eyes sharpened upon the appearance of his contender, remarked Darby of the Noble Sword. What a nostalgic title. The man commented stoically, but unfortunately, that title is no longer suitable for me. The two of them began the quick flurries of sword slashes, generating the fast successions of clanging noises. Dole, watching this sight from the marine ship, then turned her eyes at the sky above, Noble Sword Darby is well known to have attained his bounty after slaying a rear admiral. And this man is now the subordinate of Hellblaze Smoker, you better watch out. Marineford within one huge room that was exquisitely designed in Wayno style. There lied many cushions in an orderly manner for the marines to make themselves comfortable with. This room was the meeting hall where Fleet Admiral Sengoku tended to send his message to the marine officers. However, this room currently seemed relatively empty. At the frontmost cushions, around five vice admirals were seated in a strict manner. At where their gazes were headed, Admiral Blaze, the only remaining admiral in Marineford at the current moment, was sitting with a serious expression. Commodore Brand New, Blaze, looking at the only standing marine officer, commanded, report the current situation. Yes, Admiral Cedar Heavy. As all the other marine officers turned their heads to brand new, he, pointing his hand at the board that stood on his right, began speaking, Currently, on the island of Banaro, Division 24 under Commodore Jones' command, is battling the Blaze Pirates. At the same time, Division 25, led by Commodore Strawberry, relayed that they will soon arrive at Maximus, where Sir Crocodile was last sighted. At Whiskey Peak, Division 26, led by Commodore Kader, said that they sighted the newly rising Sasaki Pirates. Finally, at the island of Kuragana, Division No. 14, led by Vice Admiral Sancha, is about to launch an attack against Hokai, who's also well known as the Marine Hunter. On the board, seven bounty posters were laid out. Those bounties, of course, belong to the seven rookies of the sea. Martini Hook, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 1 billion 600 million, Beely. Hellblaze Diego, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 448 million, Beely. Hawkeye Dracul Mehik, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 321 million, Beely. Red Hair Shanks, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 200 million, Beely. Overflowing Sasaki, wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 103 million Beely. Heavenly Demon Dom Quicks at Doflamingo. Wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 85 million Beely. Sir Crocodile. Wanted dead or alive. Bounty, 81 million Beely. Though they were grouped together as the seven rookies, there were evident differences in their individualistic strengths or, so the Marine believed. On the other hand, the location of Heavenly Demon, who was last seen in the North Blue, cannot be pinpointed. Similarly, we lost the track of red hair on the island of Koto. And as for Martini, he disappeared from the New World since the arrival of the first 12 Marine divisions. Listening to Brand New's report carefully, one Marine officer then asked, what? 
happened to Division 15 led by Vice Admiral Sidor? How is it that Division 24, who's responsible for chasing down Red Hair, is currently facing Hellblaze? Ranyu answered gravely, Unfortunately, the current status of Division 15 remains unknown, with them having last contacted us three days ago. And from what we can deduce, Red Hair seem to have lured Division 24 to the grasp of Hellblaze. We are currently under the suspicion that Red Hair and Hellblaze may have formed an alliance among themselves. Then isn't it a dangerous situation for Division 24? Another Marine officer asked with concern on his face. The recent information confirmed that Noble Sword Darby became a member of Blaze Pirates. With that man having a history of defeating a Rear Admiral, his submission inferred that Hellblazer's capability exceeds that of a rear admiral's brand new nodded. It is just as you said, Vice Admiral Mazambia. Immediately after receiving the report from Division 24 of Division 13, under Vice Admiral Jonathan's command, sailed out to Banaro. However, the chance of Division 13 arriving just in time seems unlikely. Blaze, crossing his arms while still in his seat, then closed his eyes and sighed, fleet. Admiral Sengoku has been quite impulsive this time around, dispatching too many forces in the new world, and leaving the paradise empty-handed. The room fell in silence as the other seated marine officers grimaced, agreeing to the words of Blaze in their mind. I believe, Blaze muttered, that we should brace ourselves for some harsh news. At the sky high above, two men were found floating. The blonde one, Diego, was keeping himself afloat by producing a constant supply of fire on the soles of his feet, while the white one, Smoker, seemed to be standing by the use of Gepo. White Hunter, yes, now I remember. The punch that previously landed on Diego didn't seem to have much effect. Diego, now having a restored calmness, grinned at Smoker, the prodigy among the Marines, who defeated Gecko Moria two years ago. Naihaha. I can see where that woman commander of yours got her confidence from. Smoker didn't respond to Diego's words. Instead, locking his gaze on Diego, he bickered, speak for years and see if I care. Diego's hands twitched as he lowered his posture, with his face expressing displeasure. Then, as the surrounding atmosphere started to heat up, Diego's arms ignited into a vigorous orange-red fire that threatened to burn through everything in its path. Then, the fight began. Blaze, claw. Diego swiped his burning right hand, which created a huge arc of fire that rapidly traveled at Smoker. However, Smoker's form vanished from Diego's sight. Boom. Then, a punch landed on Diego at the next moment, sending Diego downward to where the sea lied. Subsequently, Diego quickly generated a blast of fire on his back to prevent his fall to the sea. ECH again. How can he make physical contact with me? How can he make physical contact with me? Is probably what you're thinking. Smoker, floating right in front of Diego, stated, swoosh. Before tilting his head to dodge the sudden fire blast that burst out of Diego's open mouth. Immediately after, Diego swung his burning arms in an X shape, producing a huge, X shaped fire that blasted Smoker from point blank range. After the fire faded, Smoker's entire body was burning with his eyes hollowed out. Devil's Mark Diego grinned, letting your guard down poof. Before Diego even had time to register what just happened, White Snake. A huge snake made out of white smoke rushed in from Diego's back, before coiling around the man tight. Fire requires oxygen to burn. Theoretical wise, keeping that man in a dome of smoke will be ideal. However Smoker, who seems to be assessing Diego's strength from some distance away, thought, the pressure and energy generated from that fire, aren't something that can be ignored. If I wish to suffocate Hellblaze, I would need an external source of smoke, just like the last time against the very smoker's eyes widened in realization. Devil's wings boom. Then, Diego freed himself from the smoke-made snake with a pair of huge, burning wings of orange-red fire, attached to his back. With his wrathful glare headed at Smoker, Diego currently seemed to be filled with nothing but the thought of murdering the marine captain in front of him. Smoke. It's nothing but a secondary character that arises when a fire burns. Diego, growling in rage, opened his right hand versatility, in destructiveness there is nothing that Smoke can do to overcome the might of fire. Though you may seem to be advantageous at the current moment, the victor of this battle has already been decided from the start. Subsequently, a sphere of blue fire, which screamed nothing but a danger, sprang into existence. On top of Diego's right palm, purgatory flame. Boom. A beam of blue fire burned through the air on Smoker's right. Diego, generating yet another sphere of blue fire, blasted it again at Smoker. Boom. To which the Marine dodged by quickly moving his body to the right. Nyahaha Diego laughed in exhilaration as he threw the beams of blue fire at Smoker in a crazed manner. Boom boom boom. It was a frightening sight, and the Marines below came to realize why this man, Hellblaze Diego, currently possessed the bounty of 448 million Beely. But something was strange. Smoker, even under these assaults, seemed calm. Shifting from one area to another, he slivered away from Diego's attacks with ease, like a lazy cloud that one tries to grasp, but always fails in doing so. Boom. Why? Can't I hit you Diego? Gritting his teeth through another blast of blue fire. Of course, it was dodged by Smoker whose eyes were exhibiting a red gleam. Then, Smoker acted. All of a sudden, he began to fly up higher, away from where Diego was floating. Diego seemed initially confused by the sudden antic of his opponent, but then burst into laughter. Nah, ha, ha, I see. It wasn't that you were calm. 
but that you've hidden your fear. Diego generated two spheres of blue fire at once, intending to pulverize Smoker with his technique, just as I thought Smoke cannot dare to match fire. Your death has been predestined, White Hunter then, Diego stopped, with his eyes widened. And it wasn't just him. All the others too stopped their fights, as... The thick layer of clouds above them, they were swirling into one point where Smoker was floating by. White smoke, by its essence, is no different than the cloud. Smoker, standing as the incredibly dense cloud swirled above him, muttered, Hair, the biggest limitation to the usage of Devil Fruit is none other than its user's imagination. The clouds, due to Smoker's ability, have become heavy. And then, plop, water. Diego whispered as he felt a cold sensation on his shoulder. Plop, plop, plop a rain. Within the battlefield, heavy rain poured. The battlefield momentarily fell into the silence. The cool rain, drenching each and every individual in the area, seemed mystical and oddly soothing. But so what? However, the rain wasn't enough. Though the huge volume of steam was produced from the continuous drops of rain on the blue fire, it continued to burn, not yielding against the rain. My fire isn't weak enough to yield against these petty drops of water. Diego, drenched in water, looked up at where Smoker floated, before raising his right hand up diabolic flame. The fire vigorously rose from Diego's body. It clustered and grew in size, and in due time, even with the vast volume of steam that was produced from the relentless raindrops, there now sat an incredibly huge sphere of blue fire resembling that of a sun. Diego. From below, Enrico, whose body was covered by injuries due to the fight against Aramaki, widened his eyes, is that marine that much of a trouble to you? The blaze pirates seemed shaken. However, the same could be said for the marines, who witnessed the rise of the blue sun in disbelief. After all, this gloomy sea, covered by the rain clouds, was now brightened up by the man-made sun. Smoker, watching Diego's incredible technique, clenched his right fist. White serpent. At the next moment, a giant serpent of smoke abruptly dropped from the swirling rain clouds and crashed onto the miniature sun boom and then came a huge explosion that caused the entire area to shake and tremble after the moment of the bright light there came the darkness though the rain continued the swirling clouds settled down and all marines and pirates gulping in anticipation gazed at the sight of the clash between smoker and diego's techniques it was an important moment for the outcome of smoker and diego's fight is a crucial determinant of the entire battle and when the smoke cleared from the scene is that all Diego, still conscious, revealed himself. He, grinning with murderous demeanor, growled while raising his head up to where Smoker was standing until the previous moment. I asked if that's all you got. White Hunter, however, Smoker whom Diego was looking for, wasn't present in the sky he gazed at, putting the pirate in confusion. He captain then, one pirate started in disbelief. Diego Diego heard a terrified shout from a very familiar voice. Turning to the source, he raised his eyebrow. Enrico, what's wrong? Why your chest? Diego froze. Meeting Enrico's fright-filled eyes with his own, Diego slowly lowered his face and found a clean hole in his chest where the blood was rapidly gushing out. It sure took long for you to realize. And then, a voice from Diego's back. And this voice, Diego didn't have to turn around to know to whom this voice belonged to. Smoker. Smoker, standing with his back facing Diego, currently had the unsheathed Chusui leaning on his shoulder. He, Diego, realized, stabbed me while my senses were obstructed by the smoke. Was it fun? Smoker, without bothering to look at Diego, said calmly to the blonde to burn away every single island that you've come across, and to succumb to arrogance from the power which you acquired without any hard work. Was it fun to live within a worthless delusion? Hellblaze. I, I, Diego, placing his hand on his chest, felt his own warm blood. From his lips, the blood gushed out, and his face, now pale in color, exhibited nothing but horror. Smoker, in truth, could have ended the fight right from the start if he wished to do so. However, who was Hellblaze Diego? He was an apathetic monster, murdering and harming everyone in his way simply for the sake of his entertainment. Smoker knew that he couldn't grant a simple, painless death to this psychopath. Instead, he's granted. Now, it's time for a wake-up call. Filth of the sea. Smoker whispered in a cold rage, die in regret, for that's the only task left for you to do. In despair, from the moment Smoker witnessed Diego's antics, he decided to crush this man's dream. No, this can't be. Diego clenched his head with his bloody hands, vomiting out a substantial amount of blood. He huffed in growing fatigue. His entire body trembled, filled with all sorts of negative emotions, wasn't I the chosen one? The man of fire, destined to rule over the sea and seize the world's greatest treasure if that isn't me, then who am I? The blaze pirates, watching their captain's pitiful breakdown, were filled with despair of their own. Knowing that they had no chance of victory, they dropped their weapons and willingly knelt. Raising their hands up, they cowered in front of the marine soldiers, letting themselves be arrested without any resistance. To think I lost to a person like him age surely has gotten me. Darby, watching Diego's state, let out a hollow chuckle. Dropping his sword, he sat down on the deck and said to Cancer, kill or arrest, do as you wish. Diego on the other hand, Enrico, who was immobilized by Aramaki's plants all the way to the neck, screamed at his lungs, what happened to a promise? What happened to becoming the greatest pirate crew in the world? You bastard, how dare you lose boom? Rahahaha, shut up, Aramaki. 
grinning in content, smashed his fist on Enrico's face, interrupting the latter's scream. But this isn't that bad of a loss for you guys. Aramaki, looking at Smoker, claimed with a gleam of admiration from the moment I sighted him back at the bar. I knew that he'll be the strongest marine in the future. He then whispered with a cold sweat on his back. After all, knocking those pirates unconscious back then Smoker, then slashed Shushi horizontally. Beheading Diego in an instant was without a doubt the will of Supreme King that Granny mentioned before. Whiskey Peak why, weren't I being underestimated far too much? It was within the peaceful looking island filled with green vegetation for Marine to dispatch a weakling like you. In front of the fallen Marines, one huge Triceratops stood. This dinosaur was none other than overflowing Sasaki using his Devil Fruit Dragon Dragon Fruit model. Triceratops. The Commodore in charge of the division, Commodore Kader, was sprawled across the ground, with him having been knocked unconscious from Sasaki's single slam. Sasaki's crew too grinned upon witnessing the pitiful sight of the Marine Division's commander, having foreseen their victory. E. Commodore Kader. One Marine officer shouted with his teeth gritted, but the unconscious man didn't respond. The Marine officer, feeling that there was no chance of victory in this fight, was about to order the withdrawal. However, hey, a tall, red-haired man with a metal mask on his face, the steel, daringly approached the Triceratops, with a great sword on his back. Don't scare my fellow Marines too much, Wiyadara. And he wasn't it. Hey, what's with you acting so high and mighty all of a sudden? Maynard, fucking noisy all around. Where's the need to chat within a battlefield? Dalmatian, let's get this over with already. I got ladies swooning over me. Masterson, the four new Marine officers stood side by side, facing off the giant Triceratops fearlessly. Ho quite confident, aren't you? Sasaki's eyes gleamed in interest. Then let's see for how long you four managed to last. Bastille laughed, Dararara last, oh yes. It is the last as you say, Daro. Subsequently, he pointed the tip of his greatsword at the pirate, though it's for you instead of us. Then, Sasaki kicked off the ground with his muscular dinosaur legs, beginning his charge at the marines. Boom. And that signaled the start of the battle between Division 26 and Sasaki pirates. In the middle of the sea where night has arrived, Saicha, the vice admiral who's responsible for leading Division 15, was seen tied up to a pole of his marine ship, along with his subordinates. Yes. Yes. I see. Of course, Piero Sama. The change of plan. I got it loud and clear. And at the large pirate ship that floated right next to the marine ship, one man with an exquisitely designed pirate captain's hat, Martini Hook, was seen conversing with someone by the Den Den Mushy. Judging by his demeanor, the recipient seemed to be someone of a higher ground, with Hook willingly speaking in a submissive manner. What is going on? What are the Martini pirates doing here, in paradise? Side Char thought with growing despair in his heart. Hook, he was given the title of Martini due to his habit of leaving an empty bottle of Martini at the sites of his crime. Though this man was termed as one of the seven rookies due to beginning his piracy after the start of the Great Age of Pirates, everyone knew that he lied in an entirely different class than the rest of the seven. Listen. And now, Saicha watched as Hook made his way to Saicha's marine ship. While gulping down a bottle of martini, we have sad news for you. Hook, coming to a stop in front of Saicha, crouched down and gazed at the Vice Admiral with hollow, lifeless eyes. Unfortunately, you, along with your entire division, will have to die here. You know, balancing stuffs, this and that. Saicha, suppressing his urge to gulp, turned his eyes at Hook's ship, where his crew members were gazing back at him and his division. Saicha noted that unlike any other pirates he's come across, this crew was filled with fatigue and hollowness. I see. And during the final moment of his life, Saicha seemed to have realized you were specifically targeting my division. Since our route to Banaro is only known to the Marine officers at the Marineford, it means you work for someone within there. Within the rank of Marine, there exists a betrayer. Hook, finishing the entire bottle, shrugged, A, eh, you are half right there. Though not entirely. Is it Mizambia? Saicha gazed into Hook's eyes. Hook, looking back, didn't reply. Hemington. Saicha's eyes trembled in a horrifying thought as Hook stood still without any reaction. He, after a momentary pause, whimpered Admiral Cedar Heavy. Hook, upon hearing the name, finally raised up his hand that was holding onto a pistol. And as Saicha expressed disbelief, bang. The loud noise of a gunshot resounded across the sea. Corrigana in an old, broken castle that wasn't tended for years. There was one young man with hawk resembling yellow colored eyes. With a huge sword, Yoru, sheathed on his back, he was sitting down on an old chair, enjoying a cup of tea. This man was Hawkeye Dracul Mihek, the man to be known as the strongest swordsman in the world in the future. And at the outside of the castle, there lied the mountain of corpses, all wearing marine attire. They, while alive, were known as the 14th Division of the Marine. Boring. Mihek commented as he looked at the corpses through the window, among the hundreds of marines who's come after me until now. Not even one has given me the fun. Weak and pompous fools, filled with nothing but a hypocritic ideal that they call Justice Hun. At the entrance of the castle, the doors opened revealing a masked man wearing a white suit. That man, walking elegantly, bowed in front of the still-seated Mihek. Greetings, Mr. Hawkeye. Mihek, taking another sip from the tea, asked, What? Are you here to challenge me like any other fool out there? I don't fathom to think of matching the great swordsman. Instead, I'm here to suggest you an offer on behalf of the world government. 
The man, reaching into the inner pocket of his top, took out a tightly sealed envelope. Mihek, snatching it from the man's hand, raised an eyebrow. What may be this be? It's the invitation letter to the Mary G. Ice, the land of gods. From there, we will discuss, the man stated, the opportunity that will guarantee your entertainment. Mary G. Ice. Mihek, for the first time, smiled in amusement, inviting a pirate of all possibilities to the so-called sacred land. How amusing. Ha ha, in a blue sea without any sign of tidal wave or wind calm belt, one man was found to be breathing heavily, with his left arm missing a hand. He, having slicked back black hair, was so crocodile, one of the currently known seven rookies. My crew, from the island of Maximus, he barely escaped from the marine's assault. He, the man who aimed to defeat Whitebeard and reach the throne of Pirate King, not only lost his left hand, but also his entire crew. And for the past three days, Crocodile was drifted in the calm belt. Dehydrated and starved, the situation seemed hopeless for him. Whitebird, Pirate King, One Piece. Crocodile, while bursting out the self-mocking laughter, let out tears full of anguish, Kuahaha how delusional have you been? Crocodile rushing stupidly without any preparation, and losing to a mere marine Commodore One Piece my ass from Crocodile's shout. The water underneath his ship rippled. A better preparation. A suitable strength which no one can oppose. If only I am given the second chance splash. At the next moment Crocodile's ship was flipped as a huge Sea King revealed itself from the depth of the sea. And Crocodile helplessly watched as the Sea King engulfed him along with his ship to its dark inside. However, whether he truly died or not remains unknown. New world within the violently churning sea. One huge ship that resembled a whale in terms of appearance, Moby Dick calmly sailed by. And this ship was owned by the infamous Whitebeard Pirates, the true powerhouse of the New World, whom not even the Big Mom Pirates and Beast Pirates could fathom of going against. Oh, just how turbulent has the sea become. And atop this ship, one man with long, wild, and yellow-colored hair, who had swords embedded on his severed legs and a missing left arm, Golden Lion Shiki, was found sitting in front of a huge, domineering man, with a wavy blonde hair and white mustache, that formed a crescent-shaped arc. Whitebeard Edward Newgate. Around Newgate and Shiki stood the rest of the Whitebeard pirates, who monitored the movement of Shiki with great caution. What are you here for, Shiki? Newgate, leaning his cheek against his huge hand, said with a notable dislike for the fellow blonde. If you are here to whine about losing your entire crew, then go cry elsewhere. Hey, you're speaking of a past event that has already passed by. I'm not here to whine as you say. But Shiki grinned, though with an underlying sadness, to make an offer. An offer? Yes indeed, an offer. Though I wish to do it myself. I am aware that my will has been utter chattered. Shiki, opening his arms wide with a joy-filled expression, exclaimed, So Whitebeard, no, Newgate, become the ruler of this world in my stead. I will gladly become your underling, and it will be just like that time during Zebek's era. Newgate immediately replied with a deep frown. Do you want me to drown you? And as I expected, you dislike the idea of it. Shiki, chuckling knowingly, then revealed a small treasure chest from his back. Therefore, I brought a treasure. One so valuable that you won't be able to refuse. In return for this treasure and my loyalty, Newgate, you must conquer the world. Without any hesitation, Shiki then opened the treasure box in front of the entire Whitebeard Pirates. Shehahaha. Boiler, the dark dark fruit. The fruit that I stumbled upon in the midst of my despair-filled steps. Shiki stated with certainty that Newgate will accept his offer. Though none of us can eat this. If one of your crew members were to take this powerful devil fruit the fruit, that Rox D. Zebek himself ate in the past, we will be invincible. And as a thunder roared from the sky, as if frightened of something, one obese-looking man with a long nose among the Whitebeard Pirates, Marshall D. Teach, locked his eyes on the treasure chest greedily. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.